Book Five, Chapter One of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Five, Chapter One. The vicissitudes of empires, the state of Italy, the military factions of Sforza and Braccio. Braceschi and the Sforeschi attack this pope, who is expelled by the Romans. War between the pope and the Duke of Milan. The Florentines and the Venetians assist the pope. Peace between the pope and the Duke of Milan. Tyranny practiced by the party favorable to the Medici. It may be observed that provinces amid the vicissitudes to which they are subject pass from order into confusion and afterwards recur to a state of order again. For the nature of mundane affairs not allowing them to continue in an even course when they have arrived at their greatest perfection, they soon begin to decline. In the same manner, having been reduced by disorder and sunk to their utmost state of depression, unable to descend lower, they of necessity reascend, and thus from good they gradually decline to evil, and from evil again return to good. The reason is that valour produces peace, peace, repose, repose, disorder, disorder, ruin. So from disorder, order springs, from order virtue, and from this glory and good fortune. Hence wise men have observed that the age of literary excellence is subsequent to that of distinction in arms, and that in cities and provinces great warriors are produced before philosophers. Arms having secured victory, and victory peace, the buoyant vigour of the martial mind cannot be enfeebled by a more excusable indulgence than that of letters. Nor can indolence, with any greater or more dangerous deceit, enter a well-regulated community. Cato was aware of this when the philosophers Diogenes and Carniades were sent ambassadors to the Senate by the Athenians, for perceiving with what earnest admiration the Roman youth began to follow them, and knowing the evils that might result to his country from this specious idleness, he enacted that no philosopher should be allowed to enter Rome. Provinces by this means sink to ruin, from which, men's sufferings having made them wiser, they again recur to order if they be not overwhelmed by some extraordinary force. These causes made Italy, first under the ancient Tuscans, and afterward under the Romans, by turns happy and unhappy, and although nothing has subsequently arisen from the ruins of Rome at all corresponding to her ancient greatness, which under a well-organized monarchy might have been gloriously effected, still there was so much bravery and intelligence in some of the new cities and governments that afterward sprang up, that although none ever acquired dominion over the rest, they were, nevertheless, so balanced and regulated among themselves, as to enable them to live in freedom and defend their country from the barbarians. Among these governments, the Florentines, although they possessed a small extent of territory, were not inferior to any in power and authority, for being situated in the middle of Italy, wealthy and prepared for action, they either defended themselves against such as thought proper to assail them, or decided victory in favour of those to whom they became allies. From the valour, therefore, of these new governments, if no season occurred of long-continued peace, neither were any exposed to the calamities of war, for that cannot be called peace in which states frequently assail each other with arms, nor can those be considered wars in which no men are slain, cities plundered, or sovereignties overthrown. For the practice of arms fell into such a state of decay that wars were commenced without fear, continued without danger, and concluded without loss. Thus the military energy, which is in other countries exhausted by a long peace, was wasted in Italy by the contemptible manner in which hostilities were carried on, as will be clearly seen in the events to be described from 1434 to 1494, from which it will appear how the barbarians were again admitted into Italy, and she once again sunk under subjection to them. Although the transactions of our princes at home and abroad will not be viewed with admiration of their virtue and greatness like those of the ancients, perhaps they may on other accounts be regarded with no less interest, 
seeing what masses of high-spirited people were kept in restraint by such weak and disorderly forces, and if, in detailing the events which took place in this wasted world, we shall not have to record the bravery of the soldier, the prudence of the general, or the patriotism of the citizen, it will be seen with what artifice, deceit, and cunning princes, warriors, and leaders of republics conducted themselves, to support a reputation they never deserved. This, perhaps, will not be less useful than a knowledge of ancient history, for, if the latter excites the liberal mind to imitation, the former will show what ought to be avoided and decried. Italy was reduced to such a condition by her rulers that, when by consent of her princes peace was restored, it was soon disturbed by those who retained their armies, so that glory was not gained by war nor reposed by peace. Thus, when the League and the Duke of Milan agreed to lay aside their arms in 1433, the soldiers, resolved upon war, directed their efforts against the Church. There were at this time two factions or armed parties in Italy, the Sforzesca and the Bracesca. The leader of the former was the Count Francesco, the son of Sforza, and of the latter, Niccolo Piccinino and Niccolo Fortebraccio. Under the banner of one or other of these parties, almost all the forces of Italy were assembled. Of the two, the Sforzesca was in greatest repute, as well as from the bravery of the Count himself, as well from the bravery of the Count himself, as from the promise which the Duke of Milan had made him of his natural daughter, Madonna Bianca, the prospect of which alliance greatly strengthened his influence. After the Peace of Lombardy, these forces, from various causes, attacked Pope Eugenius. Niccolo Forte Braccio was instigated by the ancient enmity which Braccio had always entertained against the Church. The Count was induced by ambition, so that Niccolo assailed Rome, and the Count took possession of La Marca. The Romans, in order to avoid the war, drove Pope Eugenius from their city, and he, having with difficulty escaped, came to Florence, where seeing the immediate danger of his situation, being abandoned by the princes, for they were unwilling again to take up arms in his cause after having been so anxious to lay them aside, he came to terms with the Count, and ceded to him the sovereignty of La Marca, although, to the injury of having occupied it, he had added insult. For in signing the place, from which he addressed letters to his agents, he said in Latin, according to the Latin custom, Ex falco nostro fermiano, in vito petro et polo, Neither was he satisfied with this concession, but insisted upon being appointed Gonfalonia of the Church, which was also granted. So much more was Eugenius alarmed at the prospect of dangerous war than of an ignominious peace. The Count, having thus been reconciled to the Pontiff, attacked Niccolo Fortebraccio, and during many months various encounters took place between them, from all which greater injury resulted to the Pope and his subjects than to either of the belligerents. At length, by the intervention of the Duke of Milan, an arrangement by way of a truce was made, by which both became princes in the territories of the Church. The war thus extinguished at Rome was rekindled in Romagna by Battista di Canetto, who at Bologna slew some of the family of the Griffoni, and expelled from the city the governor who resided there for the Pope, along with others who were opposed to him. To enable himself to retain the government, he applied for assistance to Filippo, and the Pope, to avenge himself for the injury, sought the aid of the Venetians and Florentines. Both parties obtained assistance, so that very soon two large armies were on foot in Romagna. Niccolo Piccinino commanded for the Duke, Gattamelata and Niccolo da Tolentino for the Venetians and Florentines. They met near Imola, where a battle ensued, in which the Florentines and the Venetians were routed, and Niccolo da Tolentino was sent prisoner to Milan where, either through grief of his loss or by some unfair means, he died in a few days. The Duke, on this victory, either being exhausted by the late wars, or thinking the League after their defeat would not be in haste to resume hostilities, did not pursue his good fortune, and thus gave the Pope and his colleagues time to recover themselves. They therefore appointed the Count Francesco for their leader, and undertook to drive Niccolo Fortebraccio from the territories of the Church, and thus terminate the war which had been commenced in favour of the Pontiff. The Romans, finding the Pope supported by so large an army, sought a reconciliation with him, and being successful, admitted his commissary into the city. 
Among the places possessed by Niccolo Fortebraccio were Trevoli, Montefiascone, Citta di Castello, and Aschesi, to the last of which, not being able to keep the field, he fled, and the Count besieged him there. Niccolo's brave defence making it probable that the war would be of considerable duration, the Duke deemed it necessary to prevent the League from obtaining the victory, and said that if this were not effected he would very soon have to look at the defence of his own territories. Resolving to divert the Count from the siege, he commanded Niccolo Piccinino to pass into Tuscany by way of Romagna, and the League, thinking it more important to defend Tuscany than to occupy Ascesi, ordered the Count to prevent the passage of Niccolo, who was already with his army at Furli. The Count accordingly moved with his forces, and came to Cassina, having left the war of La Marca and the care of his own territories to his brother Lione, and while Niccolo Piccinino was endeavouring to pass by, and the Count to prevent him, Fortebraccio attacked Lione with great bravery, made him prisoner, routed his forces, and pursuing the advantage of his victory at once possessed himself of many places in La Marca. The circumstance greatly perplexed the Count, who thought he had lost all his territories. So, leaving part of his force to check Piccinino, with the remainder he pursued Fortebraccio, whom he attacked and conquered. Fortebraccio was taken prisoner in battle, and soon after died of his wounds. This victory restored to the pontiff all the places that had been taken from him by Fortebraccio, and compelled the Duke of Milan to sue for peace, which was concluded by the intercession of Niccolo da Esta, Marquis of Ferrara, the Duke restoring to the church the places he had taken from her, and his forces retiring into Lombardy. Battista da Canetto, as in the case with all who retain authority only by the consent and forces of another, when the Duke's people had quitted Romagna, unable with his own power to keep possession of Bologna, fled, and Antonio Bentivoli, the head of the opposite party, returned to his country. All this took place during the exile of Cosmo, after whose return, those who had restored him, and a great number of persons injured by the opposite party, resolved at all events to make themselves sure of the government, and the sinewy for the month of November and December, not content with what their predecessors had done in favour of their party, extended the term and changed the residences of several who were banished, and increased the number of exiles. In addition to these evils, it was observed that citizens were more annoyed on account of their wealth, their family connections or private animosities, than for the sake of the party to which they adhered. So that if these prescriptions had been accompanied with bloodshed, they would have resembled those of Octavius and Scylla, though in reality they were not without some stains. For Antonio di Bernardo Guardani was beheaded, and four other citizens, among whom were Zanobi del Belfratelli and Cosmo Barbadori, passing the confines to which they were limited, proceeded to Venice, where the Venetians, valuing the friendship of Cosmo de' Medici more than their own honour, sent them prisoners to him, and they were basely put to death. This circumstance greatly increased the influence of that party, and struck their enemies with terror, finding that such a powerful republic would so humble itself to the Florentines. This, however, was supposed to have been done not so much out of kindness to Cosmo as to excite dissensions in Florence, and by means of bloodshed made greater certainty of division among the citizens, for the Venetians knew there was no other obstacle to their ambition so great as the union of her people. The city being cleared of the enemies, or suspected enemies of the state, those in possession of the government now began to strengthen their party by conferring benefits upon them such as were in a condition to serve them, and the family of the Alberti, with all who had been banished by the former government, were recalled. All the nobility, with few exceptions, were reduced to the ranks of the people, and the possessions of the exiles were divided among themselves, upon each paying a small acknowledgment. They then fortified themselves with new laws and provisos, made new scrutiny, withdrawing the names of their adversaries from the purses, and filling them with those of their friends. Taking advice from the ruin of their enemies, they considered that to allow the great offices to be filled by mere chance of drawing did not afford the government sufficient security. They therefore resolved that the magistrates possessing the power of life and death should always be chosen from among the leaders of their own party, and therefore that the accoppiatori, or persons selected for the imborsation of the new scrutini, with the signori who had to retire from office, should make the new appointments. 
they gave to eight of the guard authority to proceed capitally and provided that the exiles when their term of punishment was complete should not be allowed to return unless from the signori and colleagues which were thirty-seven in number the consent of thirty-four was obtained it was made unlawful to write or to receive letters from them every word sign or action that gave offence to the ruling party was punished with the utmost rigour and if there was still in florence any suspected person whom these regulations did not reach he was oppressed with taxes imposed for the occasion thus in a short time having expelled or impoverished the whole of the adverse party they established themselves firmly in the government not to be destitute of external assistance and to deprive others of it who might use it against themselves they entered into a league offensive and defensive with the pope the venetians and the duke of milan end of book 5 chapter 1book five chapter two of history of florence by machiavelli volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by morgan scorpion history of florence and of the affairs of italy by niccolo machiavelli volume two translated by an unknown translator book five Chapter Two, Death of Giovanni II, Rene of Anjou and Alfonso of Aragon aspire to the kingdom. Alfonso is routed and taken by the Genoese. Alfonso, being a prisoner of the Duke of Milan, obtains his friendship. The Genoese disgusted with the Duke of Milan. Divisions among the Genoese. The Genoese, by means of Francesco Spinola, expel the Duke's governor. League against the Duke of Milan. Rinaldo degli Albizzi advises the Duke to make war against the Florentines. His discourse to the Duke. The Duke adopts measures injurious to the Florentines. Niccolo Piccinino appointed to command the Duke's forces. Preparations of the Florentines. Piccinino routed before Barga. The affairs of Florence being in this condition, Giovanna, Queen of Naples, died and by her will appointed René of Anjou to be her successor. Alfonso, king of Aragon, was at this time in Sicily, and having obtained the concurrence of many barons, prepared to take possession of the kingdom. The Neapolitans, with whom a greater number of barons were also associated, favoured René. The Pope was unwilling that either of them should obtain it, but desired the affairs of Naples to be administered by a governor of his own appointing. In the meantime, Alfonso entered the kingdom, and was received by the Duke of Sessa. He brought with him some princes, whom he had engaged in his service, with the design, already possessing Capua, which the Prince of Taranto held in his name, of subduing the Neapolitans, and sent his fleet to attack Gaeta, which had declared itself in their favour. They therefore demanded assistance of the Duke of Milan, who persuaded the Genoese to undertake their defence, and they, to satisfy the Duke their sovereign, and protect the merchandise they possessed, both at Naples and Gaeta, armed a powerful fleet. Alfonso, hearing of this, augmented his own naval force, went in person to meet the Genoese, and coming up with them near the island of Ponzio, an engagement ensued, in which the Aragonese were defeated, and Alfonso, with many of the princes of his suite, made prisoners, and sent by the Genoese to the Filippo. The victory terrified the princes of Italy, who, being jealous of the duke's power, thought it would give him a great opportunity of being sovereign of the whole country. But so contrary are the views of men, that he took a directly opposite course. Alfonso was a man of great sagacity, and as soon as an opportunity presented itself of communicating with Filippo, he proved to him how completely he contravened his own interests, by favouring René and opposing himself. For it would be the business of the former, on becoming king of Naples, to introduce the French into Milan, that in an emergency he might have assistance at hand without the necessity of having to solicit a passage for his friends. But he could not possibly secure this advantage without effecting the ruin of the duke, and making his dominions a French province and that the contrary of all this would result from himself becoming lord of Naples, for having only the French to fear, he would be compelled to love and caress, even to obey those who had it in their power to open a passage for his enemies. That thus the title of the king of Naples would be with himself, Alfonso, 
but the power and authority with Filippo, so that it was much more the duke's business than his own to consider the danger of one course and the advantage of the other, unless he rather wished to gratify his private prejudices than to give security to his dominions. In the one case he would be a free prince, in the other, placed between two powerful sovereigns, he would either be robbed of his territories or live in constant fear, and have to obey them like a slave. These arguments so greatly influenced the duke that, changing his design, he set Alfonso at liberty, sent him honourably to Genoa, and then to Naples. From thence the king went to Gaeta, which, as soon as his liberation had become known, was taken possession by some nobles of his party. The Genoese, seeing that the duke, without the least regard for them, had liberated the king, and gained credit to himself through the dangers and expense which they had incurred, that he enjoyed all the honour of the liberation, and they were themselves exposed to the odium of the capture, and the injuries consequent upon the king's defeat, were greatly exasperated. In the city of Genoa, while in the enjoyment of her liberty, a magistrate is consented with the consent of the people, whom they call the Doge, not that he is absolutely a prince, or that he alone has the power of determining matters of government, but that, as the head of state, he proposes those questions or subjects which have to be considered and determined by the magistrates and the councils. In that city are many noble families, so powerful, that they are with great difficulty induced to submit to the authority of the law. Of these, the most powerful are the Fregosa and the Adorna, from whom arise the dissensions of the city and the impotence of her civil regulations. For the possession of this high office being contested by means inadmissible in well-regulated communities, and most commonly with arms in their hands, it always occurs that one party is oppressed and the other triumphant, and sometimes those who fail in the pursuit have recourse to the arms of strangers, and the country they are not allowed to rule they subject to foreign authority. Hence it happens that those who govern in Lombardy most commonly command in Genoa as occurred at the time Alfonso of Aragon was made prisoner. Among the leading Genoese who had been instrumental in subjecting the Republic to Filippo was Francesco Spinola, who, soon after he had reduced his country to bondage, as always happens in such cases, became suspected by the Duke. Indignant at this, he withdrew to a sort of voluntary exile at Gaeta, and being there when the naval expedition was in preparation, and having conducted himself with great bravery in the action, he thought he had again merited so much of the duke's confidence as would obtain for him permission to remain undisturbed at Genoa. But the duke still retained his suspicions, for he could not believe that a vacillating defender of his own country's liberty would be faithful to himself, and Francesco Spinola resolved again to try his fortune, and if possible restore freedom to his country, and honourable safety for himself. For he was, there was, no probability of regaining the forfeited affection of his fellow-citizens but by resolving at his own peril to remedy the misfortunes which he had been so instrumental in producing. Finding the indignation against the Duke universal on account of the liberation of the King, he thought the moment propitious for the execution of his design. He communicated his ideas to some whom he knew to be similarly inclined, and his arguments ensured their cooperation. The great festival of St. John the Baptist being come, when Arismeno, the new governor sent by the duke, was to enter Genoa, and he being already arrived, accompanied by Opicino, the former governor, and many Genoese citizens. Francesco Spinola thought further delay improper, and issuing from his house with those acquainted with his design, all armed, they raised the cry of liberty. It was wonderful to see how eagerly the citizens and people assembled at the word, so that those who for any reason might be favourable to Filippo not only had no time to arm, but scarcely to consider the means of escape. Arismeno, with some Genoese, fled to the fortress which was held for the duke, Opicino, thinking that, if he could reach the palace, where two thousand men were in arms, and at his own command, he might be able either to effect his own safety, or induce his friends to defend themselves. Took that direction, that before he arrived at the piazza he was slain, his body divided into many pieces and scattered about the city. The Genoese, having placed the government in the hands of free magistrates, in a few days recovered the castle, and the other stronghold possessed by the duke, and delivered themselves entirely from his yoke. These transactions, though at first they had alarmed the princes of Italy with the apprehension that the duke would become too powerful, now gave them hope, seeing the turn they had taken, of being able to restrain him, and, notwithstanding the recent league, 
the Florentines and Venetians entered into an alliance with the Genoese. Rinaldo degli Albizzi and the other leading Florentine exiles, observing the altered aspect of affairs, conceived hopes of being able to induce the Duke to make war against Florence, and having arrived at Milan, Rinaldo addressed him in the following manner. If we, who were once your enemies, come now confidently to supplicate your assistance to enable us to return to our country, neither you nor any one who considers the course and vicissitudes of human affairs can be at all surprised for of our past conduct toward yourself and our present intentions toward our country we can adduce palpable and abundant reasons no good man will ever reproach another who endeavours to defend his country whatever be his mode of doing so neither have we had any design of injuring you but only to preserve our country from detriment and we appeal to yourself whether during the greatest victories of our league when you were really desirous of peace we were not even more anxious for it than yourself, so that we do not think we have done aught to make us despair altogether of favour from you. Nor can our country itself complain that we now exhort you to use those arms against her, from which we have so pertinaciously defended her, for that state alone merits the love of all her citizens, which cares with equal affection for all, not one that favours a few, and casts from her the great mass of her children nor are the arms that men use against their country to be universally condemned, for communities, although composed of many, resemble individual bodies, and as in these, many infirmities arise which cannot be cured without the application of fire or steel. So in the former, there often occur such numerous and great evils, that a good and merciful citizen, when there is a necessity for the sword, would be much more to blame in leaving her uncured, than by using this remedy for her preservation. What greater disease can afflict a republic than slavery? And what remedy is more desirable for adoption than the one by which alone it can be effectively removed? No wars are just, but those that are necessary, and force is merciful when it presents the only hope of relief. I know not what necessity can be greater than ours, or what compassion can exceed that which rescues our country from slavery. Our cause is therefore just, and our purpose merciful, as both yourself and we may be easily convinced. The amplest justice is on your side, for the Florentines have not hesitated, after a peace concluded with so much solemnity, to enter into league with those who have rebelled against you, so that if our cause is insufficient to excite you against them, let your own just indignation do so, and the more so, seeing the facility of the undertaking. You need be under no apprehension from the memory of the past, in which you may have observed the power of that people and their pertinacity in self-defence, though these might reasonably excite fear, if they were still animated by the valour of former times. But now all is entirely the reverse. For what power can be expected in a city that has recently expelled the greatest part of her wealth and industry? What indomitable resolution need be apprehended from the people whom so many in such recent enmities have disunited? The disunion which still prevails will prevent wealthy citizens advancing money as they used to do on former occasions. For though men willingly contribute according to their means, when they see their own credit, glory, and private advantage dependent upon it, or when there is a hope of regaining in peace what has been spent in war, but not when equally oppressed under all circumstances, when in war they suffer the injuries of the enemy, and in peace the insolence of those who govern them. Besides this, the people feel more deeply the avarice of their rulers than the rapacity of the enemy, for there is hope of being ultimately relieved from the latter evil, but none from the former. Thus, in the last war, you had to contend with the whole city, but now with only a small portion. You attempted to take the government from many good citizens, but now you oppose only a few bad ones. You then endeavoured to deprive a city of a liberty, now you come to restore it. As it is unreasonable to suppose that under such disparity of circumstances the result should be the same, you have now every reason to anticipate an easy victory, and how much it will strengthen your own government you may easily judge, having Tuscany friendly and bound by so powerful an obligation in your enterprises she will be even of more service to you than Milan, and although on former occasions such an acquisition might be looked upon as ambitious and unwarrantable, 
it will now be considered merciful and just. Then do not let this opportunity escape, and be assured, that although your attempts against the city have been attended with difficulty, expense, and disgrace, this will with facility procure you incalculable advantage and an honourable renown. Many words were not requisite to induce the Duke to hostilities against the Florentines, for he was incited to it by hereditary hatred and blind ambition, and still more by the fresh injuries which the League with the Genoese involved. Yet his past expenses, the dangerous measures necessary, the remembrance of his recent losses, and the vain hopes of the exiles, alarmed him. As soon as he had learned the revolt of Genoa, he ordered Niccolo Piccinino to proceed thither with all his cavalry, and whatever infantry he could raise, for the purpose of recovering her, before the citizens had time to become settled and establish a government. For he trusted greatly in the fortress within the city which was held for him. And although Niccolo drove the Genoese from the mountains, took from them the valley of Pozzaveri, where they had entrenched themselves, and obliged them to seek refuge within the walls of the city, he still found such an insurmountable obstacle in the resolute defence of the citizens that he was compelled to withdraw. On this, at the suggestion of the Florentine exiles, he commanded Niccolo to attack them on the eastern side, upon the confines of Pisa in the Genoese territory, and to push the war with his utmost vigour, thinking this plan would manifest and develop the course best to be adopted. Niccolo therefore besieged and took Serezana, and having committed great ravages by way of further alarming the Florentines, he proceeded to Lucca, spreading a report that it was his intention to go to Naples to render assistance to the king of Aragon. Upon these new events, Pope Eugenius left Florence and proceeded to Bologna, where he endeavoured to effect an amicable arrangement between the League and the Duke, intimating to the latter that, if he would not consent to some treaty, the pontiff must send Francesco Sforza to assist the League, for the latter was now his confederate, and served in his pay. Although the Pope greatly exerted himself in this affair, his endeavours were unavailing, for the Duke would not listen to any proposal that did not leave him the possession of Genoa, and the League had resolved that she should remain free, and therefore, each party having no other recourse, prepared to continue the war. In the meantime, Niccolo Piccinino arrived at Lucca, and the Florentines, being doubtful what course to adopt, ordered Neri di Gino to lead their forces into the Pisan territory, induced the pontiff to allow Count Francesco to join him, and with their forces they halted at San Gonda. Piccinino then demanded admission into the kingdom of Naples, and this being refused, he threatened to force a passage. The armies were equal, both in regard of numbers and the capacity of their leaders, and unwilling to tempt fortune during the bad weather, it being the month of December, they remained several days without attacking each other. The first movement was made by Niccolo Piccinino, who being informed that if he attacked Vico Pisano by night, he could easily take possession of the palace, made the attempt, and having failed, ravaged the surrounding country, and then burned and plundered the town of San Giovanni alla Vena. This enterprise, though of little consequence, excited him to make further attempts, the more so from being assured that the Count and Neri were yet in their quarters, and he attacked Santa Maria in Castello and Filetto, both which places he took. Still the Florentine forces would not stir, not that the Count entertained any fear, but because out of regard to the Pope, who still laboured to effect an accommodation. The government of Florence had deferred giving their final consent to the war. This course, which the Florentines adopted from prudence, was considered by the enemy to be only the result of timidity, and with increased boldness they led their forces up to Barga, which they resolved to besiege. This new attack made the Florentines set aside all other considerations, and resolved not only to relieve Barga, but to invade the Lucchese territory. Accordingly the Count proceeded in pursuit of Niccolo, and coming up with him before Barga, an engagement took place in which Piccinino was overcome and compelled to raise the siege. The Venetians, considering the Duke to have broken the peace, sent Giovanni Francesco da Gonzaga, their captain, to Giara Dada, who, by severely wasting the Duke's territories, induced him to recall Niccolo Piccinino from Tuscany. This circumstance, together with the victory obtained over Niccolo, emboldened the Florentines to attempt the recovery of Lucca, since the Duke, whom alone they feared, was engaged with the Venetians, 
and the Lucchese, having received the enemy into their city, and allowed him to attack them, would have no ground of complaint. Book Five, Chapter Three of the History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Five, Chapter Three. The Florentines go to war with Luca. Discourse of a citizen of Luca to animate the plebeians against the Florentines. The Lucchese resolve to defend themselves. They are assisted by the Duke of Milan. Treaty between the Florentines and the Venetians. Francesco Sforza, captain of the League, refuses to cross the Po in the service of the Venetians, and returns to Tuscany. The bad faith of the Venetians towards the Florentines. Cosmo di Medici at Venice. Peace between the Florentines and the Lucchese. The Florentines effect a reconciliation between the Pope and the Count di Popi. The Pope consecrates the Church of Santa Reparata, the Council of Florence. The Count commenced operations against Luca in April 1437, and the Florentines, desirous of recovering what they had themselves lost before they attacked others, retook Santa Maria in Castello, and all the places which Piccinino had occupied. Then, entering the Lucchese territory, they besiege Camiore, the inhabitants of which, although faithful to their rulers, being influenced more by immediate danger than by attachment to their distant friends, surrendered. In the same manner they obtained Massa and Serenzana. Towards the end of May they proceeded in the direction of Lucca, burning the towns, destroying the growing crops, grains, trees, and vines, driving away cattle, and leaving nothing undone to injure the enemy. The Lucchese, finding themselves abandoned by the Duke, and hopeless of defending the open country, forsook it, entrenched and fortified the city, which they doubted not, being well garrisoned, they would be able to defend for a time, and that, in the interim, some event would occur for their relief, as had been the case during the former wars which the Florentines had carried on against them. Their only apprehension arose from the fickle minds of the plebeians, who, becoming weary of the siege, would have more consideration of their own danger than of others' liberty, and would thus compel them to submit to some disgraceful and ruinous capitulation. In order to animate them to defense, they were assembled in the public piazza, and some of the eldest and most esteemed of the citizens addressed them in the following terms. You are doubtless aware that what is done from necessity involves neither censure nor applause. Therefore, if you should accuse us of having caused the present war by receiving the ducal forces into the city and allowing them to commit hostilities against the Florentines, you are greatly mistaken. You are well acquainted with the ancient enmity of the Florentines against you, which is not occasioned by any injuries you have done them, or by fear on their part, but by our weakness and their own ambition." for the one gives them hope of being able to oppress us, and the other incites them to attempt it. It is then vain to imagine that any merit of yours can extinguish that desire in them, or that any offense you can commit can provoke them to greater animosity. They endeavor to deprive you of your liberty. You must resolve to defend it, and whatever they may undertake against us for that purpose, although we may lament, we need not wonder." We may well grieve, therefore, that they attack us, take possession of our towns, burn our houses, and waste our country. But who is so simple as to be surprised at it? For were it in our power, we should do just the same to them, or even worse. They declare war against us now, they say, for having received Niccolo. But if we had not received him, they would have done the same and assigned some other ground for it. And if the evil had been delayed, it would most probably have been greater." Therefore you must not imagine it to be occasioned by his arrival, but rather by your own ill fortune and their ambition. For we could not have refused admission of the Duke's forces, and, being come, we could not prevent their aggressions. You know that without the aid of some powerful ally we are incapable of self-defense, and that none can render us this service more powerfully or faithfully than the Duke. He restored our liberty. It is reasonable to expect he will defend it. He has always been the greatest foe of our inveterate enemies. If, therefore, to avoid incensing the Florentines, 
we had excited his anger, we should have lost our best friend, and rendered our enemy more powerful and more disposed to oppress us, so that it is far preferable to have this war upon our hands, and enjoy the favor of the duke, than to be in peace without it. Besides, we are justified in expecting that he will rescue us from the dangers into which we are brought on his account, if we only do not abandon our own cause. You all know how fiercely the Florentines have frequently assailed us, and with what glory we have maintained our defense. We have often been deprived of every hope, except in God and the casualties which time might produce, and both have proved our friends. And as they have delivered us formerly, why should they not continue to do so? Then we were forsaken by the whole of Italy. Now we have the Duke in our favor. Besides, we have a right to suppose that the Venetians will not hastily attack us, for they will not willingly see the power of Florence increased. On the former occasion the Florentines were more at liberty. They had greater hope of assistance, and were more powerful in themselves, while we were in every respect weaker, for then a tyrant governed us. Now we defend ourselves. Then the glory of our defense was another's. Now it is our own. Then they were in harmony. Now they are disunited, all Italy being filled with their banished citizens. But were we without the hope which these favorable circumstances present, our extreme necessity should make us firmly resolved on our defense. It is reasonable to fear every enemy, for all seek their own glory and your ruin. Above all others, you have to dread the Florentines, for they would not be satisfied by submission and tribute or the dominion of our city, but they would possess our entire substance and persons, that they might satiate their cruelty with our blood and their avarice with our property, so that all ranks ought to dread them. Therefore do not be troubled at seeing our crops destroyed, our towns burned, our fortresses occupied, for if we preserve the city, the rest will be saved as a matter of course. If we lose her, all else would be of no advantage to us. While retaining our liberty, the enemy can hold only with the greatest difficulty. While losing it, they would be preserved in vain. Arm, therefore, and when in the fight, remember that the reward of victory will be safety, not only to your country, but to your homes, your wives, and your children. The speaker's last words were received with the utmost enthusiasm by the people, who promised one and all to die rather than to abandon their cause, or submit to any terms that could violate their liberty. They then made arrangements for the defense of the city. In the meantime the Florentine forces were not idle, and after innumerable mischiefs done to the country took Monte Carlo by capitulation. They then besieged Uzzano, in order that the Lucchese, being pressed on all sides, might despair of assistance and be compelled to submission by famine. The fortress was very strong, and defended by a numerous garrison, so that its capture would be by no means an easy undertaking. The Lucchese, as might be expected, seeing the imminent peril of their situation, had recourse to the duke and employed prayers and remonstrances to induce him to render them aid. They enlarged upon their own merits and the offenses of the Florentines, and showed how greatly it would attach the duke's friends to him to find they were defended, and how much disaffection it would spread among them if they were left to be overwhelmed by the enemy, that if they lost their liberties and their lives he would lose his honor and his friends, and forfeit the confidence of all who from affection might be induced to incur dangers in his behalf, and added tears to entreaties, so that if he were unmoved by gratitude to them he might be induced to their defense by motives of compassion. The duke, influenced by his inveterate hostility against the Florentines, his new obligation to the Lucchese, and above all by his desire to prevent so great an acquisition from falling into the hands of his ancient enemies, determined either to send a strong force into Tuscany, or vigorously to assail the Venetians, so as to compel the Florentines to give up their enterprise and go to their relief. It was soon known in Florence that the Duke was preparing to send forces into Tuscany. This made the Florentines apprehensive for the success of their enterprise, and in order to retain the Duke of Lombardy, they requested the Venetians to press him with their utmost strength. But they also were alarmed, the Marquis of Mantua having abandoned them 
and gone over to the duke, and thus finding themselves almost defenseless, they replied, that instead of increasing their responsibilities, they should be unable to perform their part in the war, unless the Count Francesco were sent to them to take the command of the army, and with the special understanding that he should engage to cross the Po in person. They declined to fulfill their former engagements unless he were bound to do so, for they could not carry on the war without a leader, or repose confidence in any except the Count, and he himself would be useless to them unless he came under an obligation to carry on the war whenever they might think needful. The Florentines thought the war ought to be pushed vigorously in Lombardy, but they saw that if they lost the Count their enterprise against Luca was ruined, and they knew well that the demand of the Venetians arose less from any need they had of the Count than from their desire to frustrate this expedition. The Count, on the other hand, was ready to pass into Lombardy whenever the League might require him, but would not alter the tenor of his engagement, for he was unwilling to sacrifice the hope of the alliance promised to him by the Duke. The Florentines were thus embarrassed by two contrary impulses, the wish to possess Luca and the dread of a war with Milan. As commonly happens, fear was the most powerful, and they consented, after the capture of Uzzano, that the Count should go into Lombardy. There still remained another difficulty, which, depending on circumstances beyond the reach of their influence, created more doubts and uneasiness than the former. The Count would not consent to pass the Po, and the Venetians refused to accept him on any other condition. Seeing no other method of arrangement than that each should make liberal concessions, the Florentines induced the Count to cross the river by a letter addressed to the Signori of Florence, intimating that this private promise did not invalidate any public engagement, and that he might still refrain from crossing. Hence it resulted that the Venetians, having commenced the war, would be compelled to proceed, and that the evil apprehended by the Florentines would be averted. To the Venetians, on the other hand, they averred that this private letter was sufficiently binding, and therefore they ought to be content, for if they could save the Count from breaking with his father-in-law, it was well to do so, and that it could be of no advantage either to themselves or the Venetians to publish it without some manifest necessity. It was thus determined that the Count should pass into Lombardy, and having taken Uzzano and raised bastions about Luca to restrain in her inhabitants, place the management of the siege in the hands of the commissaries, crossed the Apennines, and proceeded to Reggio, where the Venetians, alarmed at his progress, and in order to discover his intentions, insisted upon his immediately crossing the Po, and joining the other forces. The Count refused compliance, and many mutual recriminations took place between him and Andrea Morocheno, their messenger on this occasion, each charging the other with arrogance and treachery. After many protestations, the one of being under no obligation to perform that service, and the other of not being bound to any payment, they parted, the Count to return to Tuscany, the other to Venice. The Florentines had sent the Count to encamp in the Pisan territory, and were in hopes of inducing him to renew the war against the Lucchese, but found him indisposed to do so, for the Duke, having been informed that out of regard to him he had refused to cross the Po, thought that by this means he might also save the Lucchese, and begged the Count to endeavor to effect an accommodation between the Florentines and the Lucchese, including himself in it, if he were able, declaring, at the same time, the promised marriage should be solemnized whenever he thought proper. The prospect of this connection had great influence with the Count, for as the Duke had no sons, it gave him hope of becoming sovereign of Milan. For this reason he gradually abated his exertions in the war, declared that he would not proceed unless the Venetians fulfilled their engagement as to the payment, and also retained him in the command, that the discharge of the debt would not alone be sufficient for desiring to live peaceably in his own dominions, he needed some alliance other than that of the Florentines, and that he must regard his own interests, shrewdly hinting that if abandoned by the Venetians he would come to terms with the Duke." these indirect and crafty methods of procedure were highly offensive to the Florentines, for they found their expedition against Luca frustrated, and trembled for the safety of their own territories if ever the Count and the Duke should enter into a mutual alliance. 
To induce the Venetians to retain the count in the command, Cosmo de' Medici went to Venice, hoping his influence would prevail with them, and discuss the subject at great length before the Senate, pointing out the condition of the Italian states, the disposition of their armies, and the great preponderance possessed by the Duke. He concluded by saying that if the count and the Duke were to unite their forces, they, the Venetians, might return to the sea, and the Florentines would have to fight for their liberty. To this the Venetians replied that they were acquainted with their own strength and that of the Italians, and thought themselves able at all events to provide for their own defense, that it was not their custom to pay soldiers for serving others, that as the Florentines had used the Count's services, they must pay him themselves. With respect to the security of their own states, it was rather desirable to check the Count's pride than to pay him, for the ambition of men is boundless and if he were now paid without serving, he would soon make some other demand, still more unreasonable and dangerous. It therefore seemed necessary to curb his insolence, and not allow it to increase till it became incorrigible, and that if the Florentines, from fear of any other motive, wished to preserve his friendship, they must pay him themselves. Cosmo returned without having effected any part of his object. The Florentines used the weightiest arguments they could adopt to prevent the Count from quitting the service of the League, a course he was himself reluctant to follow, but his desire to conclude the marriage so embarrassed him that any trivial accident would have been sufficient to determine his course, as indeed shortly happened. The Count had left his territories in La Marca to the care of Il Forlano, one of his principal condottieri who was so far influenced by the duke as to take command under him, and quit the count's service. This circumstance caused the latter to lay aside every idea but that of his own safety, and to come to agreement with the duke, among the terms of which compact was one that he should not be expected to interfere in the affairs of Romagna and Tuscany. The count then urged the Florentines to come to terms with the Lucchese and so convinced them of the necessity of this, that seeing no better course to adopt, they complied in April 1438, by which treaty the Lucchese retained their liberty, in the Florentines, Monte Carlo, and a few other fortresses. After this, being full of exasperation, they dispatched letters to every part of Italy, overcharged with complaints, affecting to show that since God and men were averse to the Lucchese coming under their dominion, they had made peace with them and it seldom happens that any suffer so much for the loss of their own lawful property as they did because they could not obtain the possession of others. Though the Florentines had now so many affairs in hand, they did not allow the proceedings of their neighbors to pass unnoticed or neglect the decoration of their city. As before observed, Niccolo Fortebraccio was dead. He had married a daughter of the Count di Poppi, who, at the decease of his son-in-law, held the Borgo San Sepulcro and other fortresses of that district, and while Niccolo lived, governed them in his name. Claiming them as his daughter's portion, he refused to give them up to the Pope, who demanded them as property held of the church, and who, upon his refusal, sent the patriarch with forces to take possession of them. The Count, finding himself unable to sustain the attack, offered them to the Florentines, who declined them. But, the Pope, having returned to Florence, they interceded with him in the Count's behalf. Difficulties arising, the Patriarch attacked the Casentino, took Prato Vecchio and Romena, and offered them also to the Florentines, who refused them likewise, unless the Pope would consent they should restore them to the Count, to which, after much hesitation, he acceded, on condition that the Florentines should prevail with the Count de Popi to restore the Borgo to him. The Pope was thus satisfied, and the Florentines, having so far completed the building of their cathedral church of Santa Reparata, which had been commenced long ago, as to enable them to perform divine service in it, requested His Holiness to consecrate it. To this the Pontiff willingly agreed, and the Florentines, to exhibit the wealth of the city and the splendor of the edifice, and do greater honor to the Pope, erected a platform from Santa Maria Novella, where he resided to the cathedral he was about to consecrate, six feet in height and twelve feet wide, covered with rich drapery, for the accommodation of the pontiff and his court, upon which they proceeded to the building, 
accompanied by those civic magistrates and other officers who were appointed to take part in the procession. The usual ceremonies of consecration having been completed, the Pope, to show his affection for the city, conferred the honor of knighthood upon Giuliano d'Avanzati, their gonfalonier of justice, and the citizen of the highest reputation, and the signori, not to appear less gracious than the Pope, granted to the new created knight the government of Pisa for one year. There were at the time certain differences between the Roman and the Greek churches, which prevented perfect conformity in divine service. And at the last council of Bale, the prelates of the Western Church, having spoken at great length upon the subject, it was resolved that efforts should be made to bring the emperor and the Greek prelates to the council at Baal, to endeavor to reconcile the Greek church with the Roman. Though this resolution was derogatory to the majesty of the Greek empire and offensive to its clergy, yet being then oppressed by the Turks and fearing their inability for defense, in order to have a better ground for requesting assistance, they submitted and therefore the emperor, the patriarch, and the other prelates and barons of Greece, to comply with the resolution of the council, assembled at Baal, came to Venice. But, being terrified by the plague then prevailing, it was resolved to terminate their differences at Florence, the Roman and Greek prelates, having held a conference during several days in which many long discussions took place, the Greeks yielded and agreed to adopt the ritual of the Church of Rome. Book 5, Chapter 4 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dennis Sayers. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2 translated by an unknown translator book five chapter four new wars in italy niccolo piccinino in concert with the duke of milan deceives the pope and takes many places in the church niccolo attacks the venetians fears and precautions of the florentines the venetians request assistance of the florentines in of Sforza, league against the Duke of Milan. The Florentines resolve to send the Count to assist the Venetians. Neri di Cino Caponi at Venice. His discourse to the Senate. Extreme joy of the Venetians. Peace being restored between the Lucchesi and Florentines, and the Duke and the Count having become friends, Hopes were entertained that the arms of Italy would be laid aside, although those in the kingdom of Naples, between René of Anjou and Alfonso of Aragon, could find repose only by the ruin of one party or the other. And, though the Pope was dissatisfied with the loss of so large a portion of his territories, and the ambition of the Duke and the Venetians was obvious, Still it was thought that the pontiff, from necessity, and the others from weariness, would be advocates of peace. However, a different state of feeling prevailed, for neither the duke nor the Venetians were satisfied with their condition, so that hostilities were resumed, and Lombardy and Tuscany were again harassed by the horrors of war. The proud mind of the duke could not endure that the Venetians should possess Pergamo and Brescia, and he was still further annoyed by hearing that they were constantly in arms, and in the daily practice of annoying some portion of his territories. He thought, however, that he should not only be able to restrain them, but to recover the places he had lost, if the Pope the Florentines and the Count could be induced to forego the Venetian alliance. He therefore resolved to take Romagna from the Pontiff, imagining that His Holiness could not injure him, and that the Florentines, finding the conflagration so near, either for their own sake would refrain from interference, or, if they did not, could not conveniently attack him. 
The Duke was also aware of the resentment of the Florentines against the Venetians, on account of the affair of Lucca, and he therefore judged that they would be the less eager to take arms against him on their behalf. With regard to the Count Francesco, he trusted that their new friendship, and the hope of his alliance, would keep him quiet, to give as little color as possible for complaint, and to lull suspicion, particularly, because in consequence of his treaty with the Count, the latter could not attack Romagna, he ordered Niccolo Pizzinino, as if instigated by his ambition, to do so. When the arrangement between the Duke and the Count was concluded, Niccolo was in Romagna, and, in pursuance of his instructions from the Duke, affected to be highly incensed that a connection had been established between him and the Count, his inveterate enemy. He, therefore, withdrew himself and his forces to Camerata, a place between Furli and Ravenna, which he fortified as if designing to remain there some time, or until a new enterprise should present itself. The report of his resentment being diffused, Niccolo gave the Pope to understand how much the Duke was under obligation to him, and how ungrateful he proved, and he was persuaded that, possessing nearly all the arms of Italy, under the two principal generals, he could render himself sole ruler, but if his holiness pleased, of the two principal generals whom he fancied he possessed, one would become his enemy, and the other be rendered useless. For, if money were provided him, and he were kept in pay, he would attack the territories held of the church by the count, who, being compelled to look to his own interests, could not subserve the ambition of Filippo. The Pope, giving entire credence to this representation, on account of its apparent reasonableness, sent Niccolo five thousand ducats, and loaded him with promises of stakes for himself and his children. And though many informed him of the deception, he could not give credit to them, nor would he endure the conversation of any who seemed to doubt the integrity of Niccolo's professions. The city of Ravenna was held for the church by Ocasio da Polenta. Niccolo, finding further delay would be detrimental, since his son Francesco had, to the Pope's great dishonor, pillaged Spoleto, determined to attack Ravenna, either because he judged the enterprise easy, or because he had a secret understanding with Otasio, for, in a few days after the attack, the place capitulated. He then took Bologna, Imola, and Furli, and, what is worthy of remark, of twenty fortresses held in that country for the Pope, not one escaped falling into his hands. Not satisfied with these injuries inflicted on the pontiff, he resolved to banter him by his words, as well as ridicule him by his needs, and wrote that he had only done as his holiness deserved, for having unblushingly attempted to divide two such attached friends as the Duke and himself, and for having dispersed over Italy letters intimating that he had quitted the Duke to take part with the Venetians. Having taken possession of Romagna, Niccolo left it under the charge of his son Francesco, and with the greater part of his troops went into Lombardy, where, joining the remainder of the Duke's forces, he attacked the country about Brescia, and, having soon completely conquered it, besieged the city itself. The Duke, who desired the Venetians to be left defenceless, excused himself to the Pope, the Florentines, and the Count, saying that if the doings of Niccolo were contrary to the terms of the treaty, they were equally contrary to his wishes, and, by secret messengers, assured them that, when an occasion presented itself, he would give them a convincing proof that they had been performed 
in disobedience to his instructions. Neither the Count nor the Florentines believed him, but thought, with reason, that these enterprises had been carried on to keep them at bay, till he had subdued the Venetians, who, being full of pride, and thinking themselves able alone to resist the Duke, had not deigned to ask for any assistance, but carried on the war under their captain, Gatamelata. Count Francesco would have wished, with the consent of the Florentines, to go to the assistance of King René, if the events of Romagna and Lombardy had not hindered him, and the Florentines would willingly have consented, from their ancient friendship to the French dynasty, but the duke was entirely in favour of Alfonso. Each being engaged in wars near home, refrained from distant undertakings. The Florentines, finding Romagna occupied with the duke's forces, and the Venetians defeated, as if foreseeing their own ruin and that of others, entreated the count to come to Tuscany, where they might consider what should be done to resist Filippo's power, which was now greater than it had ever before been, assuring him that if his insolence were not in some way curbed, all the powers of Italy would soon have to submit to him. The Count felt the force of the fears entertained by the Florentines, but his desire to secure the Duke's alliance kept him in suspense, and the Duke, aware of this desire, gave him the greatest assurance that his hopes would be realized as shortly as possible, if he abstained from hostilities against him. As the lady was now of marriageable age, the Duke had frequently made all suitable preparations for the celebration of the ceremony, but on one pretext or another they had always been wholly set aside. He now, to give the Count greater confidence, added deeds to his words, and sent him thirty thousand florins, which by the terms of the marriage contract he had engaged to pay. Still, the war in Lombardy proceeded with greater vehemence than ever. The Venetians constantly suffered fresh losses of territory, and the fleets they equipped upon the rivers were taken by the duke's forces. The country around Verona and Brescia was entirely occupied, and the two cities themselves so pressed that their speedy fall was generally anticipated. The Marquis of Mantua, who for many years had led the forces of their republic, quite unexpectedly resigned his command, and went over to the duke's service. Thus the course which pride prevented them from adopting at the commencement of the war, fear compelled them to take during its progress, for knowing there was no help for them but in the friendship of the Florentines and the Count, they began to make overtures to obtain it, though with shame and apprehension, for they were afraid of receiving a reply similar to that which they had given the Florentines when the latter applied for assistance in the enterprise against Luca and the Count's affairs. However, they found the Florentines more easily induced to render aid than they expected, or their conduct deserved. So much more were the former swayed by hatred of their ancient enemy, than by resentment of the ingratitude of their old and habitual friends. Having foreseen the necessity into which the Venetians must come, they had informed the Count that their ruin must involve his own, that he was deceived if he thought the Duke, while fortune, would esteem him more than if he were in adversity, that the Duke was induced to promise him his daughter by the fear he entertained of him, that what necessity occasions to be promised it also causes to be performed, and it was therefore desirable to keep the duke in that necessity, which could be done without supporting the power of the Venetians. Therefore 
he might perceive that if the Venetians were compelled to abandon their inland territories, he would not only lose the advantages derivable from them, but also those to be obtained from such as feared them, and that if he considered well the powers of Italy, he would see that some were poor and others hostile, that the Florentines alone were not, as he had often said, sufficient for his support, so that on every account it was best to keep the Venetians powerful by land. These arguments, conjoined with the hatred which the Count had conceived against Filippo, by supposing himself duped with regard to the promised alliance, induced him to consent to a new treaty, but still he would not consent to cross the Po. The agreement was concluded in February 1438, the Venetians agreeing to pay two-thirds of the expense of the war, the Florentines one-third, and each engaging to defend the states which the Count possessed in La Marca. Nor were these the only forces of the League, for the Lord of Faenza, the sons of Pandolfo Malateste da Ramino, and Pietro Giampagolo Orsini, also joined them. They endeavoured, by very liberal offers, to gain over the Marquis of Mantua, but could not prevail against the friendship and stipend of the Duke, and the Lord of Faenza, after having entered into compact with the League, being tempted by more advantageous terms, went over to him. This made them despair of being able to effect an early settlement of the troubles of Romagna. The affairs of Lombardy were in this condition. Brescia was so closely besieged by the Duke's forces that constant apprehensions were entertained of her being compelled by a famine to a surrender, while Verona was so pressed that a similar fate was expected to await her, and if one of these cities were lost, all the other preparations for the war might be considered useless, and the expenses already incurred as completely wasted. For this there was no remedy but to send the Count into Lombardy, and to this measure three obstacles presented themselves. The first was to induce him to cross the Po, and prosecute the war in whatever locality might be found most advisable. The second, that the Count being at a distance, the Florentines would be left almost at the mercy of the Duke, who, issuing from any of his fortresses, might with part of his troops keep the Count at bay, and, with the rest, introduce into Tuscany the Florentine exiles, whom the existing government already dreaded. The third was to determine what route the Count should take to arrive safely in the Paduan territory, and join the Venetian forces. Of these three difficulties, the second, which particularly regarded the Florentines, was the most serious, but knowing the necessity of the case, and wearied out by the Venetians, who with unceasing importunity demanded the Count, intimating that without him they should abandon all hope, they resolved to relieve their allies rather than listen to the suggestions of their own fears. There still remained the question about the route to be taken for the safety of which they determined the Venetians should provide, and, as they had sent Neri Caponi to treat with the Count and induce him to cross the Po, they determined that the same person should also proceed to Venice, in order to make the benefit the more acceptable to the Signory, and seeing that all possible security were given to the passage of the forces. Neri embarked at Cecina and went to Venice. Nor was any prince ever received with so much honor as he was, for upon his arrival, and the matters which his intervention was to decide and determine, the safety of the Republic seemed to depend. 
being introduced to the Senate, and in presence of the Doge, he said, The signory of Florence, most serene prince, has always perceived in the Duke's greatness the source of ruin both to this republic and our own, and that the safety of both states depends upon their separate strength and mutual confidence. If such had been the opinion of this illustrious signory, we should ourselves have been in better condition, and your republic would have been free from the dangers that now threaten it. But, as at the proper crisis you withheld from us confidence and aid, we could not come to the relief of your distress, nor could you, being conscious of this, freely ask us, for neither in your prosperity nor adversity have you clearly perceived our motives. You have not observed that those whose deeds have once incurred our hatred can never become entitled to our regard, nor can those who have once merited our affection ever after absolutely cancel their claim. Our attachment to your most serene signory is well known to you all, for you have often seen Lombardy filled with our forces and our money for your assistance. Our hereditary enmity to Filippo and his house is universally known, and it is impossible that love or hatred, strengthened by the growth of years, can be eradicated from our minds by any recent act, either of kindness or neglect. We have always thought, and are still of the same opinion, that we might now remain neutral, greatly to the Duke's satisfaction, and with little hazard to ourselves. For, if by your ruin he were to become Lord of Lombardy, we should still have sufficient influence in Italy to free us from any apprehension on our account. For every increase of power and territory augments that animosity and envy from which arise wars and the dismemberment of states. We are also aware what heavy expenses and imminent perils we should avoid by declining to involve ourselves in these disputes, and how easily the field of battle may be transferred from Lombardy to Tuscany, by our interference in your behalf. Yet all these apprehensions are at once overborne by our ancient affection for the Senate and people of Venice, and we have resolved to come to your relief with the same zeal with which we should have armed in our own defense, had we been attacked. Therefore the state of Florence, judging it primarily necessary to relieve Verona and Brescia, and thinking this impossible without the Count, have sent me, in the first instance, to persuade him to pass into Lombardy, and carry on the war wherever it may be most needful. For you are aware he is under no obligation to cross the Po. To induce him to do so, I have advanced such arguments as are suggested by the circumstances themselves, and which would prevail with us. He, being invincible in arms, cannot be surpassed in courtesy, and the liberality he sees the Florentines exercise toward you, he has resolved to outdo. For he is well aware to what dangers Tuscany will be exposed after his departure. And since we have made your affairs our primary consideration, he has also resolved to make his own subservient to yours. I come, therefore, to tender his services with seven thousand cavalry and two thousand infantry, ready at once to march against the enemy, wherever he may be. And I beg of you, so do my lords at Florence and the Count, that, as his forces exceed the number he has engaged to furnish, you, out of your liberality, would remunerate him that he may not repent of having come to your assistance, nor we, who have prevailed with him, to do so.
this discourse of Neri to the Senate was listened to with that profound attention which an oracle might be imagined to command, and his audience were so moved by it that they could not restrain themselves till the prince had replied, as strict decorum on such occasions required, but rising from their seats with uplifted hands, and most of them with tears in their eyes, they thanked the Florentines for their generous conduct, and the ambassador for his unusual dispatch, and promised that time should never cancel the remembrance of such goodness, either in their own hearts or their children's, and that their country thenceforth should be common to the Florentines with themselves. Book 5, Chapter 5 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2. Translated by an unknown translator. Book 5, Chapter 5. Francesco Sforza marches to assist the Venetians, and relieves Verona. He attempts to relieve Brescia, but fails. The Venetians routed by Piccinino upon the lake of Garda. Piccinino routed by Sforza, the method of his escape. Piccinino surprises Verona. Description of Verona. Recovered by Sforza. The Duke of Milan makes war against the Florentines. Apprehensions of the Florentines. Cardinal Vitelleschi, their enemy. When their demonstrations of gratitude had subsided, the Venetian Senate, by the aid of Neri di Gino, began to consider the route the Count ought to take, and how to provide him with necessaries. There were four several roads, one by Ravenna, along the beach, which on account of its being in many places interrupted by the sea and by marches was not approved. The next was the most direct, but rendered inconvenient by a tower called the Uccellino, which, being held for the Duke, it would be necessary to capture, and to do this would occupy more time than could be spared with safety to Verona and Brescia. The third was by the brink of the lake, but as the Po had overflowed its banks, to pass in this direction was impossible. The fourth was by way of Bologna to Ponte Polidrano, Cento and Pieve, then between the Bondino and the Finale to Ferrara, and thence they might by land or water enter the Paduan territory and join the Venetian forces. This route, though attended with many difficulties, and in some parts liable to be disputed by the enemy, was chosen as the least objectionable. The Count, having received his instructions, commenced his march, and by exerting the utmost celerity, reached the Paduan territory on the 20th of June. The arrival of this distinguished commander in Lombardy filled Venice and all her dependents with hope, for the Venetians, who only an instant before had been in fear for their very existence, began to contemplate new conquests. The Count, before he made any other attempt, hastened to the relief of Verona, and to counteract his design, Niccolo led his forces to Suave, a castle situated between the Vincentino and the Veronese, and entrenched himself by a ditch that extended from Suave to the marches of the Adige. The Count, finding his passage by the plain cut off, resolved to proceed by the mountains and thus reach Verona, thinking Niccolo would imagine this way to be so rugged and elevated as to be impracticable, or, if he thought otherwise, he would not be in time to prevent him. So, with provisions for eight days, he took the mountain path, and with his forces arrived in the plain below Suave. Niccolo had, even upon this route, erected some bastions for the purpose of preventing him, but they were insufficient for the purpose, and finding the enemy had, contrary to his expectations, effected a passage, to avoid a disadvantageous engagement he crossed to the opposite side of the Adige, and the Count entered Verona without opposition. Having happily succeeded in his first project, that of relieving Verona, the Count now endeavoured to render a similar service to Brescia. This city is situated so close to the lake of Garda, that although besieged by land, provisions may always be sent into it by water. On this account, the Duke had assembled a large force in the immediate vicinity of the lake, 
and at the commencement of his victories occupied all the places which by its means might relieve Brescia. The Venetians also had galleys upon the lake, but they were unequal to a contest with those of the duke. The count therefore deemed it advisable to aid the Venetian fleet with his land forces, by which means he hoped to obtain without much difficulty those places which kept Brescia in blockade. He therefore encamped before Bardolino, a fortress situated upon the lake, trusting that after it was taken the others would surrender. But fortune opposed this design, for a great part of his troops fell sick. So, giving up the enterprise, he went to Zevio, a Veronese castle, in a healthy and plentiful situation. Niccolo, upon the Count's retreat, not to let slip an opportunity of making himself master of the lake, left his camp at Bergasio, and with a body of picked men took the way thither, attacked the Venetian fleet with the utmost impetuosity, and took nearly the whole of it. By this victory almost all the fortresses upon the lake fell into his hands. The Venetians, alarmed at this loss, and fearing that in consequence of it Brescia would surrender, solicited the Count, by letters and messengers, to go to its relief, and he, perceiving that all hope of rendering assistance from the lake was cut off, and that to attempt an approach by land, on account of the ditches, bastions, and other defences erected by Niccolo, was marching to certain destruction. Determined that as the passage by the mountains had enabled him to relieve Verona, it should also contribute to the preservation of Brescia. Having taken this resolution, the Count left Zevio, and by way of the Val d'Acri, went to the lake of Sant'Andrea, and thence to Torboli and Peneda upon the lake of Garda. He then proceeded to Tenna, and besieged the fortress, which it was necessary to occupy before he could reach Brescia. Niccolo, on being acquainted with the Count's design, led his army to Pesciera. He then, with the Marquis of Mantua and a chosen body of men, went to meet him, and coming to an engagement, was routed, his people dispersed and many of them taken, while others fled to the fleet, and some to the main body of his army. It was now nightfall, and Niccolo had escaped to Tenna, but he knew that if he were to remain there till morning, he must inevitably fall into the enemy's hands. Therefore, to avoid a catastrophe which might be regarded as almost fatal, he resolved to make a dangerous experiment. Of all his attendants he had only with him a single servant, a Dutchman of great personal strength, and who had always been devotedly attached to him. Niccolo induced this man to take him upon his shoulders in a sack, as if he had been carrying property of his master's, and to bear him to a place of security. The enemy's line surrounded Tenna, but on account of the previous day's victory, all was in disorder, and no guard was kept, so that the Dutchman, disguised as a trooper, passed through them without any opposition, and brought his master in safety to his own troops. Had this victory been as carefully improved as it was fortunately obtained, Brescia would have derived from it greater relief, and the Venetians more permanent advantage. But they, having thoughtlessly let it slip, the rejoicings were soon over, and Brescia remained in her former difficulties. Niccolo, having returned to his forces, resolved by some extraordinary exertion to cancel the impression of his death, and deprive the Venetians of the charge of relieving Brescia. He was acquainted with the topography of the citadel of Verona, and had learned from prisoners whom he had taken that it was badly guarded and might be very easily recovered. He perceived at once that fortune presented him with an opportunity of regaining the laurels he had lately lost, and of changing the joy of the enemy for their recent victory into sorrow for a succeeding disaster. The city of Verona is situated in Lombardy, at the foot of the mountains which divide Italy from Germany, so that it occupies part both of hill and plain. The river Adige rises in the valley of Trento, and entering Italy does not immediately traverse the country, but winding to the left, along the base of the hills, enters Verona, and crosses the city, which it divides unequally, giving much the larger portion to the plain. On the mountain side of the river are two fortresses, formidable rather from their situation than from their actual strength, for being very elevated they command the whole place. One is called San Piero, the other San Felice. On the opposite side of the Adige, upon the plain, with their backs against the city walls, are two other fortresses, about a mile distant from each other, one called the Old, the other the New Citadel, and the wall extends between them that may be compared to a bowstring, 
of which the city wall is the arc. The space comprehended within this segment is very populous, and is called the Borgo of St. Zeno. Niccolo Piccinino designed to capture these fortresses and the Borgo, and he hoped to succeed without much difficulty, as well on account of the ordinary negligence of the guard, which their recent successes would probably increase, as because in war no enterprise is more likely to be successful than one which by the enemy is deemed impossible. With a body of picked men, and accompanied by the Marquis of Mantua, he proceeded by night to Verona, silently scaled the walls, and took the new citadel. Then, entering the place with his troops, he forced the gate of St. Antonio, and introduced the whole of his cavalry. The Venetian garrison of the old citadel, hearing an uproar when the guards of the new were slaughtered, and again when the gate was forced, being now aware of the presence of enemies, raised an alarm and called the people to arms. The citizens awakening in the utmost confusion, some of the boldest armed and hastened to the rector's piazza. In the meantime Niccolo's forces had pillaged the borgo of San Zeno, and proceeding onward were ascertained by the people to be the duke's forces. But being defenceless they advised the Venetian rectors to take refuge in the fortresses, and thus save themselves and the place, as it was more advisable to preserve their lives and so rich a city for better fortune than by endeavouring to repel the present evil, encounter certain death, and incur universal pillage. Upon this the rectors and all the Venetian party fled to the fortress of San Felice. Some of the first citizens, anxious to avoid being plundered by the troops, presented themselves before Niccolo and the Marquis of Mantua, and begged they would rather take possession of a rich city, with honour to themselves, than of a poor one to their own disgrace particularly as they had not induced either the favour of its former possessors or the animosity of its present masters by self-defence. The Marquis and Niccolo encouraged them, and protected their property to the utmost of their power during such a state of military licence. As they felt sure the Count would endeavour to recover the city, they made every possible exertion to gain possession of the fortresses, and those they could not seize they cut off from the rest of the palace by ditches and barricades, so that the enemy might be shut out. The Count Francesco was with his army at Tenna, and when the report was first brought to them he refused to credit it. But being assured of the fact by parties whom it would have been ridiculous to doubt, he resolved, by the exertion of uncommon celerity, to repair the evil negligence had occasioned, and though all his officers advised the abandonment of Verona and Brescia, and a march to Vicenza, lest he might be besieged by the enemy in his present situation, he refused, but resolved to attempt the recovery of Verona. During the consultation he turned to the Venetian commissaries and to Bernardo de' Medici, who was there as commissary for the Florentines, and promised them the recovery of the place if one of the fortresses should hold out. Having collected his forces, he proceeded with the utmost speed to Verona. Observing his approach, Niccolo thought he designed, according to the advice he had received, to go to Vicenza, but finding him continue to draw near, and taking the direction of San Felice, he prepared for its defence, though too late, for the barricades were not completed, his men were dispersed in quest of plunder, or exhorting money from the inhabitants by way of ransom, and he could not collect them in time to prevent the Count's troops from entering the fortress. They then descended into the city, which they happily recovered, to Niccolo's disgrace, and with the loss of great numbers of his men. He himself, with the Marquis of Mantua, first took refuge in the citadel, and thence escaping into the country fled to Mantua, where, having assembled the relics of their army, they hastened to join those who were at the siege of Brescia. Thus in four days Verona was lost and again recovered from the duke. The Count, after this victory, it being now winter and the weather very severe, having first with considerable difficulty thrown provisions into Brescia, went into quarters at Verona, and ordered that during the cold season galleys should be provided at Torboli, that upon the return of spring they might be in a condition to proceed vigorously to effect the permanent relief of Brescia. The Duke, finding the war suspended for a time, the hope that he had entertained of occupying Brescia and Verona annihilated, and the money and counsels of the Florentines the cause of this, and seeing that neither the injuries they had received from the Venetians could alienate them, nor all the promises he had made attach them to himself, he determined, in order to make them feel more closely the effects of the course they had adopted, to attack Tuscany, 
to which he was strenuously advised by the Florentine exiles and Niccolo. The latter advocated this from his desire to recover the states of Braccio and expel the count from La Marca, the former from their wish to return home, and each by suitable arguments endeavoured to induce the duke to follow the plan congenial to their own views. Niccolo argued that he might be sent into Tuscany and continue the siege of Brescia, for he was master of the lake, the fortresses were well provided, and their officers were qualified to oppose the count should he undertake any fresh enterprise, which it was not likely he would do without first relieving Brescia, a thing impossible, and thus the duke might carry on the war in Tuscany, without giving up his attempts in Lombardy, intimating that the Florentines would be compelled, as soon as he entered Tuscany, to recall the count to avoid complete ruin, and whatever course they took, victory to the duke must be the result. The exiles affirmed that, if Niccolo with his army were to approach Florence, the people oppressed with taxes and wearied out by the insolence of the great would most assuredly not oppose him, and pointed out the facility of reaching Florence, for the way by the Cassatino would be open to them through the friendship of Rinaldo and the Count de Poppi, and thus the duke, who was previously inclined to the attempt, was induced by their joint persuasions to make it. The Venetians, on the other hand, though the winter was severe, incessantly urged the Count to relieve Brescia with all his forces. The Count questioned the possibility of so doing, and advised them to wait the return of spring, in the meantime strengthening their fleet as much as possible, and then assist it both by land and water. This rendered the Venetians dissatisfied. They were dilatory in furnishing provisions, and consequently many deserted from their army. The Florentines, being informed of these transactions, became alarmed, perceiving the war threatening themselves, and the little progress made in Lombardy. Nor did the suspicion entertained by them of the troops of the church give them less uneasiness, not that the Pope was their enemy, but because they saw those forces move under the sway of the Patriarch, who was their greatest foe. Giovanni Vitelleschi of Cornetto was at first apostolic notary then bishop of Recanati, and afterwards patriarch of Alexandria. But at last, becoming a cardinal, he was called Cardinal of Florence. He was bold and cunning, and, having obtained great influence, was appointed to command all the forces of the church, and conduct all the enterprises of the pontiff, whether in Tuscany, Romagna, the kingdom of Naples, or in Rome. Hence he acquired so much power over the pontiff and the papal troops, that the former was afraid of commanding him, and the latter obeyed no one else. The cardinal's presence at Rome, when the report came of Niccolo's design to march into Tuscany, redoubled the fear of the Florentines, for since Rinaldo was expelled, he had become an enemy of the Republic, from finding that the arrangements made by his means were not only disregarded, but converted to Rinaldo's prejudice and caused the laying down of arms, which had given his enemies an opportunity of banishing him. In consequence of this, the government thought it would be advisable to restore and indemnify Rinaldo, in case Niccolo came into Tuscany and were joined by him. Their apprehensions were increased by their being unable to account for Niccolo's departure from Lombardy, and his leaving one enterprise almost completed, to undertake another so entirely doubtful, which they could not reconcile with their ideas of consistency, except by supposing some new design had been adopted, or some hidden treachery intended. They communicated their fears to the Pope, who was now sensible of his error in having endowed the Cardinal with too much authority. End of Book 5 Book 5, Chapter 6 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2. Translated by an unknown translator. Book 5, Chapter 6. The Pope imprisons the Cardinal and assists the Florentines. Difference of opinion between the Count and the Venetians respecting the management of the war. The Florentines reconcile them. The Count wishes to go into Tuscany to oppose Piccinino, but is prevented by the Venetians. Niccolo Piccinino in Tuscany. He takes Maradi and plunders the neighborhood of Florence. Description of Maradi. Cowardice of Bartolomeo Orlandini. Brave resistance of Castel San Niccolo. San Niccolo surrenders. Piccinino attempts to take Cortona, but fails. 
While the Florentines were thus anxious, fortune disclosed the means of securing themselves against the patriarch's malevolence. The Republic everywhere exercised the very closest espionage over epistolary communication in order to discover if any persons were plotting against the State. It happened that letters were intercepted at Monte Pulciano, which had been written by the Patriarch to Niccolo without the Pope's knowledge, and although they were written in an unusual character, and the sense so involved that no distinct idea could be extracted, the obscurity itself and the whole aspect of the matter so alarmed the Pontiff that he resolved to seize the person of the cardinal, a duty he committed to Antonio Rido of Padua, who had the command of the castle of St. Angelo, and who, after receiving his instructions, soon found an opportunity of carrying them into effect. The patriarch, having determined to go into Tuscany, prepared to leave Rome on the following day, and ordered the castellan to be upon the drawbridge of the fortress in the morning, for he wished to speak with him as he passed. Antonio perceived this to be the favourable moment, informed his people what they were to do, and awaited the arrival of the patriarch upon the bridge which adjoined the building, and might, for the purpose of security, be raised or lowered as occasion required. The appointed time found him punctual, and Antonio, having drawn him, as if for the convenience of conversation, on to the bridge, gave a signal to his men, who immediately raised it, and in a moment the cardinal, from being a commander of armies, found himself a prisoner of the Castellan. The patriarch's followers at first began to use threats, but being informed of the Pope's directions they were appeased. The Castellan comforting him with kind words, he replied, that the great do not make each other prisoner to let them go again, and that those whom it is proper to take, it is not well to set free. He shortly afterward died in prison. The Pope appointed Lodovico, patriarch of Aquileia, to command his troops, and, Though previously unwilling to interfere in the wars of the League and the Duke, he was now content to take part in them, and engaged to furnish four thousand horse and two thousand foot for the defence of Tuscany. The Florentines, freed from this cause for anxiety, were still apprehensive of Niccolo, and feared confusion in the affairs of Lombardy, from the differences of opinion that existed between the Count and the Venetians. In order the better to become acquainted with the intentions of the parties, they sent Neri di Gini Caponi and Giuliano d'Avanzati to Venice, with instructions to assist in the arrangement of the approaching campaign, and ordered that Neri, having discovered how the Venetians were disposed, should proceed to the Count, learn his designs, and induce him to adopt the course that would be most advantageous to the League. The ambassadors had only reached Ferrara, when they were told that Niccolo Piccinino had crossed the Po with six thousand horse. This made them travel with increased speed, and, having arrived at Venice, they found the Signori fully resolved that Brescia should be relieved without waiting for the return of spring, for if they said that the city would be unable to hold out so long, the fleet could not be in readiness, and that seeing no more immediate relief, she would submit to the enemy, which would render the Duke universally victorious, and cause them to lose the whole of their inland possessions. Neri then proceeded to Verona to ascertain the Count's opinion, who argued, for many reasons, that to march to Brescia before the return of spring would be quite useless, or even worse, for the situation of Brescia, being considered in conjunction with the season, nothing could be expected to result but disorder and fruitless toil to the troops, so that, when the suitable period should arrive, he would be compelled to return to Verona with his army, to recover from the injuries sustained in the winter, and provide necessaries for the summer, and thus the time available for the war would be wasted in marching and countermarching. Orsato Giustiniani and Giovanni Pisani were deputed on the part of Venice to the Count at Verona, having been sent to consider these affairs, and with them it was agreed that the Venetians should pay the Count ninety thousand ducats for the coming year, and to each of the soldiers forty ducats, that he should set out immediately with the whole army and attack the Duke, in order to compel him, for his own preservation, to recall Niccolo into Lombardy. After this agreement the ambassadors returned to Venice, and the Venetians, having so large an amount of money to raise, were very remiss with their commissariat. In the meantime, Niccolo Piccinino pursued his route, and arrived in Romagna, where he prevailed upon the sons of Pandolfo Malatesti to desert the Venetians and enter the Duke's service. This circumstance occasioned much uneasiness in Venice, and still more at Florence, for they thought that, with the aid of the Malatesti, they might resist Niccolo, but finding them gone over to the enemy, they were in fear lest their captain, Piero Giampagolo Orsini, 
who was in the territories of the Malatesti, should be disarmed and rendered powerless. The Count also felt alarmed, for through Niccolo's presence in Tuscany, he was afraid of losing La Marca, and, urged by a desire to look after his own affairs, he hastened to Venice, and being introduced to the Doge, informed him that the interests of the League required his presence in Tuscany, for the war ought to be carried on where the leader and forces of the enemy were, and not where his garrisons and towns were situated. For when the enemy is vanquished, the war is finished. But to take towns and leave the armament entire usually allowed the war to break out again with greater virulence. That Tuscany and the Marca would be lost if Niccolo were not vigorously resisted, and that, if lost, there would be no possibility of the preservation of Lombardy. But supposing the danger to Lombardy not so imminent, he did not intend to abandon his own subjects and friends, and that having come into Lombardy as a prince, he did not intend to return a mere condottiere. To this, the doge replied, it was quite manifest that, if he left Lombardy, or even recrossed the Po, all their island territories would be lost. In that case they were unwilling to spend any more money in their defence, for it would be folly to attempt defending a place which must, after all, inevitably be lost, and that it is less disgraceful and less injurious to lose dominions only than to lose both territory and money. That if the loss of their inland possessions should actually result, it would then be seen how highly important to the preservation of Romagna and Tuscany the reputation of the Venetians had been. On these accounts they were of quite a different opinion from the Count, for they saw that whoever was victor in Lombardy would be so everywhere else, that conquest would be easily attainable now, when the territories of the Duke were left almost defenceless by the departure of Niccolo, and that he would be ruined before he could order Niccolo's recall, or provide himself with any other remedy, that whoever attentively considered these things would see that the Duke had sent Niccolo into Tuscany for no other reason than to withdraw the Count from his enterprise, and cause the war, which was now at his own door, to be removed to a greater distance. That if the Count were to follow Niccolo, unless at the instigation of some very pressing necessity, he would find his plan successful, and rejoice in the adoption of it. But if he were to remain in Lombardy, and allow Tuscany to shift for herself, the Duke would, when too late, see the imprudence of his conduct and find that he had lost his territories in Lombardy and gained nothing in Tuscany. Each party having spoken, it was determined to wait a few days to see what would result from the agreement of the Malatesti with Niccolo, whether the Florentines could avail themselves of Piero Giampagolo, and whether the Pope intended to join the League with all the earnestness he had promised. Not many days after these resolutions were adopted, it was ascertained that the Malatesti had made the agreement more from fear than any ill-will toward the League, that Piero Giampagolo had proceeded with his force toward Tuscany, and that the Pope was more disposed than ever to assist them. This favourable intelligence dissipated the Count's fears, and he consented to remain in Lombardy, and that Neri Caponi should return to Florence with a thousand of his own horse, and five hundred from the other parties. It was further agreed that if the affairs of Tuscany should require the Count's presence, Neri should write to him, and he would proceed thither to the exclusion of every other consideration. Neri arrived at Florence with his forces in April, and Giampagolo joined them the same day. In the meantime, Niccolo Piccinino, the affairs of Romagna being settled, purposed making a descent into Tuscany, and designing to go by the mountain passes of San Benedetto and the valley of Montone, found them so well guarded by the contrivance of Niccolo da Pisa, that his utmost exertions would be useless in that direction. As the Florentines, upon this sudden attack, were unprovided with troops and officers, they had sent into the defiles of these hills many of their citizens, with infantry raised upon the emergency to guard them, among whom was Bartolomeo Orlandini, a cavalieri, to whom was entrusted the defence of the castle of Maradi and the adjacent passes. Niccolo Piccinino, finding the route by San Benedetto impracticable, on account of the bravery of its commander, thought the cowardice of the officer who defended that of the Maradi would render the passage easy. Maradi is a castle situated at the foot of the mountains which separate Tuscany from Romagna, and, though destitute of walls, the river, the mountains, and the inhabitants make it a place of great strength, for the peasantry are warlike and faithful, and the rapid current undermining the banks has left them of such tremendous height that it is impossible to approach it from the valley if a small bridge over the stream be defended. 
while on the mountain side the precipices are so steep and perpendicular as to render it almost impregnable. In spite of these advantages, the pusillanimity of Bartolomeo Orlandini rendered the men cowardly and the fortress untenable, for as soon as he heard of the enemy's approach he abandoned the place, fled with all his forces, and did not stop till he reached the town of San Lorenzo. Niccolo, entering the deserted fortress, wondered it had not been defended, and rejoicing over his acquisition, descended into the valley of the Mugello, where he took some castles, and halted with his army at Policiano. Thence he overran the country as far as the mountains of Fiesole, and his audacity so increased that he crossed the Arno, plundering and destroying everything to within three miles of Florence. The Florentines, however, were not dismayed. Their first concern was to give security to the government, for which they had no cause for apprehension, so universal was the good will of the people toward Cosmo. And besides this, they had restricted the principal offices to a few citizens of the highest class, who with their vigilance would have kept the populace in order, even if they had been discontented or desirous of change. They also knew by the compact made in Lombardy what forces Neri would bring with him, and expected the troops of the Pope. These prospects sustained their courage till the arrival of Neri to Gino, who, on account of the disorders and fears of the city, determined to set out immediately and check Niccolo. With the cavalry he possessed, and a body of infantry raised entirely from the people, he recovered Lemoli from the hands of the enemy, where, having encamped, he put a stop to all further depredations, and gave the inhabitants hopes of repelling the enemy from the neighbourhood. Niccolo, finding that, although the Florentines were without troops, no disturbance had arisen, and learning what entire composure prevailed in the city, thought he was wasting time, and resolved to undertake some enterprise to induce them to send forces after him, and give him a chance of coming to an engagement, by means of which, if victorious, he trusted everything would succeed to his wishes. Francesco, Count de Poppi, was in the army of Niccolo, having deserted the Florentines with whom he was in league, when the enemy entered the Mugello, and though with the intention of securing him as soon as they had any idea of his design, they increased his appointments, and made him commissary over all the places in his vicinity. Still, so powerful is the attachment to party, that no benefit or fear could eradicate the affection he bore towards Vinaldo and the late government, so that as soon as he knew Niccolo was at hand he joined him, and with the utmost solicitude entreated him to leave the city and pass into the Casentino, pointing out to him the strength of the country, and how easily he might thence harass his enemies. Niccolo followed his advice, and arriving at the Casentino, took Romena and Bibiena, and then pitched his camp before Castel San Niccolo. This fortress is situated at the foot of the mountains which divide the Casentino from the Val d'Arno, and being in an elevated situation and well garrisoned, it was difficult to take, though Niccolo, with catapults and other engines, assailed it without intermission. The siege had continued more than twenty days, during which the Florentines had collected all their forces, having assembled under several leaders three thousand horse at Fegini, commanded by Piero Giampagolo Orsini, their captain, and Neri Caponi and Bernardo de' Medici, commissaries. Four messengers from Castel San Nicola were sent to them to entreat succour. The commissaries, having examined the site, found it could not be relieved, except from the Alpine regions, in the direction of the Val d'Arno, the summit of which was more easily attainable by the enemy than by themselves, on account of their greater proximity, and because the Florentines could not approach without observation, so that it would be making a desperate attempt and might occasion the destruction of the forces. The commissaries, therefore, commended their fidelity, and ordered that when they could hold out no longer, they should surrender. Niccolo took the fortress after a siege of thirty-two days, and the loss of so much time for the attainment of so small an advantage was the principal cause of the failure of his expedition. For had he remained with his forces near Florence, he would have almost deprived the government of all power to compel the citizens to furnish more money, nor would they so easily have assembled forces and taken other precautions, if the enemy had been close upon them, as they did while he was at a distance. Besides this, many would have been disposed to quiet their apprehensions of Niccolo by concluding a peace, particularly as the contest was likely to be of some duration. The desire of the Count de Poppi to avenge himself on the inhabitants of San Niccolo, long his enemies, occasioned his advice to Piccinino, who adopted it for the purpose of pleasing him, and this caused the ruin of both. 
it seldom happens that the gratification of private feelings fails to be injurious to the general convenience. Niccolo, pursuing his good fortune, took Racina and Ciusi. The Count de Poppi advised him to halt in these parts, arguing that he might divide his people between Ciusi, Caprese, and the Pieve, render himself master of this branch of the Apennines, and descend at pleasure into the Casentino, the Val d'Arno, the Val de Ciani, and the Val di Taveri as well as be prepared for every movement of the enemy. But Niccolo, considering the sterility of these places, told him his horses could not eat stones, and went to the Borgo San Sepolcro, where he was amicably received, but found that the people of Citta di Castello, who were friendly to the Florentines, could not be induced to yield to his overtures. Wishing to have Perugia at his disposal, he proceeded thither with forty horse, and being one of her citizens, met with a kind reception but in a few days he became suspected, and having attempted unsuccessfully to tamper with the legate and the people of Perugia, he took eight thousand ducats from them, and returned to his army. He then set on foot secret measures, to seduce Cortona from the Florentines, but, the affair being discovered, his attempts were fruitless. Among the principal citizens was Bartolomeo di Senso, who, being appointed to the evening watch of one of the gates, a countryman, his friend, told him, that if he went he would be slain. Bartolomeo, requesting to know what was meant, he became acquainted with the whole affair, and revealed it to the governor of the place, who, having secured the leaders of the conspiracy, and doubled the guards at the gates, waited till the time appointed for the coming of Niccolo, who, finding his purpose discovered, returned to his encampment. Book 5, Chapter 7 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2. Translated by an unknown translator. Book 5, Chapter 7. Vesca relieved by Sforza. His other victories. Piccinino is recalled into Lombardy he endeavours to bring the Florentines to an engagement. He is routed before Anghiari. Serious disorders in the camp of the Florentines after the victory. Death of Rinaldo degli Albizzi. His character. Neri Caponi goes to recover the Casentino. The Count di Poppi surrenders. His discourse upon quitting his possessions. While these events were taking place in Tuscany, so little to the advantage of the Duke, his affairs in Lombardy were in a still worse condition. The Count Francesco, as soon as the season would permit, took the field with his army, and the Venetians, having again covered the lake with their galleys, he determined first of all to drive the Duke from the water, judging that this once effected, his remaining task would be easy. He therefore, with the Venetian fleet, attacked that of the Duke and destroyed it. His land forces took the castles held for Filippo, and the ducal troops who were besieging Brescia, being informed of these transactions, withdrew, and thus the city, after standing a three-year siege, was at length relieved. The count then went in quest of the enemy, whose forces were encamped before Sonsino, a fortress situated upon the river Olio. These he dislodged and compelled to retreat to Cremona, where the duke again collected his forces, and prepared for his defence. But the count constantly pressing him more closely, he became apprehensive of losing either the whole or the greater part of his territories, and perceiving the unfortunate step he had taken in sending Niccolo into Tuscany in order to correct his error, he wrote to acquaint him with what had happened, desiring him with all possible dispatch to leave Tuscany and return to Lombardy. In the meantime, the Florentines, under their commissaries, had drawn together their forces, and being joined by those of the Pope, halted at Anghiari, a castle placed at the foot of the mountains that divide the Val di Taveri from the Val di Gianni, distant four miles from the Borgo San Sepolcro, on a level road, and in a country suitable for the evolutions of cavalry or a battlefield. As the Signori had heard of the Count's victory and the recall of Niccolo, they imagined that without again drawing a sword, or disturbing the dust under their horses' feet, the victory was their own, and the war at an end. They wrote to the commissaries, desiring them to avoid an engagement, as Niccolo could not remain much longer in Tuscany. These instructions, 
coming to the knowledge of Piccinino, and perceiving the necessity of his speedy return, to leave nothing unattempted, he determined to engage the enemy, expecting to find them unprepared and not disposed for battle. In this determination he was confirmed by Rinaldo, the Count de Poppi, and other Florentine exiles, who saw their inevitable ruin in the departure of Niccolo, and hoped that if he engaged the enemy, they would either be victorious or vanquished without dishonour. This resolution being adopted, Niccolo led his army, unperceived by the enemy, from the Citta di Castello to the Borgo, where he enlisted two thousand men, who, trusting the general's talents and promises, followed him in hope of plunder. Niccolo then led his forces in battle array towards Anghiari, and had arrived within two miles of the place, when Michelotto Attendulo observed great clouds of dust, and conjecturing at once that it must be occasioned by the enemy's approach, immediately called the troops to arms. Great confusion prevailed in the Florentine camp, for the ordinary negligence and want of discipline were now increased by their presuming the enemy to be at a distance, and they were more disposed to fight than to battle, so that every one was unarmed, and some, wandering from the camp, either led by their desire to avoid the excessive heat, or in pursuit of amusement. So great was the diligence of the commissaries and of the captain, that before the enemy's arrival the men were mounted and prepared to resist their attack, and as Michelotto was the first to observe their approach, he was also first armed and ready to meet them, and with his troops hastened to the bridge which crosses the river at a short distance from Anghiari. Pietro Giampagolo, having previous to the surprise filled up the ditches on either side of the road and levelled the ground between the bridge and Anghiari, and Michelotto having taken his position in front of the former, the legate and Simoncino, who led the troops of the church, took post on the right, and the commissaries of the Florentines, with Pietro Giampagolo, their captain, on the left, the infantry being drawn up along the banks of the river. Thus, the only course the enemy could take was the direct one over the bridge. Nor had the Florentines any other field for their exertions, excepting that their infantry were ordered, in case their cavalry were attacked in flank by the hostile infantry, to assail them with their crossbows, and prevent them from wounding the flanks of the horses crossing the bridge. Michelotto bravely withstood the enemy's charge upon the bridge, but Astore and Francesco Piccinino coming up, with a picked body of men, attacked him so vigorously that he was compelled to give way, and was pushed as far as the foot of the hill which rises towards the Borgo d'Anghiari. But they were in turn repulsed and driven over the bridge by the troops that took them in flank. The battle continued two hours, during which each side had frequent possession of the bridge, and their attempts upon it were attended with equal success, but on both sides of the river the disadvantage of Niccolo was manifest, for when his people crossed the bridge they found the enemy unbroken and the ground being levelled. They could manoeuvre without difficulty, and the weary be relieved by such as were fresh. But when the Florentines crossed, Niccolo could not relieve those that were harassed on account of the hindrance interposed by the ditches and embankments on each side of the road. Thus, whenever his troops got possession of the bridge, they were soon repulsed by the fresh forces of the Florentines. But when the bridge was taken by the Florentines, and they passed over and proceeded up upon the road, Niccolo, having no opportunity to reinforce his troops, being prevented by the impetuosity of the enemy and the inconvenience of the ground, the rear-guard became mingled with the van, and occasioned the utmost confusion and disorder. They were forced to flee, and hastened at full speed toward the Borgo. The Florentine troops fell upon the plunder, which was very valuable in horses, prisoners, and military stores, for not more than a thousand of the enemy's cavalry reached the town. The people of the Borgo, who had followed Niccolo in the hope of plunder, became booty themselves, all of them being taken and obliged to pay a ransom. The colours and carriages were also captured. This victory was much more advantageous to the Florentines than injurious to the Duke. For, had they been conquered, Tuscany would have been his own, but he, by his defeat, only lost the horses and accoutrements of his army, which could be replaced without any very serious expense. Nor was there ever an instance of wars being carried on in an enemy's country with less injury to the assailants than this, for in so great a defeat, and in a battle which continued for hours, only one man died, and he, not from wounds inflicted by hostile weapons or any honourable means, but, having fallen from his horse, was trampled to death. Combatants then engaged with little danger, being nearly all mounted, covered with armour, and preserved from death whenever they chose to surrender, 
there was no necessity for risking their lives. While fighting, their armor defended them, and when they could resist no longer, they yielded and were safe. This battle, from the circumstances which attended and followed it, presents a striking example of the wretched state of military discipline in those times. The enemy's forces being defeated and driven into the Borgo, the commissaries desired to pursue them in order to make the victory complete, but not a single condottieri or soldier would obey, alleging, as a sufficient reason for their refusal, that they must take care of the booty and attend to their wounded. And what is still more surprising, the next day, without permission from the commissaries, or the least regard for their commanders, they went to Arezzo, and having secured their plunder, returned to Angari, a thing so contrary to military order and all subordination, that the merest shadow of a regular army would easily and most justly have wrested from them the victory they had so undeservedly obtained. Added to this, the men-at-arms or heavy-armed horse, who had been taken prisoners, whom the commissaries wished to be detained that they might not rejoin the enemy, were set at liberty contrary to their orders. It is astonishing that an army so constructed should have sufficient energy to obtain the victory, or that any should be found so imbecile as to allow such a disorderly rabble to vanquish them. The time occupied by the Florentine forces in going and returning from Arezzo gave Niccolo opportunity of escaping from the Borgo and proceeding toward Romagna. Along with him also fled the Florentine exiles, who, finding no hope of their return home, took up their abodes in various parts of Italy, each according to his own convenience. Rinaldo made choice of Ancona, and, to gain admission to the celestial country, having lost the terrestrial, he performed a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, whence, having returned, he died suddenly while at the table at the celebration of the marriage of one of his daughters, an instance of fortune's favour in removing him from the troubles of this world upon the least sorrowful day of his exile. Rinaldo d'Albizzi appeared respectable under every change of condition, and would have been more so had he lived in a united city, for many qualities were injurious to him in a factious community, which in an harmonious one would have done him honour. When the forces returned from Arezzo, Niccolo being then gone, the commissaries presented themselves at the Borgo, the people of which were willing to submit to the Florentines, but their offer was declined, and while negotiations were pending, the Pope's legate imagined the commissaries designed to take it from the church. Hard words were exchanged, and hostilities might have ensued between the Florentine and ecclesiastical forces if the misunderstanding had continued much longer. But as it was brought to the conclusion desired by the legate, peace was restored. While the affair of the Borgo San Sepolcro was in progress, Niccolo Piccinino was supposed to have marched toward Rome, other accounts said La Marca, and hence the legate and the count's forces moved towards Perugia to relieve La Marca or Rome, as the case might be and Bernardo de' Medici accompanied them. Neri led the Florentine forces to recover the Casentino, and pitched his camp before Racina, which he took, together with Bibiena, Pratovecchio, and Romena. From thence he proceeded to Poppi, and invested it on two sides with his forces, in one direction toward the plain of Certomondo, in the other upon the hill extending to Fonzole. The count, finding himself abandoned to his fate, had shut himself up in Poppi, not with any hope of assistance, but with a view to make the best terms he could. Neri, pressing him, he offered to capitulate, and obtained reasonable conditions, namely, security for himself and family, with leave to take whatever he could carry away, on condition of ceding his territories and government to the Florentines. When he perceived the full extent of his misfortune, standing upon the bridge which crosses the Arno close to Poppi, he turned to Neri in great distress and said, had I well considered my own opinion and the power of the Florentines, I should now have been a friend of the Republic and congratulating you on your victory, not an enemy compelled to supplicate some alleviation of my woe. The recent events which to you bring glory and joy, to me are full of wretchedness and sorrow. Once I possessed horses, arms, subjects, grandeur, and wealth. Can it be surprising that I part with them reluctantly? But as you possess both the power and the inclination to command the whole of Tuscany, we must of necessity obey you, and had I not committed this error my misfortune would not have occurred, and your liberality could not have been exercised. So, 
that if you were to rescue me from entire ruin you would give the world a lasting proof of your clemency. Therefore, let your pity pass by my fault, and allow me to retain this single house to leave to the descendants of those from whom your fathers have received innumerable benefits. To this Neri replied, that his having expected great results from men who were capable of doing only very little, had led him to commit so great a fault against the Republic of Florence, that, every circumstance considered, he must surrender all those places to the Florentines as an enemy, which he was unwilling to hold as a friend, that he had set such an example as it would be most highly impolitic to encourage, for, upon a change of fortune, it might injure the Republic, and it was not himself they feared, but his power while lord of the Casentino. If, however, he could live as a prince in Germany, the citizens would be very much gratified, and out of love to those ancestors of whom he had spoken, they would be glad to assist him. To this the Count in greater anger replied, he wished the Florentines at a much greater distance. Attempting no longer to preserve the least urbanity of demeanour, he ceded the place and all its dependencies to the Florentines, and with his treasure, wife and children, took his departure, mourning the loss of a territory which his forefathers had held during four hundred years. When all these victories were known at Florence, the government and people were transported with joy. Benedetto de' Medici, finding the report of Niccolo having proceeded either to Rome or to La Marca, incorrect, returned with his forces to Neri, and they proceeded together to Florence, where the highest honours were decreed to them which it was customary with the city to bestow upon her victorious citizens, and they were received by the signory, the Capitani di Parti, and the whole city in triumphal pomp. End of Book 5《Book Six, Chapter One of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two. Translated by an unknown translator. Book Six, Chapter One Reflections on the Object of War and the Use of Victory. Niccolo reinforces his army. The Duke of Milan endeavors to recover the services of Count Francesco Sforza. Suspicions of the Venetians. They acquire Ravenna. The Florentines purchase the Borgo San Sepolcro of the Pope. Piccinino makes an excursion during the winter, the Count besieged in his camp before Martinengo, the insolence of Niccolò Piccinino, the Duke in revenge makes peace with the League, Sforza assisted by the Florentines. Those who make war have always and very naturally designed to enrich themselves and impoverish the enemy. Neither is victory sought or conquest desirable, except to strengthen themselves and weaken the enemy. Hence it follows that those who are impoverished by victory or debilitated by conquest must either have gone beyond or fallen short of the end for which wars are made. A republic or a prince is enriched by the victories he obtains, when the enemy is crushed and possession is retained of the plunder and ransom. Victory is injurious when the foe escapes or when the soldiers appropriate the booty and ransom. In such a case, losses are unfortunate, and conquests still more so, for the vanquished suffers the injuries inflicted by the enemy, and the victor those occasioned by his friends, which being less justifiable, must cause the greater pain, particularly from a consideration of his being thus compelled to oppress his people by an increased burden of taxation. A ruler possessing any degree of humanity cannot rejoice in a victory that afflicts his subjects. The victories of the ancient and well-organized republics enable them to fill their treasuries with gold and silver won from their enemies, to distribute gratuities to the people, reduce taxation, and by games and solemn festivals disseminate universal joy. But the victories obtained at the times of which we speak 
first emptied the treasury, and then impoverished the people, without giving the victorious party security from the enemy. This arose entirely from the disorders inherent in their mode of warfare. For the vanquished soldiery, divesting themselves of their accoutrements, and being neither slain nor detained prisoners, only deferred a renewed attack on the conqueror, till their leader had furnished them with arms and horses. Besides this, both ransom and booty being appropriated by the troops, the victorious princes could not make use of them for raising fresh forces, but were compelled to draw the necessary means from their subjects' purses, and this was the only result of victory experienced by the people, except that it diminished the ruler's reluctance to such a course, and made him less particular about his mode of oppressing them. To such a state had the practice of war been brought by the sort of soldiery then on foot, that the victor and the vanquished, when desirous of their services, alike needed fresh supplies of money, for the one had to re-equip them, and the other to bribe them. The vanquished could not fight without being remounted, and the conquerors would not take the field without a new gratuity. Hence it followed that the one derived little advantage from the victory, and the other was the less injured by defeat, for the routed party had to be re-equipped, and the victorious could not pursue his advantage. From this disorderly and perverse method of procedure, it arose that before Niccolò's defeat became known throughout Italy, he had again reorganized his forces, and harassed the enemy with greater vigor than before. Hence also it happened that after his disaster at Tenna, he so soon occupied Verona, that being deprived of his army at Verona, he was shortly able to appear with a large force in Tuscany, that being completely defeated at Anghiari before he reached Tuscany, he was more powerful in the field than ever. He was thus enabled to give the Duke of Milan hopes of defending Lombardy, which by his absence appeared to be lost. For while Niccolò spread consternation throughout Tuscany, disasters in the former province so alarmed the Duke that he was afraid his utter ruin would ensue before Niccolò, whom he had recalled, could come to his relief and check the impetuous progress of the Count. Under these impressions the Duke, to ensure by policy that success which he could not command by arms, had recourse to remedies, which on similar occasions had frequently served his turn. He sent Niccolò da Esti, Prince of Ferrara, to the Count, who was then at Peschiera, to persuade him that this war was not to his advantage, for if the duke became so ruined as to be unable to maintain his position among the states of Italy, the count would be the first to suffer, for he would cease to be of importance either with the Venetians or the Florentines, and to prove the sincerity of his wish for peace, he offered to fulfil the engagement he had entered into with regard to his daughter, and send her to Ferrara, so that as soon as peace was established, the union might take place. The Count replied, that if the Duke really wished for peace, he might easily be gratified, as the Florentines and the Venetians were equally anxious for it. True, it was, he could with difficulty credit him, knowing that he had never made peace but from necessity, and when this no longer pressed him, again desired war. Neither could he give credence to what he had said concerning the marriage, having been so repeatedly deceived, yet when peace was concluded, he would take the advice of his friends on that subject. The Venetians, who were sometimes needlessly jealous of their soldiery, became greatly alarmed at these proceedings, and not without reason. The Count was aware of this, and wishing to remove their apprehensions, pursued the war with unusual vigour, but his mind had become so unsettled by ambition, and the Venetians by jealousy, that little further progress was made during the remainder of the summer, and upon the return of Niccolò into Lombardy, winter having already commenced, the armies withdrew into quarters, the Count to Verona, the Florentine forces to Tuscany, the Dukes to Cremona, and those of the Pope to Romagna. The latter, after having been victorious at Anghiari, made an unsuccessful attack upon Furli and Bologna, with a view to wrest them from Niccolò Piccinino, but they were gallantly defended by his son Francesco. However, the arrival of the papal forces so alarmed the people of Ravenna with the fear of becoming subject to the Church, 
that by consent of Ostasio di Polenta, their lord, they placed themselves under the power of the Venetians, who, in return for the territory, and that Ostasio might never retake by force what he had imprudently given them, sent him and his son to Candia, where they died. In the course of these affairs, the Pope, notwithstanding the victory at Anghiari, became so in want of money that he sold the fortress of Borgo San Sepolcro to the Florentines for twenty-five thousand ducats. Affairs being thus situated, each party supposed winter would protect them from the evils of war, and thought no more of peace. This was particularly the case with the Duke, who, being rendered doubly secure by the season and by the presence of Niccolò, broke off all attempts to effect reconciliation with the Count, reorganized Niccolò's forces, and made every requisite preparation for the future struggle. The Count, being informed of this, went to Venice to consult with the Senate on the course to be pursued during the next year. Niccolò, on the other hand, being quite prepared, and seeing the enemy unprovided, did not await the return of spring, but crossed the Adda during severe weather, occupied the whole Brescian territory, except Odula and Acri, and made prisoners two thousand horse belonging to Francesco's forces, who had no apprehension of an attack. But the greatest source of anxiety to the Count, and alarm to the Venetians, was the desertion of his service by Ciarpellone, one of his principal officers. Francesco, on learning these matters, immediately left Venice, and, arriving at Brescia, found that Niccolò, after doing all the mischief he could, had retired to his quarters, and therefore, finding the war concluded for the present, was not disposed to rekindle it, but rather to use the opportunity afforded by the season and his enemies of reorganizing his forces, so as to be able, when spring arrived, to avenge himself for his former injuries. To this end he induced the Venetians to recall the forces they had in Tuscany, in the Florentine service, and to order that to succeed Gatemelata, who was dead, Michelotto Attendulo should take command. On the approach of spring, Niccolò Piccinino was the first to take the field, and, encamped before Cignano, a fortress twelve miles from Brescia, the Count marched to its relief, and the war between them was conducted in the usual manner. The Count, apprehensive for the city of Bergamo, besieged Martinengo, a castle so situated that the possession of it would enable him to relieve the former, which was closely pressed by Niccolò, who, having foreseen that the enemy could impede him only from the direction of Martinengo, had put the castle into a complete state of defence, so that the Count was obliged to lend his whole force to the siege. Upon this, Niccolò placed his troops in a situation calculated to intercept the Count's provisions, and fortified himself with trenches and bastions, in such a manner that he could not be attacked without the most manifest hazard to his assailant. Hence the besiegers were more distressed than the people of Martinengo whom they besieged. The Count could not hold his position for want of food, nor quit it without imminent danger, so that the Duke's victory appeared certain, and defeat equally inevitable to the Count and the Venetians. But fortune, never destitute of means to assist her favourites, or to injure others, caused the hope of victory to operate so powerfully upon Niccolò Piccinino, and made him assume such a tone of unbounded insolence, that, losing all respect for himself and the Duke, he sent him word that, having served under his ensign for so long, without obtaining sufficient land to serve him for a grave, he wished to know from himself what was to be the reward of his labours, for it was in his power to make him master of Lombardy, and place all his enemies in his power, and, as a certain victory ought to be attended by a sure remuneration, he desired the Duke to concede to him the city of Piacenza, that when weary with his lengthened services he might at last betake himself to repose. Nor did he hesitate, in conclusion, to threaten, if his request were not granted, to abandon the enterprise. This injurious and most insolent mode of proceeding highly offended the Duke, and on further consideration he determined rather to let the expedition altogether fail than consent to his general's demand. Thus, 
What all the dangers he had incurred and the threats of his enemies could not draw from him, the insolent behavior of his friends made him willing to propose. He resolved to come to terms with the Count, and sent Antonio Guido Buono of Tortona to offer his daughter and conditions of peace, which were accepted with great pleasure by the Count, and also by the colleagues as far as themselves were concerned. The terms being secretly arranged, the Duke sent to command Niccolò to make a truce with the Count for one year, intimating that being exhausted with the expense, he could not forego a certain peace for a doubtful victory. Niccolò was utterly astonished at this resolution, and could not imagine what had induced the Duke to lose such a glorious opportunity, nor could he surmise that, to avoid rewarding his friends, he would save his enemies, and therefore to the utmost of his power he opposed this resolution, and the Duke was obliged, in order to induce his compliance, to threaten that if he did not obey he would give him up to his soldiers and his enemies. Niccolò submitted, and with the feelings of one compelled to leave the country and friends, complaining of his hard fate, that fortune and the duke were robbing him of the victory over his enemies. The truce being arranged, the marriage of the duke's daughter, Bianca, to the count was solemnized, the duke giving Cremona for her portion. This being over, peace was concluded in November 1441, at which Francesco Barbadico and Pagolo Trono were present for the Venetians, and for the Florentines Agnolo Acciaioli. Peschiera, Asola, and Lonato, castles in the Mantuan territory, were assigned to the Venetians. The war in Lombardy was concluded, but the dissensions in the kingdom of Naples continued, and the inability to compose them occasioned the resumptions of those arms which had been so recently laid aside. Alfonso of Aragon had, during these wars, taken from René the whole kingdom except Naples so that, thinking he had victory in his power, he resolved during the siege of Naples to take Benevento, and his other possessions in that neighborhood, from the Count, and thought he might easily accomplish this while the latter was engaged in the wars of Lombardy. Having heard of the conclusion of peace, Alfonso feared the Count would not only come for the purpose of recovering his territories, but also to favor René, and René himself had hope of his assistance for the same reason. The latter, therefore, sent to the Count, begging he would come to the relief of a friend and avenge himself of an enemy. On the other hand, Alfonso entreated Filippo, for the sake of the friendship which subsisted between them, to find the Count some other occupation, that, being engaged in greater affairs, he might not have an opportunity of interfering between them. Filippo complied with this request without seeming to be aware that he violated the peace recently made so greatly to his disadvantage. He therefore signified to Pope Eugenius that the present was a favorable opportunity for recovering the territories which the Count had taken from the Church, and, that he might be in a condition to use it, offered him the services of Niccolò Piccinino, and engaged to pay him during the war, who, since the peace of Lombardy, had remained with his forces in Romagna. Eugenius eagerly took the advice, induced by his hatred of the Count, and his desire to recover his lost possessions, feeling assured that although on a former occasion he had been duped by Niccolò, it would be improper, now that the Duke interfered, to suspect any deceit, and joining his forces to those of Niccolò, he assailed La Marca. The Count, astonished at such an unexpected attack, assembled his troops and went to meet the enemy. In the meantime King Alfonso took possession of Naples, so that the whole kingdom, except Castelnuova, was in his power. Leaving a strong guard at Castelnuova, René set out and came to Florence, where he was most honorably received, and having remained a few days, finding he could not continue the war, he withdrew to Marseilles. In the meantime, Alfonso took Castelnuova, and the Count found himself assailed in the Marca Inferiore, both by the Pope and Niccolò. He applied to the Venetians and the Florentines for assistance in men and money, assuring them that if they did not determine to restrain the Pope and King during his life, 
they would soon afterward find their very existence endangered, for both would join Filippo and divide Italy among them. The Florentines and Venetians hesitated for a time, both to consider the propriety of drawing upon themselves the enmity of the Pope and the King, and because they were then engaged in the affairs of the Bolognese. Annibale Bentivoglio had driven Francesco Piccinino from Bologna, and for defence against the Duke, who favoured Francesco, he demanded and received assistance of the Venetians and Florentines, so that being occupied with these matters, they could not resolve to assist the Count. But Annibale, having routed Francesco Piccinino, and those affairs seeming to be settled, they resolved to support him. Designing, however, to make sure of the Duke, they offered to renew the league with him, to which he was not averse. For although he consented that war should be made against the Count, while King René was in arms, yet finding him now conquered and deprived of the whole kingdom, he was not willing that the Count should be despoiled of his territories, and therefore not only consented that assistance should be given him, but wrote to Alfonso to be good enough to retire to his kingdom and discontinue hostilities against the Count and although reluctantly, yet in acknowledgment of his obligations to the duke, Alfonso determined to satisfy him, and withdrew his forces beyond the Tronto. End of Book Six, Book Six Chapter Two of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolò Machiavelli, Volume 2, translated by an unknown translator. Book Six, Chapter 2 Discords of Florence Jealousy Excited Against Neri di Gino Caponi Baldaccio d'Anghiari Murdered Reform of Government in Favour of the Medici, Enterprises of Sforza and Piccinino, Death of Niccolò Piccinino, End of the War, Disturbances in Bologna, Annibali Bentivoglio slain by Battista Caneschi, and the latter by the people. Santi, supposed to be the son of Ercole Bentivoglio, is called to govern the city of Bologna. Discourse of Cosimo de' Medici to him. Perfidious designs of the Duke of Milan against Sforza, general war in Italy, losses of the Duke of Milan, the Duke has recourse to the Count who makes peace with him, offers of the Duke and the Venetians to the Count, the Venetians furtively deprive the Count of Cremona. While the affairs of Romagna proceeded thus, the city of Florence was not tranquil. Among the citizens of highest reputation in the government was Neri di Gino Caponi, of whose influence Cosimo de' Medici had more apprehension than any other. For to the great authority which he possessed in the city was added his influence with the soldiery. Having been often leader of the Florentine forces, he had won their affection by his courage and talents, and the remembrance of his own and his father's victory the latter having taken Pisa, and he himself having overcome Niccolò Piccinino at Anghiari, caused him to be beloved by many, and feared by those who were averse to having associates in the government. Among the leaders of the Florentine army was Baldaccio d'Anghiari, an excellent soldier, for in those times there was not one in Italy who surpassed him in vigour either of body or mind and possessing so much influence with the infantry, whose leader he had always been, many thought they would follow him wherever he chose to lead them. Baldaccio was the intimate friend of Neri, who loved him for his talents, of which he had been a constant witness. This excited great suspicion in the other citizens, who, thinking it alike dangerous either to discharge or retain him in their service, determined to destroy him, and fortune seemed to favour their design. Bartolomeo Orlandini was gonfalonier of justice, the same person who was sent to the defence of Maradi when Niccolò Piccinino came into Tuscany, as we have related above, and so basely abandoned the pass, which by its nature was almost impregnable. 
So flagrant an instance of cowardice was very offensive to Baldaccio, who on all occasions, both by word and letters, had contributed to make the disgraceful fact known to all. The shame and vexation of Bartolomeo were extreme, so that of all things he wished to avenge himself, thinking, with the death of his accuser, to efface the stain upon his character. This feeling of Bartolomeo Orlandini was known to the other citizens, so that they easily persuaded him to put Baldaccio to death, and at one avenge himself, and deliver his country from a man whom they must either retain at great peril, or discharge to their greater confusion. Bartolomeo, having therefore resolved to murder him, concealed in his own apartment at the palace several young men, all armed, and Baldaccio, entering the piazza, whither it was his daily custom to come, to confer with the magistrates concerning his command, the gonfalonier sent for him, and he, without any suspicion, obeyed. Meeting him in the corridor, which leads to the chambers of the seigneury, they took a few turns together, discoursing of his office, when being close to the door of the apartments in which the assassins were concealed, Bartolomeo gave them the signal, upon which they rushed out, and finding Baldaccio alone and unarmed, they slew him and threw the body out of the window which looks from the palace towards the Dogano, or Custom House. It was thence carried into the piazza, where the head being severed, it remained the whole day exposed to the gaze of the people. Baldaccio was married, and had only one child, a boy, who survived him but a short time, and his wife, Annalena, thus deprived of both husband and offspring, rejected every proposal for a second union. She converted her house into a monastery, to which she withdrew, and being joined by many noble ladies, lived in holy seclusion to the end of her days. The convent she founded, and which is named from her, preserves her story in perpetual remembrance. This circumstance served to weaken Neri's power, and made him lose both influence and friends. Nor did this satisfy the citizens who held the reins of government, for it being ten years since their acquisition of power, and the authority of the Balia expired, many began to exhibit more boldness, both in words and deeds, than seemed consistent with their safety, and the leaders of the party judged that if they wished to preserve their influence, some means must be adopted to increase it. To this end, in 1444, the councils created a new balia, which reformed the government, gave authority to a limited number to create the seigneury, re-established the chancery of reformations, depriving Filippo Peruzzi of his office of president in it, and appointing another wholly under their influence. They prolonged the term of exile to those who were banished, put Giovanni di Simone Vespucci in prison, deprived the accoppiatori of their enemies of the honours of government, and with them the sons of Piero Baroncelli, the whole of the Seragli, Bartolomeo Fortini, Francesco Castellani, and many others. By these means they strengthened their authority and influence, and humbled their enemies, or those whom they suspected of being so. Having thus recovered and confirmed their government, they then turned their attention to external affairs. As observed above, Niccolò Piccinino was abandoned by King Alfonso, and the Count, having been aggrandized by the assistance of the Florentines, attacked and routed him near Fermo, where after losing nearly the whole of his troops, Niccolò fled to Montecchio, which he fortified in such a manner that in a short time he had again assembled so large an army as enabled him to make head against the Count particularly as the season was now come for them to withdraw into quarters. His principal endeavour during the winter was to collect troops, and in this he was assisted both by the Pope and Alfonso, so that upon the approach of spring both leaders took the field, and Niccolò, being the strongest, reduced the Count to extreme necessity, and would have conquered him if the Duke had not contrived to frustrate his designs. Filippo sent to beg he would come to him with all speed, for he wished to have a personal interview, that he might communicate matters of the highest importance. Niccolò, anxious to hear them, abandoned a certain victory for a very doubtful advantage, 
and leaving his son Francesco to command the army, hastened to Milan. The Count, being informed of the circumstance, would not let slip the opportunity of fighting in the absence of Niccolò, and coming to an engagement near the castle of Monte Loro, routed the father's forces and took his son prisoner. Niccolò, having arrived at Milan, saw that the Duke had duped him, and learning the defeat of his army and the capture of his son, he died of grief in 1445, at the age of sixty-four, having been a brave rather than a fortunate leader. He left two sons, Francesco and Jacopo, who, possessing less talent than their father, were still more unfortunate, so that the arms of the family became almost annihilated, while those of Sforza, being favoured by fortune, attained augmented glory. The Pope, seeing Niccolò's army defeated and himself dead, having little hope of assistance from Aragon, sought peace with the Count, and by the intervention of the Florentines, succeeded. Of La Marca, the Pope only retained Osimo, Fabriano, and Recanati. All the rest remained in the Count's possession. Peace being restored to La Marca, the whole of Italy would have obtained repose, had it not been disturbed by the Bolognese. There were in Bologna two very powerful families, the Caneschi and the Bentivogli. Of the latter, Annibale was the head, of the former, Battista, who, as a means of confirming their mutual confidence, had contracted family alliances. But among men who have the same objects of ambition in view, it is easy to form connections, but difficult to establish friendship. The Bolognese were in a league with the Venetians and Florentines, which had been affected by the influence of Annibale, after they had driven out Francesco Piccinino, and Battista, knowing how earnestly the Duke desired to have the city favourable to him, proposed to assassinate Annibale, and put Bologna into his power. This being agreed upon, on the 25th of June, 1445, he attacked Annibale with his men and slew him and then with shouts of, The Duke! The Duke! rode through the city. The Venetian and Florentine commissaries were in Bologna at the time, and at first kept themselves within doors, but finding that the people, instead of favouring the murderers, assembled in the piazza, armed in great numbers, mourning the death of Annibale, they joined them, and assembling what forces they could, attacked the Caneschi, soon overpowered them, slew part, and drove the remainder out of the city. Battista, unable to effect his escape, or his enemies his capture, took refuge in a vault of his house, used for storing grain. The friends of the Bentivogli, having sought him all day, and knowing he had not left the city, so terrified his servants that one of them, a groom, disclosed the place of his concealment, and being drawn forth in complete armour, he was slain, his body dragged about the streets, and afterward burned. Thus the Duke's authority was sufficient to prompt the enterprise, but his force was not at hand to support it. The tumults being settled by the death of Battista and the flight of the Caneschi, Bologna still remained in the greatest confusion. There not being one of the house of Bentivogli, of age to govern, Annibale having left but one son, whose name was Giovanni, only six years old, it was apprehended that this union would ensue among the Bentivogli, and cause the return of the Caneschi, and the ruin both of their own country and party. While in this state of apprehension, Francesco, sometime Count di Poppi, being at Bologna, informed the rulers of the city that if they wished to be governed by one of the blood of Annibale, he could tell them of one, and related that about twenty years ago Ercole, cousin of Annibale, being at Poppi, became acquainted with a girl of the castle, of whom was born a son named Santi, whom Ercole on many occasions acknowledged to be his own, nor could he deny it, for whoever knew him and saw the boy could not fail to observe the strongest resemblance. The citizens gave credit to the tale, and immediately sent to Florence to see the young man, and procure of Cosimo and Neri permission to return with him to Bologna. The reputed father of Santi was dead, and he lived under the protection of his uncle, whose name was Antonio da Cascese. Antonio was rich, 
childless, and a friend of Neri, to whom the matter, becoming known, he thought it ought neither to be despised nor too hastily accepted, and that it would be best for Santi and those who had been sent from Bologna to confer in the presence of Cosimo. They were accordingly introduced, and Santi was not merely honoured but adored by them, so greatly were they influenced by the spirit of party. However, nothing was done at the time, except that Cosimo, taking Santi apart, spoke to him thus. No one can better advise you in this matter than yourself, for you have to take that course to which your own mind prompts you. If you be the son of Ercole Bentivoglio, you will naturally aspire to those pursuits which are proper to your family and worthy of your father. But if you be the son of Agnolo da Cascese, you will remain in Florence and basely spend the remainder of your days in some branch of the woolen trade. These words greatly influenced the youth, who, though he had at first almost refused to adopt such a course, said he would submit himself wholly to what Cosimo and Neri should determine. They, assenting to the request of the Bolognese, provided suitable apparel, horses, and servants, and in a few days he was escorted by a numerous cavalcade to Bologna, where the guardianship of Annibale's son and of the city were placed in his hands. He conducted himself so prudently that although all his ancestors had been slain by their enemies, he lived in peace and died respected by every one. After the death of Niccolò Piccinino and the peace of La Marca, Filippo, wishing to procure a leader of his forces, secretly negotiated with Ciarpellone, one of the principal captains of Count Francesco, and arrangements having been made, Ciarpellone asked permission to go to Milan to take possession of certain castles, which had been given him by Filippo during the late wars. The Count, suspecting what was in progress, in order to prevent the duke from accommodating himself at his expense, caused Ciarpellone to be arrested, and soon afterward put to death, alleging that he had been detected plotting against him. Filippo was highly annoyed and indignant, which the Venetians and Florentines were glad to observe, for their greatest fear was that the duke and the count should become friends. The duke's anger caused the renewal of war in La Marca. Gismondo Malatesti, lord of Rimino, being son-in-law of the count, expected to obtain Pesaro, but the count, having obtained possession, gave it to his brother, Alessandro. Gismondo, offended at this, was still further exasperated at finding that Federigo di Montefeltro, his enemy, by the count's assistance, gained possession of Urbino. He therefore joined the duke and solicited the pope and the king to make war against the count, who, to give Gismondo a taste of the war he so much desired, resolved to take the initiative and attacked him immediately. Thus Romagna and La Marca were again in complete confusion, for Filippo, the king, and the pope sent powerful assistance to Gismondo, while the Florentines and Venetians supplied the count with money, though not with men. Nor was Filippo satisfied with the war in Romagna, but also desired to take Cremona and Pontremoli from the Count, but Pontremoli was defended by the Florentines and Cremona by the Venetians. Thus the war was renewed in Lombardy, and after several engagements in the Cremonese, Francesco Piccinino, the leader of the Duke's forces, was routed at Casale by Michelotto and the Venetian troops. This victory gave the Venetians hope of obtaining the Duke's dominions. They sent a commissary to Cremona, attacked the Ghiaradadda, and took the whole of it except Crema. Then crossing the Adda, they overran the country as far as Milan. Upon this the Duke had recourse to Alfonso, and entreated his assistance, pointing out the danger his kingdom would incur if Lombardy were to fall into the hands of the Venetians. Alfonso promised to send him troops, but apprised him of the difficulties which would attend their passage without the permission of the Count. Filippo, driven to extremity, then had recourse to Francesco, and begged he would not abandon his father-in-law, now that he had become old and blind. The Count was offended with the Duke for making war against him, but he was jealous of the increasing greatness of the Venetians, 
and he himself began to be in want of money, for the League supplied him sparingly. The Florentines, being no longer in fear of the Duke, ceased to stand in need of the Count, and the Venetians desired his ruin, for they thought Lombardy could not be taken from him except by this means. Yet while Filippo sought to gain him over, and offered him the entire command of his forces, on condition that he should restore La Marca to the Pope and quit the Venetian alliance, ambassadors were sent to him by that republic, promising Milan, if they took it, and the perpetual command of their forces, if he would push the war in La Marca and prevent Alfonso from sending troops into Lombardy. The offers of the Venetians were great, as also were their claims upon him, having begun the war in order to save him from losing Cremona, while the injuries received from the Duke were fresh in his memory, and his promises had lost all influence, still the Count hesitated, for on the one hand were to be considered his obligations to the League, his pledged faith, their recent services, and his hopes of the future, all which had their influence on him. On the other were the entreaties of his father-in-law, and above all the bane which he feared would be concealed under the specious offers of the Venetians, for he doubted not that both with regard to Milan and their other promises, if they were victorious, he would be at their mercy, to which no prudent men would ever submit if he could avoid it. These difficulties in the way of his forming a determination were obviated by the ambition of the Venetians, who, seeing a chance of occupying Cremona, from secret intelligence with that city, under a different pretext, sent troops into its neighbourhood. But the affair was discovered by those who commanded Cremona for the Count, and measures were adopted which prevented its success. Thus, without obtaining Cremona, they lost the Count's friendship, who, now being free from all other considerations, joined the Duke. Book Six, Chapter Three of the History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolò Machiavelli, Volume Two. Translated by an unknown translator. Book Six, Chapter Three. Death of Filippo Visconti, Duke of Milan. The Milanese appoint Sforza their captain. Milan becomes a republic. The Pope endeavors to restore peace to Italy. The Venetians oppose this design. Alfonso attacks the Florentines. The neighborhood of Piombino becomes the principal theater of war. Scarcity in the Florentine camp. Disorders occur in the Neapolitan and Florentine armies. Alfonso sues for peace and is compelled to retreat. Pavia surrenders to the Count. Displeasure of the Milanese. The Count besieges Caravaggio. The Venetians endeavor to relieve the place. They are routed by the Count before Caravaggio. Pope Eugenius being dead, was succeeded by Nicholas V. The Count had his whole army at Cotignola, ready to pass into Lombardy, when intelligence was brought him of the death of Filippo, which happened on the last day of August, 1447. This event greatly afflicted him, for he doubted whether his troops were in readiness, on account of their arrears of pay. He feared the Venetians, who were his armed enemies, he having recently forsaken them, and taken part with the Duke. He was in apprehension from Alfonso, his inveterate foe. He had no hope from the Pontiff or the Florentines, for the latter were allies of the Venetians, and he had seized the territories of the former. However, he resolved to face his fortune, and be guided by circumstances, for it often happens that when engaged in business valuable ideas are suggested which in a state of inaction would never have occurred. He had great hopes that if the Milanese were disposed to defend themselves against the ambition of the Venetians, they could make use of no other power but his. Therefore he proceeded confidently into the Bolognese territory, thence to Modena and Reggio, 
halted with his forces upon the Lenza, and sent to offer his services at Milan. On the death of the duke, part of the Milanese were inclined to establish a republic, others wished to choose a prince, and of these one part favoured the count, and another Alfonso. However, the majority being in favour of freedom, they prevailed over the rest, and organised a republic, to which many cities of the duchy refused obedience, for they too desired to live in the enjoyment of their liberty, and even those who did not embrace such views refused to submit to the sovereignty of the Milanese. Lodi and Piacenza surrendered themselves to the Venetians, Pavia and Parma became free. This confused state of things being known to the Count, he proceeded to Cremona, where his ambassadors and those of the Milanese arranged for him to command the forces of the new republic, with the same remuneration he had received from the Duke at the time of his decease. To this they added the possession of Brescia, until Verona was recovered when he should have that city and restore Brescia to the Milanese. Before the Duke's death, Pope Nicholas, after his assumption of the pontificate, sought to restore peace among the princes of Italy, and with this object endeavoured, in conjunction with the ambassadors sent by the Florentines to congratulate him on his accession, to appoint a diet at Ferrara to attempt either the arrangement of a long truce or the establishment of peace. A congress was accordingly held in that city, of the Pope's legate and the Venetian, Ducal, and Florentine representatives. King Alfonso had no envoy there. He was at Tivoli, with a great body of horse and foot, and favourable to the Duke, both having resolved that, having gained the Count over to their side, they would openly attack the Florentines and Venetians, until the arrival of the Count in Lombardy, take part in the treaty for peace at Ferrara, at which, though the King did not appear, he engaged to concur in whatever course the Duke should adopt. The conference lasted several days, and after many debates, resolved on either a truce for five years, or a permanent peace, which soever the Duke should approve, and the Ducal ambassadors, having returned to Milan to learn his decision, found him dead. Notwithstanding this, the Milanese were disposed to adopt the resolutions of the Assembly, but the Venetians refused, indulging great hopes of becoming masters of Lombardy, particularly as Lodi and Piacenza, immediately after the Duke's death, had submitted to them. They trusted that either by force or by treaty they could strip Milan of her power, and so press her, as to compel her also to surrender before any assistance could arrive, and they were the more confident of this from seeing the Florentines involved in war with King Alfonso. The king being at Tivoli, and designing to pursue his enterprise against Tuscany, as had been arranged between himself and Filippo, judging that the war now commenced in Lombardy would give him both time and opportunity, and wishing to have a footing in the Florentine state before he openly commenced hostilities, opened a secret understanding with the fortress of Cenina in the Val d'Arno Superiore, and took possession of it. The Florentines, surprised with this unexpected event, perceiving the king already in action, and resolved to do them all the injury in his power, hired forces, created a council of ten for management of the war, and prepared for the conflict in their usual manner. The king was already in the Sienese, and used his utmost endeavours to reduce the city, but the inhabitants of Siena were firm in their attachment to the Florentines, and refused to receive him within their walls or into any of their territories. They furnished him with provisions, alleging in excuse the enemy's power and their inability to resist. The king, finding he could not enter by the Val d'Arno as he had first intended, both because Cenina had been already retaken, and because the Florentines were now in some measure prepared for their defence, turned towards Volterra and occupied many fortresses in that territory. Thence he proceeded towards Pisa, and with the assistance of Fazio and Arrigo de Conti of the Gerardesca, took some castles, and issuing from them assailed Campiglia, but could not take it, the place being defended by the Florentines, and it being now in the depth of winter. Upon this the king, 
leaving garrisons in the places he had taken to harass the surrounding country, withdrew with the remainder of his army to quarters in the Sienese. The Florentines, aided by the season, used the most active exertions to provide themselves troops, whose captains were Federigo, lord of Urbino, and Gismondo Malatesti da Rimino, who, though mutual foes, were kept so united by the prudence of the commissaries Neri di Gino and Bernadetto de Medici, that they broke up their quarters while the weather was still very severe, and recovered not only the places that had been taken in the territory of Pisa, but also the Pomeranchie in the neighborhood of Volterra, and so checked the king's troops, which at first had overrun the Maremma, that they could scarcely retain the places they had been left to garrison. Upon the return of the spring the commissaries halted with their whole force, consisting of five thousand horse and two thousand foot, at the Spedaletto. The king approached with his army, amounting to fifteen thousand men, within three miles of Campiglia, but when it was expected he would attack the place, he fell upon Piombino, hoping, as it was insufficiently provided, to take it with very little trouble, and thus acquire a very important position, the loss of which would be severely felt by the Florentines, for from it he would be able to exhaust them with a long war, obtain his own provision by sea, and harass the whole territory of Pisa. They were greatly alarmed at this attack, and, considering that if they could remain with their army among the woods of Campiglia, the king would be compelled to retire either in defeat or disgrace. With this view they equipped four galleys at Livorno, and having succeeded in throwing three hundred infantry into Piombino, took up their own position at the Caldane, a place where it would be difficult to attack them, and they thought it would be dangerous to encamp among the thickets of the plain. The Florentine army depended for provisions on the surrounding places, which, being poor and thinly inhabited, had difficulty in supplying them. Consequently the troops suffered, particularly from want of wine, for, none being produced in that vicinity, and unable to procure it from more distant places, it was impossible to obtain a sufficient quantity. But the king, though closely pressed by the Florentines, was well provided except in forage, for he obtained everything else by sea. The Florentines, desirous to supply themselves in the same manner, loaded four vessels with provisions, but upon their approach they were attacked by seven of the king's galleys, which took two of them and put the rest to flight. This disaster made them despair of procuring provisions, so that two hundred men of a foraging party, principally for want of wine, deserted to the king, and the rest complained that they could not live without it, in a situation where the heat was so excessive and the water bad. The commissaries therefore determined to quit the place, and endeavour to recover those castles which still remained in the enemy's power, who, on his part, though not suffering from want of provisions, and greatly superior in numbers, found his enterprise a failure from the ravages made in his army by those diseases which the hot season produces in marshy localities, and which prevailed to such an extent that many died daily, and nearly all were affected. These circumstances occasioned overtures of peace. The king demanded fifty thousand florins and the possession of Piombino. When the terms were under consideration, many citizens desirous of peace would have accepted them, declaring there was no hope of bringing to a favorable conclusion a war which required so much money to carry it on. But Neri Caponi, going to Florence, placed the matter in a more correct light, and it was then unanimously determined to reject the proposal and take the lord of Piombino under their protection, with an alliance offensive and defensive, provided he did not abandon them, but assist in their defense as hitherto. The king, being informed of this resolution, saw that, with his reduced army, he could not gain the place, and withdrew in the same condition as if completely routed, leaving behind him two thousand dead. With the remainder of his sick troops he retired to the Sienese territory, and thence to his kingdom, incensed against the Florentines, and threatening them with new wars upon the return of spring. While these events were proceeding in Tuscany, 
the Count Sforza, having become leader of the Milanese forces, strenuously endeavoured to secure the friendship of Francesco Piccinino, who was also in their service, that he might support him in his enterprises, or be less disposed to do him injury. He then took the field with his army, upon which the people of Pavia, conscious of their inability to resist him, and unwilling to obey the Milanese, offered to submit themselves to his authority, on condition that he should not subject them to the power of Milan. The Count desired the possession of Pavia, and considered the circumstance a happy omen, as it would enable him to give a colour to his designs. He was not restrained from treachery, either by fear or shame, for great men consider failure disgraceful, a fraudulent success the contrary. But he was apprehensive that his possession of the city would excite the animosity of the Milanese, and perhaps induce them to throw themselves under the power of the Venetians. If he refused to accept the offer, he would have occasion to fear the Duke of Savoy, to whom many citizens were inclined to submit themselves, and either alternative would deprive him of the sovereignty of Lombardy. Concluding that there was less danger in taking possession of the city than in allowing another to have it, he determined to accept the proposal of the people of Pavia, trusting he would be able to satisfy the Milanese, to whom he pointed out the danger they must have incurred had he not complied with it for her citizens would have surrendered themselves to the Venetians or to the Duke of Savoy, so that in either case they would have been deprived of the government, and therefore they ought to be more willing to have himself as their neighbour and friend than a hostile power such as either of the others, and their enemy. The Milanese were on this occasion greatly perplexed, imagining they had discovered the Count's ambition and the end he had in view but they thought it desirable to conceal their fears, for they did not know, if the Count were to desert them, to whom they could have recourse except the Venetians, whose pride and tyranny they naturally dreaded. They therefore resolved not to break with the Count, but by his assistance remedy the evils with which they were threatened, hoping that when freed from them they might rescue themselves from him also, for at that time they were assailed not only by the Venetians, but by the Genoese and the Duke of Savoy, in the name of Charles of Orléans, the son of a sister of Filippo, but whom the Count easily vanquished. Thus their only remaining enemies were the Venetians, who, with a powerful army, determined to occupy their territories, and had already taken possession of Lodi and Piacenza, before which latter place the Count encamped, and, after a long siege, took and pillaged the city. Winter being set in, he led his forces into quarters, and then withdrew to Cremona, where during the cold season he remained in repose with his wife. In the spring the Venetian and Milanese armies again took the field. It was the design of the Milanese first to recover Lodi, and then to come to terms with the Venetians, for the expenses of the war had become very great, and they were doubtful of their general sincerity so that they were anxious alike for the repose of peace and for security against the Count. They therefore resolved that the army should march to the siege of Caravaggio, hoping that Lodi would surrender, on that fortress being wrested from the enemy's hands. The Count obeyed, though he would have preferred crossing the Adda and attacking the Brescian territory. Having encamped before Caravaggio, he so strongly entrenched himself that if the enemy attempted to relieve the place, they would have to attack him at a great disadvantage. The Venetian army, led by Michelotto, approached within two bowshots of the enemy's camp, and many skirmishes ensued. The Count continued to press the fortress, and reduced it to the very last extremity, which greatly distressed the Venetians, since they knew the loss of it would involve the total failure of their expedition. Very different views were entertained by their military officers respecting the best mode of relieving the place, but they saw no course open except to attack the enemy in his trenches in spite of all obstacles. The castle was, however, considered of such paramount importance that the Venetian Senate, though naturally timid and averse to all hazardous undertakings, chose rather to risk everything than allow it to fall into the hands of the enemy. They therefore resolved to attack the Count at all events, 
and early the next morning commenced their assault upon a point which was the least defended. At the first charge, as commonly happens in a surprise, Francesco's whole army was thrown into dismay. Order, however, was soon so completely restored by the Count, that the enemy, after various efforts to gain the outworks, were repulsed and put to flight, and so entirely routed that of twelve thousand horse only one thousand escaped the hands of the Milanese, who took possession of all the carriages and military stores. Nor had the Venetians ever before suffered such a thorough rout and overthrow. Among the plunder and prisoners, crouching down as if to escape observation, was found a Venetian commissary, who, in the course of the war and before the fight, had spoken contemptuously of the Count, calling him bastard and base-born. Being made prisoner, he remembered his faults, and fearing punishment, being taken before the Count, was agonized with terror, and, as is usual with mean minds, in prosperity insolent, in adversity abject and cringing, prostrated himself, weeping and begging pardon for the offences he had committed. The Count, taking him by the arm, raised him up, and encouraged him to hope for the best. He then said he wondered how a man so prudent and respectable as himself could so far err as to speak disparagingly of those who did not merit it, and as regarded the insinuations which he had made against him, he really did not know how Sforza, his father, and Madonna Lucia, his mother, had proceeded together, not having been there, and having no opportunity of interfering in the matter, so that he was not liable either to blame or praise. However, he knew very well that in regard to his own actions he had conducted himself so that no one could blame him, and in proof of this he would refer both the Venetian Senate and himself to what had happened that day. He then advised him in future to be more respectful in speaking of others, and more cautious in regard to his own proceedings. End of Book Six, Chapter Three, Recording by Nicholas Clifford, New Haven, Vermont. Six, Chapter Four of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nichelle von Lauder. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Six, Chapter Four, The Count's Successes, The Venetians Come to Terms with Him, Views of the Venetians, Indignation of the Milanese Against the Count, Their Ambassadors Addressed to Him, The Count's Moderation and Reply, The Count and the Milanese Prepare for War, Milanese Ambassadors at Venice, League of the Venetians and Milanese. The Count dupes the Venetians and Milanese. He applies for assistance to the Florentines. Diversity of opinions in Florence on the subject. Neri di Gino Caponi, averse to assisting the Count. Cosmo de' Medici, disposed to do so. The Florentines sent ambassadors to the Count. After this victory, the Count marched into the Brescian territory, occupied the whole country, and then pitched his camp within two miles of the city. The Venetians, having well-grounded fears that Brescia would be next attacked, provided the best defense in their power. They then collected the relics of their army, and, by virtue of the treaty, demanded assistance of the Florentines, who, being relieved from the war with Alfonso, sent them one thousand foot and two thousand horse, by whose aid the Venetians were in a condition to treat for peace. At one time it seemed the fate of their republic to lose by war and win by negotiation, for what was taken from them in battle was frequently restored twofold on the restoration of peace. They knew the Milanese were jealous of the Count, and that he wished not to be their captain merely, but their sovereign, and as it was in their power to make peace with either of the two, the one desiring it from ambition, the other from fear, they determined to make choice of the Count, and offer him assistance to effect his design, persuading themselves that, as the Milanese would perceive that they had been duped by him, they would in revenge place themselves in the power of any one rather than his, and that, becoming unable either to defend themselves or trust the Count, they would be compelled, having no other resource, to fall into their hands. Having taken this resolution, they sounded the Count, and found him quite disposed for peace, 
evidently desirous that the honor and advantage of the victory at Caravaggio should be his own, and not accrue to the Milanese. The parties therefore entered into an agreement, in which the Venetians undertook to pay the Count thirteen thousand florins per month, till he should obtain a Milan, and to furnish him, during the continuance of the war, four thousand horse and two thousand foot. The Count engaged to restore to the Venetians the towns, prisoners, and whatever else had been taken by him during the late campaigns, and contempt himself with those territories which the Duke possessed at the time of his death. When this treaty became known at Milan, it grieved the citizens more than the victory at Caravaggio had exhilarated them. The rulers of the city mourned, the people complained, women and children wept, and all exclaimed against the Count as false and perfidious. Although they could not hope that either prayers or promises would divert him from his ungrateful design, they sent ambassadors to see with what kind of color he would invest his unprincipled proceedings. And being admitted to his presence, one of them spoke to the following effect. It is customary with those who wish to obtain a favor to make use either of prayers, presents, or threats, that pity, convenience, or fear may induce compliance with their requests. But as with cruel, avaricious, or in their own conceit, powerful men, these arguments have no weight. It is vain to hope either to soften them by prayers, win them by presents, or alarm them by menaces. We therefore, being now, though late, aware of thy pride, cruelty, and ambition, come hither, not to ask aught, nor with the hope, even if we were so disposed, of obtaining it, but to remind thee of the benefits thou hast received from the people of Milan, and to prove with what heartless ingratitude thou hast repaid them, that at least, under the many evils oppressing us, we may derive some gratification from telling thee how and by whom they have been produced. Thou canst not have forgotten thy wretched condition at the death of Duke Filippo. The king and the pope were both thine enemies. Thou hast abandoned the Florentines and the Venetians, who, on account of their just indignation, and because they stood in no further need of thee, were almost become thy declared enemies. Thou wert exhausted by thy wars against the church, with few followers, no friends, or any money, hopeless of being able to preserve either thy territories or thy reputation. From these circumstances thy ruin must have ensued, but for our simplicity. We receive thee to our home, actuated by reverence for the happy memory of our Duke, with whom, being connected by marriage and renewed alliance, we believe thy affection would descend to those who had inherited his authority, and that, if to the benefits he had conferred on thee our own were added, the friendship we sought to establish would not only be firm, but inseparable. With this impression, we added Verona or Brescia to thy previous appointments. What more could we either give or promise thee? What else couldst thou, not from us merely but from any others, have either had or expected? Thou receivest from us an unhoped-for benefit, and we in return an unmerited wrong. Neither hast thou deferred until now the manifestation of thy base designs. For no sooner wert thou appointed to command our armies than, contrary to every dictate of propriety, thou didst accept Pavia, which plainly showed what was to be the result of thy friendship. But we bore with the injury, in hope that the greatness of the advantage would satisfy thy ambition. Alas! those who grasp it all cannot be satisfied with a part. Thou didst promise that we should possess the conquest which thou might afterward make. For thou wert well aware that what was given at many times might be withdrawn at once, and was the case after the victory at Caravaggio, purchased by our money and blood, and followed by our ruin. O oh, unhappy states which have to guard against their oppressor, but much more wretched those who have to trust to mercenary and faithless arms like thine! May our example instruct posterity, since that of Thebes and Philip of Macedon, who, after victory over her enemies, from being her captain, became her foe, and her prince, could not avail us. The only fault of which we are conscious is our overweening confidence in one whom we ought not to have trusted. For thy past life, thy restless mind, incapable of repose, ought to have put us on our guard. Neither ought we to have confided in one who betrayed the lord of Lucca, set a fine upon the Florentines and the Venetians, defied the duke, despised the king, and besides all this, 
persecuted the Church of God and the Divinity himself with innumerable atrocities. We ought not to have fancied that so many potentates possess less influence over the mind of Francesco Sforza than the Milanese, or that he would preserve unblemished that faith towards us which he had on so many occasions broken with them. Still this want of caution in us does not excuse the perfidy in thee, nor can it obliterate the infamy with which our just complaints will blacken thy character throughout the world, or prevent the remorse of thy conscience, when our arms are used for our own destruction. For thou wilt see that the sufferings due to parasites are fully deserved by thee, and though ambition should blind thine eyes, the whole world, witness to thine iniquity, will compel thee to open them. God himself will unclose them, if perjuries, if violated faith, if treacheries displease him, and if as ever he is still the enemy of the wicked. Do not therefore promise thyself any certainty of victory, for the just wrath of the Almighty will weigh heavily upon thee, and we are resolved to lose our liberty only with our lives. But if we found we could not ultimately defend it, we would submit ourselves to any one rather than to thee. And if our sins be so great that in spite of our utmost resolution we should still fall into thy hands, be quite assured that the sovereignty which is commenced in deceit and villainy will terminate either in thyself or thy children with ignominy and blood. The Count, though not insensible to the just reproaches of the Milanese, did not exhibit either by words or gestures any unusual excitement, and replied that, he willingly attributed to their angry feelings all the serious charges of their indiscreet harangue, and he would reply to them in detail, were he in the presence of any one who could decide their differences. For it would be evident that he had not injured the Milanese, but only taken care that they should not injure him. They well knew how they had proceeded after the victory of Caravaggio, for instead of rewarding him with either Verona or Brescia, they sought peace with the Venetians, that all the blame of the quarrel might rest on him, themselves obtaining the fruit of victory, the credit of peace, and all the advantages that could be derived from the war. It would thus be manifest they had no right to complain, when he had effected the arrangements which they first attempted to make, and that if he had deferred to do so a little longer, he would have had reason to accuse them of the ingratitude with which they were now charging him. Whether the charge were true or false, that God whom they had invoked to avenge their injuries would show at the conclusion of the war, and would demonstrate which was most his friend, and who had most justice on their side. Upon the departure of the ambassadors, the Count determined to attack the Milanese, who prepared for their defense, and appointed Francesco and Jacopo Piccinino attached to their cause on account of the ancient feud of the families of Braccio and Sforza, to conduct their forces in support of liberty, at least till they could deprive the Count of the aid of the Venetians, who they did not think would long be either friendly or faithful to him. On the other hand, the Count, perfectly aware of this, thought it not imprudent, supposing the obligation of the treaty insufficient, to bind them by the ties of interest, and therefore, in assigning to each their portion of the enterprise, he consented that the Venetian should attack Crema, and himself, with the other forces, assail the remainder of the territory. The advantage of this arrangement kept the Venetians so long in alliance with the Count, that he was enabled to conquer the whole of the Milanese territory, and to press the city so closely, that the inhabitants could not provide themselves with necessaries. Despairing of success, they sent envoys to the Venetians to beg they would compassionate their distress, and, as ought to be the case between republics, assist them in defense of their liberty against a tyrant whom, if once master of their city, they would be unable to restrain. Neither did they think that he would be content with the boundaries assigned him by the treaty, but to expect the dependencies of all Milan. The Venetians had not yet taken Crema, and wishing before they changed sides to effect this point, they publicly answered the envoys, that their engagements with the Count prevented them from defending the Milanese, but secretly gave them every assurance of their wish to do so. The Count had approached so near Milan with his forces, that he was disputing the suburbs with the inhabitants, when the Venetians, having taken Crema, thought they need no longer hesitate to declare in favor of the Milanese, with whom they had made peace and entered into alliance among the terms of which was the defense of their liberty unimpaired. 
Having come to this agreement, they ordered their forces to withdraw from the Count's camp and to return to the Venetian territory. They informed him of the peace made with the Milanese, and gave him twenty days to consider what course he would adopt. He was not surprised at the step taken by the Venetians, for he had long foreseen it, and expected its occurrence daily. But when it actually took place, he could not avoid feeling regret and displeasure similar to what the Milanese had experienced when he abandoned them. He took two days to consider the reply he would make to the ambassadors, whom the Venetians had sent to inform him of the treaty, and during this time he determined to dupe the Venetians, and not abandon his enterprise. Therefore, appearing openly to accept the proposal for peace, he sent his ambassadors to Venice with full credentials to effect ratification, but gave them secret orders not to do so, and with pretext or cavilling to put it off. To give the Venetians greater assurance of his sincerity, he made a truce with the Milanese for a month, withdrew from Milan, and divided his forces amongst the places he had taken. This course was the occasion of his victory and the ruin of the Milanese, for the Venetians, confident of peace, were slow in preparing for war, and the Milanese finding the truce concluded, the enemy withdrawn, and the Venetians their friends, felt assured that the Count had determined to abandon his design. This idea injured them in two ways, one, by neglecting to provide for their defense, the next, that, being seed-time, they had sowed a large quantity of grain in the country which the enemy had evacuated, and thus brought famine upon themselves. On the other hand, all that was injurious to his enemies favored the Count, and the time gave him opportunity to take breath and provide himself with assistance. The Florentines, during the War of Lombardy, had not declared in favor of either party, or assisted the Count either in defense of the Milanese or sense, for he never having been in need, had not presently requested it, and they only sent assistance to the Venetians after the rout at Caravaggio, in pursuance of the treaty. Count Francesco, standing now alone, and not knowing to whom else he could apply, was compelled to request immediate aid from the Florentines publicly from the state, and privately from friends, particularly from Cosmo de' Medici, with whom he had always maintained a steady friendship, and by whom he had constantly been faithfully advised and liberally supported. Nor did Cosmo abandon him in his extreme necessity, but supplied him generously from his own resources, and encouraged him to prosecute his design. He also wished the city publicly to assist him, but there were difficulties in this way. Neri de Gino Caponi, one of the most powerful citizens in Florence, thought it not to the advantage of the city that the Count should obtain Milan, and was of the opinion that it was more to the safety of Italy for him to ratify the peace than pursue the war. In the first place, he apprehended that the Milanese, through their anger against the Count, would surrender themselves entirely to the Venetians, which would occasion the ruin of all. Supposing he should occupy Milan, it appeared to him that so great military superiority, combined with such an extent of territory, would be dangerous to themselves, and that if the Count was intolerable, he would become doubly so as Duke. He therefore considered it better for the Republic of Florence and for Italy that the Count should be content with his military reputation, and that Lombardy should be divided into two republics, which could never be united to injure others, and separately are unable to do so. To attain this he saw no better means than to refrain from aiding the Count, and continuing in the former league with the Venetians. These reasonings were not satisfactory to Cosmo's friends, for they imagined that Neri had argued thus not from a conviction of its advantage to the Republic, but to prevent the Count, as a friend of Cosmo, from becoming Duke, apprehending that Cosmo would, in consequence of this, become too powerful. Cosmo, in reply, pointed out that to lend assistance to the Count would be highly beneficial both to Italy and the Republic, for it was unwise to imagine the Milanese could preserve their own liberty, for the nature of their community, their mode of life, and their hereditary feuds were opposed to every kind of civil government, so that it was necessary either that the Count should become Duke of Milan, or the Venetians her lords. And surely under such circumstances no one could doubt which would be most to their advantage, to have for their neighbor a powerful friend, or a far more powerful foe. Neither need it be apprehended that the Milanese, while at war with the Count, would submit to the Venetians, for the Count had a stronger party in the city, and the Venetians had not, so that whenever they were unable to defend themselves as free men, they would be more inclined to obey the Count 
than the Venetians. These diverse views kept the city long in suspense, but at length it was resolved to send ambassadors to the Count to settle the terms of agreement, with instructions that if they found him in such a condition as to give hopes of his ultimate success, they were to close with him, but if otherwise, they were to draw out the time in diplomacy. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Book 6, Chapter 5 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2. Translated by an unknown translator. Book 6, Chapter 5. Prosecution of the war between the Count and the Milanese. The Milanese reduced to extremity. The people rise against the magistrates. Milan surrenders to the Count. League between the new Duke of Milan and the Florentines, and between the King of Naples and the Venetians. Venetian and Neapolitan ambassadors at Florence. Answer of Cosimo di Medici to the Venetian ambassador. Preparations of the Venetians and the King of Naples for the war. The Venetians excite disturbances in Bologna. Florence prepares for war. The Emperor Frederick III at Florence. War in Lombardy between the Duke of Milan and the Venetians. Ferrando, son of the King of Naples, marches into Tuscany against the Florentines. The ambassadors were at Reggio when they heard that the Count had become Lord of Milan, for as soon as the truce had expired, he approached the city with his forces, hoping quickly to get possession of it in spite of the Venetians, who could bring no relief except from the side of the Adda, which route he could easily obstruct, and therefore had no apprehension, being then winter, of their arrival, and he trusted that, before the return of spring, he would be victorious, particularly as by the death of Francesco Piccinino there remained only Jacopo, his brother, to command the Milanese. The Venetians had sent an ambassador to Milan to confirm the citizens in their resolution of defence, promising them powerful and immediate aid. During the winter a few slight skirmishes had taken place between the Count and the Venetians, but on the approach of milder weather the latter, under Pandolfo Malatesti, halted with their army upon the Adda, and considering whether in order to succour the Milanese they ought to risk a battle. Pandolfo, their general, aware of the Count's abilities and the courage of his army, said it would be unadvisable to do so, and that, under the circumstances, it was needless, for the Count, being in great want of forage, could not keep the field and must soon retire. He therefore advised them to remain encamped, to keep the Milanese in hope, and prevent them from surrendering. This advice was approved by the Venetians, both as being safe, and because, by keeping the Milanese in this necessity, they might be the sooner compelled to submit to their dominion, for they felt quite sure that the injuries they had received would always prevent their submission to the Count. In the meantime the Milanese were reduced to the utmost misery, and as the city usually abounded with poor, many died of hunger in the streets. Hence arose complaints and disturbances in several parts, which alarmed the magistrates, and compelled them to use their utmost exertions to prevent popular meetings. The multitude are always slow to resolve on commotion, but the resolution once formed, any trivial circumstance excites it to action. Two men in humble life, talking together near the Porta Nuova of the calamities of the city, their own misery, and the means that might be adopted for their relief, others beginning to congregate, there was soon collected a large crowd. In consequence of it, a report was spread that the neighbourhood of Porta Nuova had risen against the government. Upon this, all the lower orders, who only waited for an example, assembled in arms and chose Gaspar da Vecomacato to be their leader. They then proceeded to the place where the magistrates were assembled, and attacked them so impetuously that all who did not escape by flight were slain. Among the number, as being considered a principal cause of the famine, and gratified at their distress, fell Leonardo Veniero, the Venetian ambassador. Having thus almost become masters of the city, they considered what course was next to be adopted to escape from the horrors surrounding them, and to procure peace. A feeling universally prevailed, that as they could not preserve their own liberty, they ought to submit to a prince who could defend them. Some proposed King Alfonso, some the Duke of Savoy, 
and others the King of France, but none mentioned the Count, so great was the general indignation against him. However, disagreeing with the rest, Gaspar d'Avecomacato proposed him, and explained in detail that if they desired relief from war, no other plan was open, since the people of Milan required a certain and immediate peace, and not a distant hope of succour. He apologised for the Count's proceedings, accused the Venetians, and all the powers of Italy, of which some from ambition and others from avarice were averse to their possessing freedom. Having to dispose of their liberty, it would be preferable, he said, to obey one who knew and could defend them, so that by their servitude they might obtain peace, and not bring upon themselves greater evils and more dangerous wars. He was listened to with the utmost profound attention, and, having concluded his harangue, it was unanimously resolved by the assembly that the Count should be called in, and Gaspar was appointed to wait upon him and signify their desire. By the people's command he conveyed the pleasing and happy intelligence to the Count, who heard it with the utmost satisfaction, and entered Milan as prince on the 26th of February, 1450, where he was received with the greatest possible joy by those who, only a short time previously, had heaped on him all the slanders that hatred could inspire. The news of this event reaching Florence, orders were immediately sent to the envoys who were upon the way to Milan, that instead of treating for his alliance with the Count, they should congratulate the Duke upon his victory. They, arranging accordingly, had a most honourable reception, and were treated with all possible respect, for the Duke well knew that in all Italy he could not find braver or more faithful friends to defend him against the power of the Venetians than the Florentines, who, being no longer in fear of the house of Visconti, found themselves opposed by the Aragonese and the Venetians, for the Aragonese princes of Naples were jealous of the friendship which the Florentines had always evinced for the family of France, and the Venetians, seeing the ancient enemy of the Florentines against the Visconti transferred to themselves, resolved to injure them as much as possible, for they knew how pertinaciously and invariably they had persecuted the Lombard princes. These considerations caused the new duke willingly to join the Florentines, and united the Venetians and King Alfonso against their common enemies, impelling them at the same time to hostilities, the king against the Florentines, and the Venetians against the duke, who, being fresh in the government, would, they imagined, be unable to resist them, even with all the aid he could obtain. But as the league between the Florentines and the Venetians still continued, and as the king, after the war of Piombino, had made peace with the former, it seemed indecent to commence an open rupture until some plausible reason could be assigned in justification of offensive measures. On this account each sent ambassadors to Florence, who on the part of their sovereigns signified that the league formed between them was made not for injury to any, but solely for the mutual defence of their states. The Venetian ambassador then complained that the Florentines had allowed Alessandro, the duke's brother, to pass into Lombardy with his forces, and besides this, had assisted and advised in the treaty made between the duke and the Marquis of Mantua, matters which he declared to be injurious to the Venetians, and inconsistent with the friendship hitherto subsisting between the two governments, amicably reminding them that one who inflicts unmerited injury gives others just ground of hostility, and that those who break a peace may expect war. The Signory appointed Cosimo de' Medici to reply to what had been said by the Venetian ambassador, and in a long and excellent speech he recounted the numerous advantages conferred by the city on the Venetian Republic, showed what an extent of dominion they had acquired by the money, forces and counsel of the Florentines, and reminded him that, although the friendship had originated with the Florentines, they had never been given occasion of enmity, and, as they desired peace, they greatly rejoiced when the treaty was made if it had been entered into for the sake of peace, and not of war. True it was, he wondered much at the remarks which had been made, seeing that such light and trivial matters should give offence to so great a republic, but if they were worthy of notice, he must have it universally understood, that the Florentines wished their country to be free and open to all, and that the Duke's character was such, that if he desired the friendship of the Marquis of Mantua, he had no need of any one's favour or advice. He therefore feared that these cavils were produced by some latent motive, which it was not thought proper to disclose. Be this as it might, they would freely declare to all that in the same proportion as the friendship of the Florentines was beneficial, their enmity could be destructive. The matter was hushed up, and the ambassadors on their departure appeared perfectly satisfied. But the league between the king and the Venetians made the Florentines and the duke rather apprehend war than hope for a long continuance of peace. They therefore entered into an alliance, 
and at the same time the enmity of the Venetians transpired by a treaty with the Sienese, and the expulsion of all Florentine subjects from their cities and territories. Shortly after this, Alfonso did the same, without any consideration of the peace made the year previous, and not having even the shadow of an excuse. The Venetians attempted to take Bologna, and having armed the emigrants and united to them a considerable force, introduced them into the city by night through one of the common sewers. No sooner had they entered than they raised a cry, by which Santi Bentivogli, being awakened, was told that the whole city was in possession of the rebels. But though many advised him to escape, saying that he could not save the city by his stay, he determined to confront the danger, and, taking arms, encouraged his followers, assembled a few friends, attacked and routed part of the rebels, slew many more, and drove the remainder out of the city. By this act of bravery all agreed he had fully proved himself a genuine scion of the house of the Bentivoli. These events and demonstrations gave the Florentines an earnest of approaching war. They consequently followed their usual practice on similar occasions, and created the Council of Ten. They engaged new condottieri, sent ambassadors to Rome, Naples, Venice, Milan, and Siena, to demand assistance from their friends, gain information about those they suspected, decide such as were wavering, and discover the designs of the foe. From the Pope they obtained only general expressions of an amicable disposition and admonitions to peace. From the King, empty excuses for having expelled the Florentines, and offers of safe conduct for whoever should demand it. And although he endeavoured, as much as possible, to conceal every indication of his hostile designs, the ambassadors felt convinced of his unfriendly disposition, and observed many preparations tending to the injury of the Republic. The league with the Duke was strengthened by mutual obligations, and through his means they became friends with the Genoese, the old differences with them respecting reprisals and other small matters of dispute being composed, although the Venetians used every possible means to prevent it, and entreated the Emperor of Constantinople to expel all Florentines from his dominions. So fierce was the animosity with which they entered on this war, and so powerful their lust of dominion, that without the least hesitation they sought the destruction of those who had been the occasion of their own power. The Emperor, however, refused to listen to them. The Venetian Senate forbade the Florentine ambassadors to enter their territories, alleging that being in league with the King, they could not entertain them without his concurrence. The Sienese received their ambassadors with fair words, fearing their own ruin before the League could assist them, and therefore endeavoured to appease the powers whose attack they were unable to resist. The Venetians and the King, as was then conjectured, were disposed to send ambassadors to Florence to justify the war but the Venetian envoy was not allowed to enter the Florentine dominions, and the king's ambassador, being unwilling to perform his office alone, the embassy was not completed, and thus the Venetians learned that however little they might esteem the Florentines, the latter had still less respect for them. In the midst of these fears the Emperor Frederick III came into Italy to be crowned. On the 30th of January, 1451, he entered Florence with 1,500 horse, and was most honourably received by the Signory. He remained in the city till the 6th of February, and then proceeded to Rome for his coronation, where, having been solemnly concentrated, consecrated, and his marriage celebrated with the Empress, who had come to Rome by sea, he returned to Germany, and again passed through Florence in May, with the same honours as upon his arrival. On his return, having derived some benefits from the Marquis of Mantua, he conceded to him Medina and Reggio. In the meantime the Florentines did not fail to prepare themselves for immediate war, and to augment their influence, and strike the enemy with terror. They, in conjunction with the Duke, entered into alliance with the King of France for the mutual defence of their states. This treaty was published with great pomp throughout all Italy. The month of May, 1452, having arrived, the Venetians thought it not desirable to defer any longer their attack upon the Duke, and with 16,000 horse and 6,000 foot assailed his territories in the direction of Lodi, while the Marquis of Montferrat, instigated either by his own ambition or the entreaties of the Venetians, did the same on the side of Alexandria. The Duke assembled a force of 18,000 cavalry and 3,000 infantry, garrisoned Alexandria and Lodi, and all the other places where the enemy might annoy them. He then attacked the Brescian territory and greatly harassed the Venetians, while both parties alike plundered the country and ravaged the smaller towns. Having defeated the Marquis of Montferrat at Alexandria, the Duke was able to unite his whole force against the Venetians and invade their territory. 
While the war in Lombardy proceeded thus, giving rise to various trifling incidents unworthy of recital, King Alfonso and the Florentines carried on hostilities in Tuscany, but in a similarly inefficient manner, evincing no greater talent and incurring no greater danger. Ferrando, the illegitimate son of Alfonso, entered the country with twelve thousand troops under the command of Federigo, Lord of Urbino. Their first attempt was to attack Poggiano in the Val di Ciani, for, having the Sienese in their favour, they entered the Florentine territory in that direction. The walls of the castle were weak, and it was small and consequently poorly manned, but the garrison were, among the soldiers of that period, considered brave and faithful. Two hundred infantry were also sent by the Signory for its defence. Before this castle, thus provided, Ferrando sat down, and either from the valour of its defenders or his own deficiencies, thirty-six days elapsed before he took it. This interval enabled the city to make better provision for places of greater importance, to collect forces and include more effective arrangements than had hitherto been made. The enemy next proceeded into the district of Ciani, where they attacked two small towns, the property of private citizens, but could not capture them. They then encamped before the Castellina, a fortress upon the borders of the Chianti, within ten miles of Siena, weak from its defective construction, and still more so by its situation, but, notwithstanding these defects, the assailants were compelled to retire in disgrace, after having lain before it forty-four days. So formidable were those armies, and so perilous those wars, that places now abandoned as untenable were then defended as impregnable. While Ferrando was encamped in the Chianti, he made many incursions, and took considerable booty from the Florentine territories, extending his depredations within six miles of the city, to the great alarm and injury of the people, who at this time, having sent their forces to the number of eight thousand soldiers under Astore de Faenza and Gismondo Malatesti towards Castel di Colli, kept them at a distance from the enemy, lest they should be compelled to an engagement so they considered that so long as they were not beaten in a pitched battle they could not be vanquished in the war generally, or small castles, when lost, were recovered at the peace, and larger places were in no danger because the enemy would not venture to attack them. The king had also a fleet of about twenty vessels, comprising galleys and similar craft, which lay off Pisa, and during the siege of Castellina were moored near the Rocca di Vada, which, from the negligence of the governor, he took, and then harassed the surrounding country. However, this annoyance was easily removed by a few soldiers sent by the Florentines to Campiglia, and who confined the enemy to the coast. End of Book 6, Chapter 5 Book 6, Chapter 6 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2 Translated by an Unknown Translator Book 6, Chapter 6 Conspiracy of Stefano Porcari against the Papal Government The Conspirators Discovered and Punished The Florentines Recover the Places They Had Lost Gerardo Gambacorti, Lord of Val di Bagno, endeavours to transfer his territories to the King of Naples. Gallant conduct of Antonio Gualandi, who counteracts the design of Gamba Corti. René of Anjou is called into Italy by the Florentines. René returns to France. The Pope endeavours to restore peace. Peace proclaimed. Jacopo Piccinino attacks the Sienese. The Pontiff did not interfere in these affairs further than to endeavour to bring the parties to a mutual accommodation. But while he refrained from external wars, he incurred the danger of more serious troubles at home. Stefano Porcari was a Roman citizen, equally distinguished for nobility of birth and extent of learning, but still more by the excellence of his character. Like all who are in pursuit of glory, he resolved either to perform or to attempt something worthy of memory, and thought he could not do better than deliver his country from the hands of the prelates, and restore the ancient form of government hoping, in the event of success, to be considered a new founder or second father of the city. The dissolute manners of the priesthood, and the discontent of the Roman barons and people, encouraged him to look for a happy termination of his enterprise. But he derived his greatest confidence from those verses of Petrarch in the canzone which begins, Spirito gentil che quelle membra regi, where he says, Sopra il monte tapeo canzon vedra, un cavalier, 
Citalia tuta honora, pensoso più d'altrui, cerdi se stesso. Stefano, believing poets are sometimes endowed with a divine and prophetic spirit, thought the event must take place which Petrarch in this canzone seemed to foretell, and that he was destined to effect the glorious task, considering himself in learning, eloquence, friends, and influence, superior to any other citizen of Rome. Having taken these impressions, he had not sufficient prudence to avoid discovering his design by his discourse, demeanour, and mode of living, so that the Pope, becoming acquainted with it, in order to prevent the commission of some rash act, banished him to Bologna and charged the governor of the city to compel his appearance before him once every day. Stefano was not daunted by this first check, but with even greater earnestness prosecuted his undertaking, and, by such means as were available, more cautiously corresponded with his friends, and often went and returned from Rome with such celerity as to be in time to present himself before the governor within the limit allowed for his appearance. Having acquired a sufficient number of partisans, he determined to make the attempt without further delay, and arranged with his friends at Rome to provide an evening banquet, to which all the conspirators were invited, with orders that each should bring with him his most trustworthy friends, and himself promised to be with him before the entertainment was served. Everything was done according to this orders, and Stefano Porcari arrived at the place appointed. Supper being brought in, he entered the apartment dressed in cloth of gold, with rich ornaments about his neck, to give him a dignified appearance and commanding aspect. Having embraced the company, he delivered a long oration to dispose their minds to the glorious undertaking. He then arranged the measures to be adopted, ordering that one part of them should on the following morning take possession of the pontiff's palace, and that the other should call the people of Rome to arms. The affair came to the knowledge of the Pope the same night, some by treachery among the conspirators, and others that he knew of Porcari's presence at Rome. Be this as it may, on the night of the supper, Stefano and the greater part of his associates were arrested, and afterwards expiated their crime by death. Thus ended his enterprise, and though some may applaud his intentions, he must stand charged with deficiency of understanding, for such undertakings, though possessing some slight appearance of glory, are almost always attended with ruin. Gerardo Gambacorti was lord of Valdebano, and his ancestors as well as himself had always been in the pay or under the protection of the Florentines. Alfonso endeavoured to induce him to exchange his territory for another in the kingdom of Naples. This became known to the signory, who, in order to ascertain his designs, sent an ambassador to Gambacorti to remind him of the obligations of his ancestors and himself to their republic, and induce him to continue faithful to them. Gerardo affected the greatest astonishment, assured the ambassador with solemn oaths that no such treacherous thought had ever entered his mind, and that he would gladly go to Florence and pledge himself for the truth of his assertions. But being unable from indisposition, he would send his son as a hostage. These assurances, and the proposal with which they were accompanied, induced the Florentines to think Gerardo had been slandered, and that his accuser must be alike weak and treacherous. Gerardo, however, hastened his negotiation with redoubled zeal, and having arranged the terms, Alfonso sent Frate Puccio, a knight of Jerusalem, with a strong body of men to the Val di Bagno, to take possession of the fortresses and towns, the people of which, being attached to the Florentine Republic, submitted unwillingly. Frate Puccio had already taken possession of nearly the whole territory, except the fortress of Cozzano. Gambacorti was accompanied, while transferring his dominions, by a young Pisan of great courage and address, named Antonio Guarlandi, who, considering the whole affair, the strength of the place, the well-known bravery of the garrison, their evident reluctance to give it up, and the baseness of Gambacorti, at once resolved to make an effort to prevent the fulfilment of his design, and Gerardo being at the entrance for the purpose of introducing the Aragonese, he pushed him out with both his hands, and commanded the guards to shut the gate upon such a scoundrel, and hold the fortress for the Florentine Republic. When this circumstance became known in Bagno and the neighbouring places, the inhabitants took up arms against the king's forces, and, raising the Florentine standard, drove them out. The Florentines, learning these events, imprisoned Gerardo's son, and sent troops to Bagno for the defence of the territory, which, having hitherto been governed by its own prince, now became a vicariate. The traitor Gerardo escaped with difficulty, leaving his wife, 
family, and all his property in the hands of those whom he had endeavoured to betray. The affair was considered by the Florentines of great importance, for had the king succeeded in securing the territory, he might have overrun the Val di Taveri and the Casentino at his pleasure, and would have caused so much annoyance that they could no longer have allowed their whole force to act against the army of the Aragonese at Siena. In addition to the preparations made by the Florentines in Italy to resist the hostile league, they sent as ambassador Agnolo Acciaduoli to request that the King of France would allow Rene of Anjou to enter Italy in favour of the Duke and themselves, and also that by his presence in the country he might defend his friends and attempt the recovery of the Kingdom of Naples, for which purpose they offered him assistance in men and money. While the war was proceeding in Lombardy and Tuscany, the ambassador effected an arrangement with King René, who promised to come into Italy during the month of June, the League engaging to pay him 30,000 florins upon his arrival at Alexandria, and 10,000 per month during the continuance of the war. In pursuance of this treaty, King René commenced his march into Italy, but was stopped by the Duke of Savoy and the Marquis of Montferrat, who, being in alliance with the Venetians, would not allow him to pass. The Florentine ambassador advised that in order to uphold the influence of his friends, he should return to Provence and conduct part of his forces into Italy by sea, and in the meantime endeavour by the authority of the King of France to obtain a passage for the remainder through the territories of the Duke. This plan was completely successful, for René came into Italy by sea and his forces by the mediation of the King of France were allowed a passage through Savoy. King René was most honourably received by Duke Francesco, and joining his French with the Italian forces, they attacked the Venetians with so much impetuosity that they shortly recovered all the places which had been taken by the Cremonese. Not content with this, they occupied nearly the whole Brescian territory, so that the Venetians, unable to keep the field, withdrew close to the walls of Brescia. Winter coming on, the Duke deemed it advisable to retire into quarters. Having appointed Piacenza for the forces of René, where, having passed the whole of the cold season of 1453 without attempting anything, the Duke thought of taking the field on the approach of spring, and stripping the Venetians of the remainder of their possessions by land, but was informed by the King that he was obliged of necessity to return to France. This determination was quite new and unexpected to the Duke, and caused him the utmost concern, but though he immediately went to dissuade René from carrying it into effect, he was unable, either by promises or entreaties, to divert him from his purpose. He engaged, however, to leave part of his forces, and sent his son for the service of the League. The Florentines were not displeased at this, for having recovered their territories and castles, they were no longer in fear of Alfonso, and on the other hand, they did not wish the Duke to obtain any part of Lombardy but what belonged to him. René took his departure and sent his son John into Italy, according to his promise, who did not remain in Lombardy, but came direct to Florence, where he was received with the highest respect. The king's departure made the duke desirous of peace. The Venetians, Alfonso and the Florentines, being all weary of the war, were similarly disposed, and the pope continued to wish it as much as ever, for during this year the Turkish emperor Mohammed had taken Constantinople and subdued the whole of Greece. This conquest alarmed the Christians, more especially the Venetians and the pope, who already began to fancy the Mohammedans at their doors. The pope, therefore, begged the Italian potentates to send ambassadors to himself, with authority to negotiate a general peace, with which all complied, but when the particular circumstances of each case came to be considered, many difficulties were found in the war of effecting it. King Alfonso required the Florentines to reimburse the expenses he had incurred in the war, and the Florentines demanded some compensation from him. The Venetians thought themselves entitled to Cremona from the Duke, while he insisted upon the restoration of Bergamo, Brescia, and Crema, so that it seemed impossible to reconcile such conflicting claims. But what could not be effected by a number at Rome was easily managed at Milan and Venice by two, for while the matter was under discussion at Rome, the Duke and the Venetians came to an arrangement on the 9th of April, 1454, by virtue of which each party resumed what they had possessed before the war, and the Duke being allowed to recover from the princes of Montferrat and Savoy the places they had taken. To the other Italian powers a month was allowed to ratify the treaty. The popes and the Florentines, and with them the Sienese and other minor powers, acceded to it within the time, 
Besides this, the Florentines, the Venetians, and the Duke concluded a treaty of peace for twenty-five years. King Alfonso alone exhibited dissatisfaction at what had taken place, thinking he had not been sufficiently considered, that he stood not on the footing of a principal, but only ranked as an auxiliary, and therefore kept aloof, and would not disclose his intentions. However, after receiving a legate from the Pope and many solemn embassies from other powers, he allowed himself to be persuaded, principally by means of the pontiff, and with his son joined the League for thirty years. The Duke and the King also contracted a twofold relationship and a double marriage, each giving a daughter to a son of the other. Notwithstanding this, that Italy might still retain the seeds of war, Alfonso would not consent to the peace, unless the League would allow him, without injury to themselves, to make war upon the Genoese, Gismondo Malatesti, and Astori, Prince of Faenza. This being conceded, his son Ferrando, who was at Siena, returned to the kingdom, having by his coming into Tuscany acquired no dominion, and lost a great number of his men. Upon the establishment of a general peace, the only apprehension entertained was, that it would be disturbed by the animosity of Alfonso against the Genoese. Yet it happened otherwise. The king, indeed, did not openly infringe the peace, but it was frequently broken by the ambition of the mercenary troops. The Venetians, as usual on the conclusion of a war, had discharged Jacopo Piccinino, who, with some other unemployed condottieri, marched into Romagna, thence into the Sienese, and halting in the country, took possession of many places. At the commencement of these disturbances, and the beginning of the year, 1455, Pope Nicholas died, and was succeeded by Calixtus III, who, to put a stop to the war newly broken out so near home, immediately sent Giovanni Ventimiglia, his general, with what forces he could furnish. These being joined by the troops of the Florentines and the Duke of Milan, both of whom furnished assistance, attacked Jacopo near Bolsena, and though Ventimiglia was taken prisoner, yet Jacopo was not worsted, and retreated in disorder to Castiglione della Pescaia, where, had he not been assisted by Alfonso, his force would have been completely annihilated. This made it evident that Jacopo's movement had been made by order of Alfonso, and the latter, as if palpably detected, to conciliate his allies after having almost alienated them with this unimportant war, ordered Jacopo to restore to the Sienese the places he had taken, and they gave him twenty thousand florins by way of ransom, after which he and his forces were received into the kingdom of Naples. End of Book Six. Book Six, Chapter Seven of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Six, Chapter Seven. Christendom alarmed by the progress of the Turks, the Turks routed before Belgrade, description of a remarkable hurricane, war against the Genoese and Gismondo Malatesti, Genoa submits to the King of France, death of Alfonso, King of Naples, succeeded by his son Ferrando, the Pope designs to give the kingdom of Naples to his nephew Piero Lodovico Borgia, eulogy of Pius II, disturbances in Genoa between John of Anjou and the Fregosi, the Fregosi subdued, John attacks the kingdom of Naples, Ferrando king of Naples routed, Ferrando reinstated, the Genoese cast off the French yoke, John of Anjou routed in the kingdom of Naples. The Pope, though anxious to restrain Jacopo Piccinino, did not neglect to make provision for the defense of Christendom, which seemed in danger from the Turks. He sent ambassadors and preachers into every Christian country to exhort princes and people to arm in defense of their religion, and with their persons and property, to contribute to the enterprise against the common enemy. In Florence large sums were raised, and many citizens bore the mark of a red cross upon their dress to intimate their readiness to become soldiers of the faith. Solemn processions were made, and nothing was neglected, either in public or private, to show their willingness to be among the most forward to assist the enterprise with money, counsel, or men. But the eagerness for this crusade was somewhat abated by learning that the Turkish army, being at the siege of Belgrade, a strong city and fortress in Hungary, upon the banks of the Danube, had been routed, and the emperor wounded, so that the alarm felt by the Pope and all Christendom on the loss of Constantinople, 
having ceased to operate, they proceeded deliberately with their preparations for war, and in Hungary their zeal was cooled through the death of Giovanni Corvini the Wywode, who commanded the Hungarian forces on that memorable occasion, and fell in battle. To return to the affairs of Italy, in the year 1456 the disturbances occasioned by Jacopo Piccinino having subsided, and human weapons laid aside, the heavens seemed to make war against the earth, dreadful tempestuous winds then occurring, which produced effects unprecedented in Tuscany, and which to posterity will appear marvellous and unaccountable. On the 24th of August, about an hour before daybreak, there arose from the Adriatic near Ancona a whirlwind, which, crossing from east to west, again reached the sea near Pisa, accompanied by thick clouds and the most intense and impenetrable darkness, covering a breadth of about two miles in the direction of its course. Under some natural or supernatural influence, this vast and overcharged column of condensed vapor burst. Its fragments contended with indescribable fury, and huge bodies, sometimes ascending toward heaven, and sometimes precipitated upon the earth, struggled, as it were, in mutual conflict, whirling in circles with intense velocity, and, ac and accompanied by winds impetuous beyond all conception, while flashes of awful brilliancy and murky, lurid flames incessantly broke forth. From these confused clouds, furious winds, and momentary fires, sounds issued, of which no earthquake or thunder ever heard could afford the least idea, striking such awe into all that it was thought the end of the world had arrived, that the earth, waters, heavens, and entire universe mingling together were being resolved into their ancient chaos. Wherever this awful tempest passed, it produced unprecedented and marvelous effects, but these were more especially experienced near the castle of St. Cassiano, about eight miles from Florence, upon the hill which separates the valleys of Pisa and Grieve. Between this castle and the Borgo St. Andrea, upon the same hill, the tempest passed without touching the latter, and in the former only threw down some of the battlements and the chimneys of a few houses, but in the space between them it leveled many buildings quite to the ground. The roofs of the churches of St. Martin at Bagnolo and Santa Maria della Pace were carried more than a mile, unbroken as when upon their respective edifices. A muleteer and his beasts were driven from the road into the adjoining valley and found dead. All the large oaks and lofty trees which could not bend beneath its influence were not only stripped of their branches, but borne to a great distance from the places where they grew. And when the tempest had passed over, and daylight made the desolation visible, the inhabitants were transfixed with dismay. The country had lost all its habitable character, churches and dwellings were laid in heaps, nothing was heard but the lamentations of those whose possessions had perished, or whose cattle or friends were buried beneath the ruins, and all who witnessed the scene were filled with anguish or compassion. It was doubtless the design of the Omnipotent, rather to threaten Tuscany than to chastise her, for had the hurricane been directed over the city, filled with houses and inhabitants, instead of proceeding among oaks and elms, or small and thinly scattered dwellings, it would have been such a scourge as the mind, with all its ideas of horror, could not have conceived. But the Almighty desired that this slight example should suffice to recall the minds of men to a knowledge of himself and of his power. To return to our history— King Alfonso was dissatisfied with the peace, and as the war which he had unnecessarily caused Jacopo Piccinino to make against the Sienese had produced no important result, he resolved to try what could be done against those whom the conditions of the League permitted him to attack. He therefore, in the year 1456, assailed the Genoese both by sea and by land, designing to deprive the Fregosi of the government and restore the Adorni. At the same time he ordered Jacopo Piccinino to cross the Tronto and attack Gismondo Malatesti, who, having fortified his territories, did not concern himself, and this part of the king's enterprise produced no effect. But his proceedings against Genoa occasioned more wars against himself and his kingdom than he could have wished. Piero Fregoso was then doge of Genoa, and doubting his ability to sustain the attack of the king, he determined to give what he could not hold to some one who might defend it against his enemies, in hope that at a future period he should obtain a return for the benefit conferred. He therefore sent ambassadors to Charles the Seventh of France, and offered him the government of Genoa. Charles accepted the offer, and sent John of Anjou, the son of King René, who had a short time previously left Florence and returned to France, to take possession with the idea that he, 
having learned the manners and customs of Italy, would be able to govern the city, and also that this might give him an opportunity of undertaking the conquest of Naples, of which René, John's father, had been deprived by Alfonso. John therefore proceeded to Genoa, where he was received as prince, and the fortresses both of the city and the government given up to him. This annoyed Alfonso, with the fear that he had brought upon himself too powerful an enemy. He was not, however, dismayed, but pursued his enterprise vigorously, and had led his fleet to Porto, below Villa Marina, when he died after a sudden illness, and thus John and the Genoese were relieved from the war. Ferrando, who succeeded to the kingdom of his father Alfonso, became alarmed at having so powerful an enemy in Italy, and was doubtful of the disposition of so many of his barons, who, being desirous of change, he feared would take part with the French. He was also apprehensive of the Pope, whose ambition he well knew, and who, seeing him new in the government, might design to take it from him. He had no hope except from the Duke of Milan, who entertained no less anxiety concerning the affairs of the kingdom than Ferrando for he feared that if the French were to obtain it they would endeavor to annex his own dominions, which he knew they considered to be rightfully their own. He therefore, soon after the death of Alfonso, sent letters and forces to Ferrando, the latter to give him aid and influence, the former to encourage him with an intimation that he would not, under any circumstances, forsake him. The pontiff intended, after the death of Alfonso, to give the kingdom of Naples to his nephew Piero Lodovico Borgia, and to furnish a decent pretext for his design, and obtain the concurrence of the powers of Italy in its favor, he signified a wish to restore that realm to the dominion of the Church of Rome, and therefore persuaded the Duke not to assist Ferrando. But in the midst of these views and opening enterprises, Calixtus died, and Pius the Second, of Sienese origin, of the family of Piccolomini, and by the name Aeneas, succeeded to the pontificate. This pontiff, free from the ties of private interest, having no object but to benefit Christendom and honor the Church, at the Duke's entreaty, crowned Ferrando King of Naples, judging it easier to establish peace if the kingdom remained in the hands which at present held it, than if he were to favor the views of the French, or, as Calixtus purposed, take it for himself. Ferrando, in acknowledgment of the benefit, created Antonio, one of the Pope's nephews, Prince of Malfi, gave him an illegitimate daughter of his own in marriage, and restored Benevento and Teresina to the church. It thus appeared that the internal dissensions of Italy might be quelled, and the pontiff prepared to induce the powers of Christendom to unite in an enterprise against the Turks, as Calixtus had previously designed, when differences arose between the Fregosi and John of Anjou, the lord of Genoa, which occasioned greater and more important wars than those recently concluded. Pietrino Fregoso was at his castle of Riviera, and thought he had not been rewarded by John in proportion to his family's merits, for it was by their means the latter had become prince of the city. This impression drove the parties into open enmity, a circumstance gratifying to Ferrando, who saw in it relief from his troubles, and the sole means of procuring his safety. He therefore assisted Pietrino with money and men, trusting to drive John out of Genoese territory. The latter, being aware of his design, sent for aid to France, and on obtaining it attacked Pietrino, who through his numerous friends entertained the strongest assurance of success, so that John was compelled to keep within the city, into which Pietrino, having entered by night, took possession of some parts of it. But upon the return of day his people were all either slain or made prisoners by John's troops, and he himself was found among the dead. This victory gave John hopes of recovering the kingdom, and in October 1459 he sailed thither from Genoa with a powerful fleet, and landed at Baia, whence he proceeded to Sessa, by the duke of which place he was favorably received. The prince of Taranto, the Aquilani, with several cities and other princes, also joined him, so that a great part of the kingdom fell into his hands. On this Ferrando applied for assistance to the pope and the duke of Milan, and to diminish the number of his enemies, made peace with Gismondo Malatesti, which gave so much offense to Jacopo Piccinino, the hereditary enemy of Gismondo, that he resigned his command under Ferrando, and joined his rival. Ferrando also sent money to Federigo, lord of Urbino, and collected with all possible speed what was in those times considered a tolerable army, which, meeting the enemy upon the river Sarni, an engagement ensued in which Ferrando was routed, and many of his principal officers taken. 
After this defeat the city of Naples alone, with a few smaller places and princes of inferior note, adhered to Ferrando, the greater part having submitted to John. Jacopo Piccinino, after the victory, advised an immediate march upon Naples, but John declined this, saying he would first reduce the remainder of the kingdom, and then attack the seat of government. This resolution occasioned the failure of his enterprise, for he did not consider how much more easily the members follow the head than the head the members. After his defeat, Ferrando took refuge in Naples, whither the scattered remnants of his people followed him, and by soliciting his friends he obtained money and a small force. He sent again for assistance to the Pope and the Duke, by both of whom he was supplied more liberally and speedily than before, for they began to entertain most serious apprehensions of his losing the kingdom. His hopes were thus revived, and, marching from Naples, he gained his reputation in his dominions, and soon obtained the places of which he had been deprived. While the war was proceeding in the kingdom, a circumstance occurred by which John of Anjou lost his influence and all chance of success in the enterprise. The Genoese had become so weary of the haughty and avaricious dominion of the French that they took arms against the viceroy and compelled him to seek refuge in the Castelletto. The Fregosi and the Adorni united in the enterprise against him and were assisted with money and troops by the Duke of Milan, both for the recovery and preservation of the government. At the same time, King René, coming with a fleet to the assistance of his son, and hoping to recover Genoa by means of the Castelletto, upon landing his forces was so completely routed that he was compelled to return in disgrace to Provence. When the news of his father's defeat reached Naples, John was greatly alarmed, but continued the war for a time by the assistance of those barons who, being rebels, knew they would obtain no terms from Ferrando. At length, after various trifling occurrences, the two royal armies came to an engagement, in which John was routed near Troia in the year 1463. He was, however, less injured by his defeat than by the desertion of Jacopo Piccinino, who joined Ferrando, and being abandoned by his troops he was compelled to take refuge in Istria, and thence withdrew to France. The war continued four years. John's failure was attributable to negligence, for victory was often within his grasp, but he did not take proper means to secure it. The Florentines took no decisive part in this war. John, king of Aragon, who succeeded upon the death of Alfonso, sent ambassadors to request their assistance for his nephew Ferrando, in compliance with the terms of the treaty recently made with his father Alfonso. The Florentines replied that they were under no obligation, that they did not think proper to assist the son in a war commenced by the father with his own forces, and that as it was begun without either their counsel or knowledge, it must be continued and concluded without their help. The ambassadors affirmed the engagement to be binding on the Florentines, and themselves to be answerable for the event of the war, and then in great anger left the city. Thus, with regard to external affairs, the Florentines continued tranquil during this war, but the case was otherwise with their domestic concerns, as will be particularly shown in the following book. End of Book Six Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March twenty third, two 2009Book One, Chapter One of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Seven, Chapter One. Connection of the other Italian governments with the history of Florence. Republics always disunited. Some differences are injurious, others not so. The kind of dissensions prevailing at Florence. Cosimo de' Medici and Neri Caponi become powerful by dissimilar means. Reform in the election of magistrates favorable to Cosimo. Complaints of the principal citizens against the reform in elections. Luca Pitti, Gonfalonier of Justice, retains the imborsations by force tyranny and pride of Luca Pitti and his party, palace of the Pitti, death of Cosimo de' Medici, his liberality and magnificence, his modesty, his prudence, sayings of Cosimo. It will perhaps appear to the readers of the preceding book that, professing only to write of the affairs of Florence, I have delayed too much in speaking of those which occurred in Lombardy and Naples. But as I have not already avoided, 
so it is not my intention in future to forbear similar digressions. For although we have not engaged to give an account of the affairs of Italy, still it would be improper to neglect noticing the most remarkable of them. If they were wholly omitted, our history would not be so well understood, neither would it be so instructive or agreeable, since from the proceedings of the other princes and states of Italy have most commonly arisen those wars in which the Florentines were compelled to take part. Thus, from the war between John of Anjou and King Ferrando, originated those serious enmities and hatreds which ensued between Ferrando and the Florentines, particularly the house of Medici. The king complained of a want of assistance during the war, and of the aid afforded to his enemy, and from his anger originated the greatest evils, as will be hereafter seen. Having, in speaking of external affairs, come down to the year 1463, it will be necessary in order to make our narrative of the contemporaneous domestic transactions clearly understood, to revert to a period several years back. But first, according to custom, I would offer a few remarks referring to the events about to be narrated, and observe that those who think a republic may be kept in perfect unity of purpose are greatly deceived. True it is that some divisions injure republics, while others are beneficial to them. When accompanied by factions and parties, they are injurious, but when maintained without them they contribute to their prosperity. The legislator of a republic, since it is impossible to prevent the existence of dissensions, must at least take care to prevent the growth of faction. It may therefore be observed that citizens acquire reputation and power in two ways, the one public, the other private. Influence is acquired publicly by winning a battle, taking possession of a territory, fulfilling the duties of an embassy with care and prudence, or by giving wise counsel attended by a happy result. Private methods are conferring benefits upon individuals, defending them against the magistrates, supporting them with money, and raising them to undeserved honors, or with public games and entertainments gaining the affection of the populace. This mode of procedure produces parties and cliques, and in proportion as influence thus acquired is injurious, so is the former beneficial, and if quite free from party spirit, because it is founded upon the public good, and not upon private advantage. And though it is impossible to prevent the existence of inveterate feuds, still, if they be without partisans to support them for their own individual benefit, they do not injure a republic, but contribute to its welfare, since none can attain distinction, but as he contributes to her good, and each party prevents the other from infringing her liberties." The dissensions of Florence were always accompanied by factions, and were therefore always pernicious, and the dominant party only remained united so long as its enemies held it in check. As soon as the strength of the opposition was annihilated, the government, deprived of the restraining influence of its adversaries and being subject to no law, fell to pieces. The party of Cosimo de' Medici gained the ascendant in 1434, but the depressed party being very numerous, and composed of several very influential persons, fear kept the former united, and restrained their proceedings within the bounds of moderation, so that no violence was committed by them, nor anything done calculated to excite popular dislike. Consequently, whenever this government required the citizens' aid to recover or strengthen its influence, the latter were always willing to gratify its wishes, so that from 1434 to 1455, during a period of twenty-one years, the authority of Abelia was granted to it six times. There were in Florence, as we have frequently observed, two principally powerful citizens, Cosimo de' Medici and Neri Caponi. Neri acquired his influence by public services, so that he had many friends but few partisans. Cosimo, being able to avail himself both of public and private means, had many partisans as well as friends. While both lived, having been always united, they obtained from the people whatever they required, for in them popularity and power were united. But in the year 1455, Neri being dead, and the opposition party extinct, the government found a difficulty in resuming its authority, and this was occasioned, remarkably enough, by Cosimo's private friends, and the most influential men in the state, for not fearing the opposite party, they became anxious to abate his power. This inconstancy was the beginning of the evils which took place in 1456, so that those in power were openly advised in the deliberative councils not to renew the power of the Balia, but to close the balloting purses, and appoint the magistrates by drawing from the pollings, or squittini, previously made. 
To restrain this disposition, Cosimo had the choice of two alternatives, either forcibly to assume the government, with the partisans he possessed, and drive out the others, or to allow the matter to take its course, and let his friends see that they were not depriving him of power, but rather themselves. He chose the latter, for he well knew that at all events the purses being filled with the names of his own friends, he incurred no risk, and could take the government into his own hands whenever he found occasion. The chief offices of state being again filled by lot, the mass of the people began to think they had recovered their liberty, and that the decisions of the magistrates were according to their own judgments, unbiased by the influence of the great. At the same time, the friends of different grandees were humbled, and many who had commonly seen their houses filled with suitors and presents found themselves destitute of both. Those who had previously been very powerful were reduced to an equality with men whom they had been accustomed to consider inferior, and these formerly far beneath them were now become their equals. No respect or deference was paid to them, they were often ridiculed and derided, and frequently heard themselves and the Republic mentioned in the open streets without the least deference. Thus they found it was not Cosimo but themselves that had lost the government. Cosimo appeared not to notice these matters, and whenever any subject was proposed in favor of the people he was the first to support it. But the greatest cause of alarm to the higher classes, and his most favorable opportunity of retaliation, was the revival of the Castado, or property tax, of 1427, so that individual contributions were determined by statute, and not by a set of persons appointed for its regulation. This law being re-established, and a magistracy created to carry it into effect, the nobility assembled, and went to Cosimo to beg he would rescue them and himself from the power of the plebeians, and restore to the government the reputation which had made himself powerful, and them respected. He replied, he was willing to comply with their request, but wished the law to be obtained in the regular manner, by consent of the people, and not by force, of which he would not hear on any account. They then endeavoured in the councils to establish a new balia, but did not succeed. On this the grandees again came to Cosimo, and most humbly begged he would assemble the people in a general council or parliament. But this he refused, for he wished to make them sensible of their great mistake. And when Donato Cocci, being gonfalonier of justice, proposed to assemble them without his consent, the signors who were of Cosimo's party ridiculed the idea so unmercifully that the man's mind actually became deranged, and he had to retire from office in consequence. However, since it is undesirable to allow matters to proceed beyond recovery, the gonfalon of justice being in the hands of Luca Pitti, a bold-spirited man, Cosimo determined to let him adopt what course he thought proper, that if any trouble should arise it might be imputed to Luca, and not to himself. Luca, therefore, in the beginning of his magistracy, several times proposed to the people the appointment of a new belia, and not succeeding, he threatened the members of the councils with injurious and arrogant expressions, which were shortly followed by a corresponding conduct. For in the month of August, 1458, on the eve of St. Lorenzo, having filled the piazza, and compelled them to assent to a measure which he knew them to be averse, having recovered power, he created a new belia, and filled the principal offices according to the pleasure of a few individuals, in order to commence that government with terror which they had obtained by force. They banished Girolamo Machiavelli with some others, and deprived many of the honors of government. Girolamo, having transgressed the confines to which he was limited, was declared a rebel. Travelling about Italy with the designs of exciting the princes against his country, he was betrayed while at Lunigiana, and being brought to Florence, was put to death in prison. This government, during the eight years it continued, was violent and insupportable, for Cosimo, being now old, and through ill health unable to attend to public affairs as formerly, Florence became a prey to a small number of her own citizens. Luca Pitti, in return for the services he had performed for the Republic, was made a knight, and to be no less grateful than those who had conferred the dignity upon him, he ordered that the priors, who had hitherto been called priors of the trades, should also have a name to which they had no kind of claim and therefore called them priors of liberty. He also ordered that, as it had been customary for the gonfalier to sit upon the right hand of the rectors, he should in future take his seat in the midst of them, and that the deity might appear to participate in what had been done, public processions were made and solemn services performed, to thank him for the recovery of the government. The signory and Cosimo made Luca Pitti rich presents, and all the citizens were emulous in imitation of them, 
so that the money given amounted to no less a sum than twenty thousand ducats. He thus attained such influence that not Cosimo but himself now governed the city, and his pride so increased that he commenced two superb buildings, one in Florence, the other at Rucanio, about a mile distant, both in a style of royal magnificence, that in the city being larger than any hitherto built by a private person. To complete them, he had recourse to the most extraordinary means, for not only citizens and private individuals made him presents and supplied materials, but the mass of people of every grade also contributed. Besides this, any exiles who had committed murders, thefts, or other crimes which made them amenable to the laws, found a safe refuge within their walls, if they were able to contribute toward their decoration or completion. The other citizens, though they did not build like him, were no less violent or rapacious, so that if Florence were not harassed by external wars, she was ruined by the wickedness of her own children. During this period the wars of Naples took place. The Pope also commenced hostilities in Romagna against the Malatesti, from whom he wished to take Romino and Cesena, held by them. In these designs, and his intentions of a crusade against the Turks, was passed the pontificate of Pius II. Florence continued in disunion and disturbance. The dissensions continued among the party of Cosimo, in 1455, from the causes already related, which by his prudence, as we have also before remarked, he was enabled to tranquilize, but in the year 1464 his illness increased and he died. Friends and enemies alike grieved for his loss, for his political opponents, perceiving the rapacity of the citizens, even during the life of him who alone restrained them and made their tyranny supportable, were afraid, lest after his decease nothing but ruin would ensue. Nor had they much hope of his son Piero, who, though a very good man, was of infirm health, and new in the government, and they thought he would be compelled to give way, so that being unrestrained their rapacity would pass all bounds. On these accounts the regret was universal. Of all who have left memorials behind them, and who were not of the military profession, Cosimo was the most illustrious and the most renowned. He not only surpassed all his contemporaries in wealth and authority, but also in generosity and prudence, and among the qualities which contributed to make him a prince in his own country was his surpassing all others in magnificence and generosity. His liberality became more obvious after his death, when Piero, his son, wishing to know what he possessed, it appeared there was no citizen of any consequence to whom Cosimo had not lent a large sum of money, and often, when informed of some nobleman being in distress, he relieved him unasked. His magnificence is evident from the number of public edifices he erected, for in Florence are the convents and churches of St. Marco and St. Lorenzo, and the monastery of Santa Verdiana, in the mountains of Fiesole, the church and abbey of St. Girolamo, and in the Mugello, he not only restored, but rebuilt from its foundation, a monastery of the Frate Minori, or Minims. Besides these, in the church of Santa Croce, the Servi, the Agnoli, and in Santa Miniato, he erected splendid chapels and altars, and besides building the churches and chapels we have mentioned, he provided them with all the ornaments, furniture, and utensils suitable for the performance of divine service. To these sacred edifices are to be added his private dwellings, one in Florence, of extent and elegance adapted to so great a citizen, and four others, situated at Correggi, Fiesole, Cragiolo, and Trebio, each for size and grandeur equal to royal palaces. And as if it were not sufficient to be distinguished for magnificence of buildings in Italy alone, he erected an hospital at Jerusalem, for the reception of poor and infirm pilgrims. Although his habitations, like all his other works and actions, were quite of a regal character, and he alone was prince in Florence, still everything was so tempered with his prudence that he never transgressed the decent moderation of civil life, in his conversation, his servants, his travelling, his mode of living, and the relationships he formed, the modest demeanour of the citizen was always evident, for he was aware that a constant exhibition of pomp brings more envy upon its possessor than greater realities born without ostentation. Thus, in selecting consorts for his son, he did not seek the alliance of princes, but for Giovanni chose Corneglia degli Alessandri, and for Piero Lucrezia de Tornabuoni. He gave his granddaughters, the children of Piero, Bianca de Guglielmo de Pazzi, and Nanina to Bernardo Rucale. No one of his time possessed such an intimate knowledge of government and state affairs as himself, and hence amid such a variety of fortune, 
In a city so given to change, and among a people of such extreme inconstancy, he retained possession of the government for thirty-one years, for, being endowed with the utmost prudence, he foresaw evils at a distance, and therefore had an opportunity either of averting them, or preventing their injurious results. He thus not only vanquished domestic and civil ambition, but humbled the pride of many princes with so much fidelity and address, that whatever powers were in league with himself and his country, either overcame their adversaries, or remained uninjured by his alliance, and whoever were opposed to him, lost either their time, money, or territory. Of this the Venetians afforded a sufficient proof, who, while in league with him against Duke Filippo, were always victorious, but apart from him were always conquered, first by Filippo and then by Francesco. When they joined Alfonso against the Florentine Republic, Cosimo, by his commercial credit, so drained Naples and Venice of money, that they were glad to obtain peace upon any terms it was thought proper to grant. Whatever difficulties he had to contend with, whether within the city or without, he brought to a happy issue, at once glorious to himself and destructive to his enemies, so that civil discord strengthened his government in Florence, and war increased his power and reputation abroad. He added to the Florentine dominions the Borgo of St. Sepulcro, Montedoglio, the Casatino, and Val de Bagno. His virtue and good fortune overcame all his enemies and exalted his friends. He was born in the year 1389, on the day of the saints Cosimo and Damiano. His earlier years were full of trouble, as his exile, captivity, and personal danger fully testify, and having gone to the council of Constance with Pope John, in order to save his life, after the ruin of the latter, he was obliged to escape in disguise. But after the age of forty he enjoyed the greatest felicity, and not only those who assisted him in public business, but his agents who conducted his commercial speculations throughout Europe, participated in his prosperity. Hence many enormous fortunes took their origin in different families of Florence, as in that of the Tornabuoni, the Benci, the Portinari, and the Sassetti. Besides these, all who depended upon his advice and patronage became rich, and though he was constantly expending money in building churches and in charitable purposes, he sometimes complained to his friends that he had never been able to lay out so much in the service of God as to find the balance in his own favor, intimidating that all he had done or could do was still unequal to what the Almighty had done for him. He was of a middle stature, olive complexion, and venerable aspect, not learned but exceedingly eloquent, endowed with great natural capacity, generous to his friends, kind to the poor, comprehensive in discourse, cautious in advising, and in his speeches and replies, grave and witty. When Rinaldo degli Albizzi, at the beginning of his exile, sent to him to say, the hen had laid, he replied, she did ill to lay so far from the nest. Some other of the rebels gave him to understand they were not dreaming. He said he believed it, for he had robbed them of their sleep. When Pope Pius was endeavouring to induce the different governments to join in an expedition against the Turks, he said he was an old man, and had undertaken the enterprise of a young one. To the Venetian ambassadors, who came to Florence with those of King Alfonso to complain of the Republic, he uncovered his head, and asked them what colour it was. They said, White. He replied, It is so, and it will not be long before your senators have heads as white as mine. A few hours before his death, his wife asked him why he kept his eyes shut, and he said, To get them in the way of it. Some citizens saying to him, after his return from exile, that he injured the city, and that it was offensive to God to drive so many religious persons out of it, he replied that, It was better to injure the city than to ruin it, that two yards of rose-coloured cloth would make a gentleman, and that it required something more to direct a government than to play with a string of beads. These words gave occasion to his enemies to slander him, as a man who loved himself more than his country, and was more attached to this world than to the next. Many others of his sayings might be adduced, but we shall omit them as unnecessary. Cosimo was a friend and patron of learned men. He brought Agiripolo, a Greek by birth, and one of the most erudite of his time, to Florence, to instruct the youth in Hellenic literature. He entertained Marsilio Ficino, the reviver of the Platonic philosophy, in his own house, and being much attached to him, gave him a residence near his palace at Correggi, that he might pursue the study of letters with greater convenience, and himself have an opportunity of enjoying his company. His prudence, his great wealth, the uses to which he applied it, and his splendid style of living, caused him to be beloved and respected in Florence, and obtained for him the highest consideration, 
not only among the princes and governments of Italy, but throughout all Europe. He thus laid a foundation for his descendants, which enabled them to equal him in virtue, and greatly surpassed him in fortune, while the authority they possessed in Florence and throughout Christendom was not obtained without being merited. Toward the close of his life he suffered a great affliction, for, of his two sons, Piero and Giovanni, the latter, of whom he entertained the greatest hopes, died, and the former was so sickly as to be unable to attend either to public or private business. On being carried from one apartment to another, after Giovanni's death, he remarked to his attendants with a sigh, This is too large a house for so small a family. His great mind felt distressed at the idea that he had not extended the Florentine dominions by any valuable acquisition, and he regretted it the more, from imagining he had been deceived by Francesco Sforza, who, while Count, had promised that if he became Lord of Milan, he would undertake the conquest of Lucca for the Florentines, a design, however, that was never realized, for the Count's ideas changed upon his becoming Duke. He resolved to enjoy in peace the power he had acquired by war, and would not again encounter its fatigues and dangers, unless the welfare of his own dominions required it. This was a source of much annoyance to Cosimo, who felt he had incurred great expense and trouble for an ungrateful and perfidious friend. His bodily infirmities prevented him from attending either to public or private affairs, as he had been accustomed, and he consequently witnessed both going to decay, for Florence was ruined by her own citizens, and his fortune by his agents and children. He died, however, at the zenith of his glory, and in the enjoyment of the highest renown. The city, and all the Christian princes, condoled with his son Piero for his loss. His funeral was conducted with the utmost pomp and solemnity, the whole city following his corpse to the tomb in the church of St. Lorenzo, on which, by public decree, he was inscribed Father of his Country, if in speaking of Cosimo's actions I have rather imitated the biographies of princes than general history, it need not occasion wonder, for of so extraordinary an individual I was compelled to speak with unusual praise. Book Seven, Chapter Two of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Seven, Chapter Two. The Duke of Milan becomes Lord of Genoa. The King of Naples and the Duke of Milan endeavor to secure their dominions to their heirs. Jacopo Pincinino honorably received at Milan, and shortly afterward murdered at Naples. Fruitless endeavors of Pius II to excite Christendom against the Turks. Death of Francesco Sforza, Duke of Milan. Perfidious counsel given to Piero de' Medici by Diotisalvi Neroni. Conspiracy of Diotisalvi and others against Piero futile attempts to appease the disorders, public spectacles, projects of the conspirators against Piero de' Medici, Niccolo Fedini discloses to Piero the plots of his enemies. While Florence and Italy were in this condition, Louis the Eleventh of France was involved in very serious troubles with his barons, who, with the assistance of Francis, Duke of Brittany, and Charles, Duke of Burgundy, were in arms against him. This attack was so serious that he was unable to render further assistance to John of Anjou in his enterprise against Genoa and Naples, and standing in need of all the forces he could raise, he gave over Savona, which still remained in the power of the French, to the Duke of Milan, and also intimated that if he wished, he had his permission to undertake the conquest of Genoa. Francesco accepted the proposal, and with the influences afforded by the king's friendship, and the assistance of the Adorni, he became lord of Genoa. In acknowledgment of this benefit, he sent fifteen hundred horse into France for the king's service, under the command of Galeazzo, his eldest son. Thus Ferrando of Aragon and Francesco Sforza became the latter Duke of Lombardy and Prince of Genoa, and the former sovereign of the whole kingdom of Naples. Their families being allied by marriage, they thought they might so confirm their power as to secure to themselves its enjoyment during life, and at their deaths its unencumbered reversion to their heirs. To attain this end, they considered it necessary that the king should remove all ground of apprehension from those barons who had offended him in the war of John of Anjou, and that the duke should extirpate the adherents of the Brescesci, the natural enemies of his family, who, under Jacopo Pincinino, had attained the highest reputation. The latter was now the first general in Italy, 
and possessing no territory, he naturally excited the apprehension of all who had dominions, and especially of the duke, who, conscious of what he himself had done, thought he could neither enjoy his own estate in safety, nor leave them with any degree of security to his son during Jacopo's lifetime. The king, therefore, strenuously endeavoured to come to terms with his barons, and, using his utmost ingenuity to secure them, succeeded in his object, for they perceived their ruin to be inevitable if they continued in war with their sovereign, though from submission and confidence in him they would still have reason for apprehension. Mankind are always most eager to avoid a certain evil, and hence inferior powers are easily deceived by princes. The barons, conscious of the danger of continuing the war, trusted the king's promises, and having placed themselves in his hands, they were soon after destroyed in various ways, and under a variety of pretexts. This alarmed Jacopo Pincinino, who was with his forces at Salmuna, and to deprive the king of the opportunity of treating him similarly, he endeavoured, by the mediation of his friends, to be reconciled with the duke, who by the most liberal offers induced Jacopo to visit him at Milan, accompanied by only a hundred horse. Jacopo had served many years with his father and brother, first under Duke Filippo, and afterward under the Milanese Republic, so that by frequent intercourse with the citizens he had acquired many friends and universal popularity, which present circumstances tended to increase. For the prosperity and newly acquired power of the Sforcesi had occasioned envy, while Jacopo's misfortunes and long absence had given rise to compassion and a great desire to see him. These various feelings were displayed upon his arrival, for nearly all the nobility went to meet him. The streets through which he passed were filled with citizens, anxious to catch a glimpse of him, while shouts of, The Brescesci! The Brescesci! resounded on all sides. These honours accelerated his ruin, for the duke's apprehensions increased his desire of destroying him, and to effect this with the least possible suspicion, Jacopo's marriage with Drusiana, the duke's natural daughter, was now celebrated. The duke then arranged with Ferrando to take him into pay, with the title of captain of his forces, and give him one hundred thousand florins for his maintenance. After this agreement, Jacopo, accompanied by a ducal ambassador and his wife Drusiana, proceeded to Naples, where he was honorably and joyfully received, and for many days entertained with every kind of festivity. But having asked permission to go to Salmuna, where his forces were, the king invited him to a banquet in the castle at the conclusion of which he and his son Francesco were imprisoned, and shortly afterward put to death. It was thus our Italian princes, fearing those virtues in others which they themselves did not possess, extirpated them, and hence the country became a prey to the efforts of those by whom it was not long afterwards oppressed and ruined. At this time, Pope Pius II, having settled the affairs of Romagna, and witnessing a universal peace, thought it a suitable opportunity to lead the Christians against the Turks, and adopted measures similar to those which his predecessors had used. All the princes promised assistance either in men or money, while Matthias, king of Hungary, and Charles, duke of Burgundy, intimated their intention of joining the enterprise in person, and were by the Pope appointed leaders of the expedition. The pontiff was so full of expectation that he left Rome and proceeded to Ancona, where it had been arranged that the whole army should be assembled, and the Venetians engaged to send ships thither to convey the forces to Sclavonia. Upon the arrival of the Pope in that city, there was soon such a concourse of people, that in a few days all the provisions it contained, or that could be procured from the neighborhood, were consumed, and famine began to impend. Besides this, there was no money to provide those who were in want of it, nor arms to furnish such as were without them. Neither Matthias nor Charles made their appearance. The Venetians sent a captain with some galleys, but rather for ostentation and the sake of keeping their word, than for the purpose of conveying troops. During this position of affairs, the Pope, being old and infirm, died, and the assembled troops returned to their homes. The death of the pontiff occurred in 1465, and Paul II, of Venetian origin, was chosen to succeed him, and that nearly all the principalities of Italy might change their rulers about the same period, in the following year of Francesco Sforza, Duke of Milan, also died, having occupied the dukedom sixteen years, and Galeazzo, his son, succeeded him. The death of this prince infused redoubled energy into the Florentine dissensions, and caused them to produce more prompt effects than they would otherwise have done. Upon the demise of Cosimo, his son Piero, being heir to the wealth and government of his father, called to his assistance Diotisalvi Neroni, a man of considerable influence and the highest reputation, 
in whom Cosimo reposed so much confidence that just before his death he recommended Piero to be wholly guided by him, both with regard to the government of the city and the management of his fortune. Piero acquired Diatisalvi with the opinion Cosimo entertained of him, and said that as he wished to obey his father, though now no more, as he always had while alive, he should consult him concerning both his patrimony and the city. Beginning with his private affairs, he caused an account of all his property, liabilities, and assets to be placed in Diatisalvi's hands, that, with an entire acquaintance with the state of affairs, he might be able to afford suitable advice, and the latter promised to use the utmost care. Upon examination of these accounts the affairs were found to be in great disorder, and Diatisalvi, instigated rather by his own ambition than by attachment to Piero or gratitude to Cosimo, thought he might without difficulty deprive him of both the reputation and the splendor which his father had left him as his inheritance. In order to realize his views, he waited upon Piero, and advised him to adopt a measure which, while it appeared quite correct in itself, and suitable to existing circumstances, involved a consequence destructive to his authority. He explained the disorder of his affairs, and the large amount of money it would be necessary to provide, if he wished to preserve his influence in the state, and his reputation of wealth, and said there was no other means of remedying these disorders so just and available as to call in the sums which his father had lent to an infinite number of persons, both foreigners and citizens. For Cosimo, to acquire partisans in Florence and friends abroad, was extremely liberal of his money, and the amount of loans due him was enormous. Piero thought the advice good, because he was only desirous to repossess his own property to meet the demands to which he was liable, but as soon as he had ordered these amounts to be recalled, the citizens, as if he had asked for something to which he had no kind of claim, took great offence, loaded him with opprobrious expressions, and accused him of being avaricious and ungrateful. Diatisalvi, noticing the popular excitement against Piero, occasioned by his own advice, obtained an interview with Luca Pitti, Angelo Acciajoli, and Niccolo Soderini, and they resolved to unite their efforts to deprive him both of the government and his influence. Each was actuated by a different motive. Luca Pitti wished to take the position Cosimo had occupied, for he was now become so great that he disdained to submit to Piero. Diatisalvi Neroni, who knew Luca unfit to be at the head of a government, thought that, of necessity on Piero's removal, the whole authority of the state would devolve upon himself. Niccolo Soderini desired the city to enjoy greater liberty, and for the laws to be equally binding upon all. Agnolo Achilleagioli was greatly incensed against the Medici, for the following reasons. His son, Raffaello, had some time before married Alessandra de Bardi, and received with her a large dowry. She, either by her own fault or the misconduct of others, suffered much ill-treatment both from her father-in-law and her husband, and in consequence Lorenzo di Lirione, her kinsman, out of pity for the girl, being accompanied by several armed men, took her away from Agnolo's house. The Acliagioli complained of the injury done to them by the Bardi, and the matter was referred to Cosimo, who decided that the Acciajoli should restore to Alessandra her fortune, and then leave it to her choice either to return to her husband or not. Agnolo thought Cosimo had not, in this instance, treated him as a friend, and having been unable to avenge himself on the father, he now resolved to do his utmost to ruin the son. These conspirators, though each was influenced by a different motive from the rest, affected to have only one object in view, which was that the city should be governed by the magistrates, and not be subjected to the counsels of a few individuals. The odium against Piero, and the opportunities of injuring him, were increased by the number of merchants who failed about this time, for it was reported that he, in having quite unexpectedly to all resolved to call in his debts, had, to the disgrace and ruin of the city, caused them to become insolvent. To this was added his endeavour to obtain Clarice degli Orsini as wife of Lorenzo, his eldest son, and hence his enemies took occasion to say, it was quite clear, that as he despised a Florentine alliance, he no longer considered himself one of the people, and was preparing to make himself prince. For he who refuses his fellow-citizens as relatives desires to make them slaves, and therefore cannot expect to have them as friends. The leaders of the sedition thought that they had the victory in their power, for the greater part of the citizens followed them, deceived by the name of liberty, which they, to give their purpose a graceful covering, adopted upon their ensigns. In this agitated state of the city, some, to whom civil disorder was extremely offensive, thought it would be well to endeavour to engage men's minds with some new occupation, 
because when unemployed they are commonly led by whoever chooses to excite them. To divert their attention from matters of government, it being now a year since the death of Cosimo, it was resolved to celebrate two festivals, similar to the most solemn observed in the city. At one of them was represented the arrival of the three kings from the east, led by the star which announced the nativity of Christ, which was conducted with such pomp and magnificence that the preparations for it kept the whole city occupied many months. The other was a tournament, for so they call the exhibition of equestrian combats, in which the sons of the first families in the city took part with the most celebrated cavaliers of Italy. Among the most distinguished of the Florentine youth was Lorenzo, eldest son of Piero, who not by favor, but by his own personal valor, obtained the principal prize. When these festivals were over, the citizens reverted to the same thoughts which had previously occupied them, and each pursued his ideas with more earnestness than ever. Serious differences and troubles were the result, and these were greatly increased by two circumstances, one of which was that the authority of the Balia had expired, the other that upon the death of Duke Francesco, Galeazzo the new duke sent ambassadors to Florence, to renew the engagements of his father with the city, which, among other things, provided that every year a certain sum of money should be paid to the duke. The principal opponents of the Medici took occasion from this demand to make public resistance in the councils, on pretense that the alliance was made with Francesco and not Galeazzo, so that Francesco being dead, the obligation had ceased, nor was there any necessity to revive it, because Galeazzo did not possess his father's talents, and consequently they neither could nor ought to expect the same benefits from him, that if they had derived little advantage from Francesco, they would obtain still less from Galeazzo, and that if any citizen wished to hire him for his own purposes, it was contrary to civil rule, and inconsistent with the public liberty. Piero, on the contrary, argued that it would be very impolitic to lose such an alliance for mere avarice, and that there was nothing so important to the Republic, and to the whole of Italy, as their alliance with the Duke, that the Venetians, while they were united, could not hope, either by feigned friendship or open war, to injure the duchy, but as soon as they perceived the Florentines alienated from him, they would prepare for hostilities, and finding him young, new in the government, and without friends, they would, either by force or fraud, compel him to join them, in which case ruin of the Republic would be inevitable. The arguments of Piero were without effect, and the animosity of the parties began to be openly manifested in their nocturnal assemblies, the friends of the Medici meeting in the Crocetta, and their adversaries in the Pietà. The latter, being anxious for Piero's ruin, had induced many citizens to subscribe their names as favorable to the undertaking. Upon one occasion, particularly when considering the course to be adopted, although all agreed that the power of the Medici ought to be reduced, different opinions were given concerning the means by which it should be effected. One party, the most temperate and reasonable, held that as the authority of the Belia had ceased, they must take care to prevent its renewal. It would then be found to be the universal wish that the magistrates and council should govern the city, and in a short time Piero's power would be visibly diminished, and as a consequence of his loss of influence in the government, his commercial credit would also fail for his affairs were in such a state, that if they could prevent him from using the public money, his ruin must ensue. They would thus be in no further danger from him, and would succeed in the recovery of their liberty, without the death or exile of any individual. But if they attempted violence, they would incur great dangers, for mankind are willing to allow one who falls of himself to meet his fate, but if pushed down they would hasten to his relief, so that if they adopted no extraordinary measures against him, he would have no reason for defence or aid and if he were to seek them it would be greatly to his own injury, by creating such a general suspicion as would accelerate his ruin, and justify whatever course they might think proper to adopt. Many of the assembly were dissatisfied with this tardy method of proceeding. They thought delay would be favorable to him and injurious to themselves, for if they allowed matters to take their ordinary course, Piero would be in no danger whatever, while they themselves would incur many, for the magistrates who were opposed to him would allow him to rule the city, and his friends would make him a prince, and their own ruin would be inevitable, as happened in 1458. And though the advice they had just heard might be most consistent with good feeling, the present would be found to be the safest. That it would therefore be best, while the minds of men were yet excited against him, to effect his destruction. It must be their plan to arm themselves, and engage the assistance of the Marquis of Ferrara, that they might not be destitute of troops and, if a favourable scenery were drawn, they would be in condition to make use of them. 
They therefore determined to wait the formation of the new seigneury, and to be governed by circumstances. Among the conspirators was Niccolo Fedini, who had acted as president of their assemblies. He, being induced by most certain hopes, disclosed the whole affair to Piero, and gave him a list of those who had subscribed their names, and also of the conspirators. Piero was alarmed on discovering the number and quality of those who were opposed to him, and by the advice of his friends he resolved to make the signatories of those who were inclined to favor him. Having employed one of his most trusty confidants to carry his design into effect, he found so great a disposition to change and instability, that many who had previously set down their names among the number of his enemies, now subscribed them in his favor. 7. Chapter 3 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2, translated by an unknown translator. Book 7, Chapter 3. Niccolo Soderini, drawn Gonfalonier of Justice. Great hopes excited in consequence. The two parties take arms. The fears of the seigneury. Their conduct with regard to Piero. Piero's reply to the seigneury. Reform of government in favor of Piero de' Medici. Dispersion of his enemies. Fall of Luca Pitti. Letter of Agnolo Acciajoli to Piero de' Medici. Piero's answer. Designs of the Florentine exiles. They induce the Venetians to make war on Florence. In the midst of these events, the time arrived for the renewal of the supreme magistracy, and Niccolo Soderini was drawn gonfalonier of justice. It was surprising to see by what a concourse, not only of distinguished citizens, but also of the populace, he was accompanied to the palace, and while on the way thither an olive wreath was placed upon his head, to signify that upon him depended the safety and liberty of the city. This, among many similar instances, serves to prove how undesirable it is to enter upon office or power exciting inordinate expectations, for being unable to fulfill them, many looking for more than it is possible to perform, shame and disappointment are the ordinary results. Tommaso and Niccolo Soderini were brothers. Niccolo was the more ardent and spirited, Tommaso the wiser man, who being very much the friend of Piero, and knowing that his brother desired nothing but the liberty of the city, and the stability of the Republic, without injury to any, advised him to make new squittini, by which means the election purses might be filled with the names of those favorable to his design. Niccolo took his brother's advice, and thus wasted the period of his magistracy in vain hopes, which his friends, the leading conspirators, allowed him to do from motives of envy, for they were unwilling that the government should be reformed by the authority of Niccolo, and thought they would be in time to effect their purpose under another gonfalonier. Thus the magistracy of Niccolo expired, and having commenced many things without completing aught, he retired from office with much less credit than when he had entered upon it. This circumstance caused the aggrandizement of Piero's party, whose friends entertained stronger hopes, while those who had been neutral or wavering became his adherents, so that both sides being balanced, many months elapsed without any open demonstration of their particular designs. Piero's party continued to gather strength, his enemies' indignation increased in proportion, and they now determined to effect by force what they either could not accomplish, or were unwilling to attempt by the medium of the magistrates, which was assassination of Piero, who lay sick at Careggi, and to this end ordered the Marquis of Ferrara nearer the city with his forces, that after Piero's death he might lead them into the piazza, and thus compel the seigneury to form a government according to their own wishes. For though all might be friendly, they trusted they would be able to induce those to submit by fear, who might be opposed to them from principle. Diati Salvi, the better to conceal his design, frequently visited Piero, conversed with him respecting the union of the city, and advised him to effect it. The conspirators' designs had already been fully disclosed to Piero. Besides this, Domenico Martelli had informed him that Francesco Neroni, the brother of Diati Salvi, had endeavored to induce him to join them, assuring him that the victory was certain, and their object all but attained. Upon this, Piero resolved to take advantage of his enemy's tampering with the Marquis of Ferrara, and be first in arms. He therefore intimated that he had received a letter from Giovanni Bentivogli, Prince of Bologna, which informed him that the Marquis of Ferrara was upon the river Albo, 
at the head of a considerable force, with the avowed intention of leading it to Florence, that upon this advice he had taken up arms, after which, in the midst of a strong force, he came to the city, when all who were disposed to support him armed themselves also. The adverse party did the same, but not in such good order, being unprepared. The residence of Diati Salvi being near that of Piero, he did not think himself safe in it, but went first to the palace and begged the signory would endeavour to induce Piero to lay down his arms, and thence to Luca Pitti, to keep him faithful in their cause. Niccolo Soderini displayed the most activity, for taking arms, and being followed by nearly all the plebeians in his vicinity, he proceeded to the house of Luca, and begged that he would mount his horse and come to the plaza in support of the signory, who were, he said, favourable, and that the victory would undoubtedly be on their side, that he should not stay in the house to be basely slain by their armed enemies, or ignominiously deceived by those who were unarmed. He would soon repent of having neglected an opportunity irrecoverably lost, that if he desired the forcible ruin of Piero, he might easily effect it, and that, if he were anxious for peace, it would be far better to be in a condition to propose terms than to be compelled to accept any that might be offered. These words produced no effect upon Luca, whose mind was now quite made up. He had been induced to desert his party by new conditions and promises of alliance from Piero, for one of his nieces had been married to Giovanni Tornabuoni. He therefore advised Niccolo to dismiss his followers and return home, telling him he ought to be satisfied if the city were governed by the magistrates, which would certainly be the case, and that all ought to lay aside their weapons, for the signory, most of whom were friendly, would decide their differences. Niccolo, finding him impracticable, returned home, but before he left he said, I can do the city no good alone, but I can easily foresee the evils that will befall her. This resolution of yours will rob our country of her liberty. You will lose the government, I shall lose my property, and the rest will be exiled." During this disturbance the signory closed the palace and kept their magistrates about them, without showing favour to either party. The citizens, especially those who had followed Luca Pitti, finding Piero fully prepared and his adversaries unarmed, began to consider, not how they might injure him, but how, with least observation, glide into the ranks of his friends. The principal citizens, the leaders of both factions, assembled in the palace in the presence of the signory and spoke respecting the state of the city and the reconciliation of parties, and as the infirmities of Piero prevented him from being present, they, with one exception, unanimously determined to wait upon him at his house. Niccolo Soderini, having first placed his children and his effects under the care of his brother Tommaso, withdrew to his villa, there to await the event, but apprehended misfortune to himself and ruin to his country. The other citizens, coming into Piero's presence, one of them, who had been appointed spokesman, complained of the disturbances that had arisen in the city, and endeavoured to show that those must be most to blame who had been first to take up arms, and not knowing what Piero, who was evidently the first to do so, intended, they had come in order to be informed of his design, and if it had in view the welfare of the city, they were desirous of supporting it. Piero replied that not those who first take arms are the most to blame, but those who give the first occasion for it and if they would reflect a little on their mode of proceeding toward himself, they would cease to wonder at what he had done, for they could not fail to perceive that nocturnal assemblies, the enrollment of partisans, and attempts to deprive him both of his authority and his life, had caused him to take arms, and that they might further observe that as his forces had not quitted his own house, his design was evidently only to defend himself, and not to injure others. He neither sought nor desired anything but safety and repose, neither had his conduct ever manifested a desire for aught else, for when the authority of the Balia expired, he never made any attempt to renew it, and was very glad the magistrates had governed the city and had been content. They might also remember that Cosimo and his sons could live respected in Florence, either with the Balia or without it, and that in 1458 it was not his family but themselves who had renewed it. That if they did not wish for it at present, neither did he, but this did not satisfy them, for he perceived that they thought it impossible to remain in Florence while he was there. It was entirely beyond all his anticipations that his own or his father's friends should think themselves unsafe with him in Florence, having always shown himself quiet and peaceable. He then addressed himself to Diati Salvi and his brothers, who were present, reminding them with grave indignation of the benefits they had received from Cosimo, the confidence he had reposed in them and their subsequent ingratitude, 
and his words so strongly excited some present, that had he not interfered, they would certainly have torn the Neroni to pieces on the spot. He concluded by saying that he should approve of any determination of themselves in the scenery, and that for his own part he only desired peace and safety. After this many things were discussed, but nothing determined, excepting generally that it was necessary to reform the administration of the city and the government. The gonfalon of justice was then in the hands of Bernardo Lotti, a man not in the confidence of Piero, who was therefore disinclined to attempt aught while he was in office. But no inconvenience would result from the delay, as his magistracy was on the point of expiring. Upon the election of seniors for the months of September and October, 1466, Roberto Leone was appointed to the supreme magistracy, and as soon as he assumed its duties, every requisite arrangement having been previously made, the people were called to the piazza, and a new bellia created, wholly in favor of Piero, who soon afterward filled all the offices of government according to his own pleasure. These transactions alarmed the leaders of the opposite faction, and Agnolo Acquiagioli fled to Naples, Diato Salvi Neroni and Niccolo Soderini to Venice. Luca Pitti remained in Florence, trusting to his new relationship and the promises of Piero. The refugees were declared rebels, and all the family of the Neroni were dispersed. Giovanni di Neroni, then Archbishop of Florence, to avoid a greater evil, became a voluntary exile at Rome, and to many other citizens who fled, various places of banishment were appointed. Nor was this considered sufficient, for it was ordered that the citizens should go in solemn procession to thank God for the preservation of the government and the reunion of the city, during the performance of which some were taken and tortured, and part of them afterward put to death and exiled. In this great vicissitude of affairs, there was not a more remarkable instance of the uncertainty of fortune than Luca Pitti, who soon found the difference between victory and defeat, honor and disgrace. His house now presented only a vast solitude, where previously crowds of citizens had assembled. In the streets, his friends and relatives, instead of accompanying, were afraid even to salute him. Some of them were deprived of the honors of government, others of their property, and all alike threatened. The superb edifices he had commenced were abandoned by the builders. The benefits that had been conferred upon him were now exchanged for injuries, the honors for disgrace. Hence many of those who had presented him with articles of value now demanded them back again, as being only lent, and those who had been in the habit of extolling him as a man of surpassing excellence now termed him a violent and ungrateful. So that, when too late, he regretted not having taken the advice of Niccolo Soderini, and preferred an honorable death in battle, than to a life of ignominy among his victorious enemies. The exiles now began to consider various means of recovering that citizenship which they had not been able to preserve. However, Agnolo Acciajoli, being at Naples, before he attempted anything else, resolved to sound Piero, and try if he could effect a reconciliation. For this purpose he wrote to him in the following terms, I cannot help laughing at the freaks of fortune, perceiving how at her pleasure she converts friends into enemies and enemies into friends. You may remember that during your father's exile, regarding more the injury done to him than my own misfortunes, I was banished and in danger of death, and never during Cosimo's life failed to honor and support your family. Neither have I since his death ever entertained a wish to injure you. True it is that your own sickness, and the tender years of your sons, so alarmed me, that I judged it desirable to give such a form to the government, that after your death our country might not be ruined, and hence the proceedings, which, not against you, but for the safety of the state, have been adopted, which, if mistaken, will surely obtain forgiveness, both for the good design in view, and on account of my former services. Neither can I apprehend that your house, having found me so long faithful, should now prove unmerciful, or that you could cancel the impression of so much merit for so small a fault. Piero replied, Your laughing in your present abode is the cause why I do not weep, for were you to laugh in Florence, I should have to weep at Naples. I confess you were well disposed towards my father, and you ought to confess you were well paid for it, and the obligation is so much the greater on your part than on ours, as deeds are of greater value than words. Having been recompensed for your good wishes, it ought not to surprise you that you now receive the due reward of your bad ones. Neither will a pretense of your patriotism excuse you, for none will think the city less beloved or benefited by the Medici than by the Acciajoli. 
It therefore seems but just that you should remain in dishonor at Naples, since you knew not how to live with honor at home. Agnolo, hopeless of obtaining pardon, went to Rome, where joining the archbishop and other refugees, they used every available means to injure the commercial credit of the Medici in that city. Their attempts greatly annoyed Piero, but by his friend's assistance he was enabled to render them abortive. Diotti Salvi, Neroni, and Niccolo Soderini strenuously urged the Venetian Senate to make war upon their country, calculating that, in case of an attack, the government, being new and unpopular, would be unable to resist. At this time there resided at Ferrara Giovanni Francesco, son of Palla Strozzi, who with his father was banished from Florence in the changes of 1434. He possessed great influence, and was considered one of the richest merchants. The newly banished pointed out to Giovanni Francesco how easily they might return to their country, if the Venetians were to undertake the enterprise, and that it was most probable they would do so, if they had pecuniary assistance, but that otherwise it would be doubtful. Giovanni Francesco, wishing to avenge his own injuries, at once fell in with their ideas, and promised to contribute to the success of the attempt all the means in his power. On this they went to the Doge, and complained of the exile they were compelled to endure, for no other reason, they said, than for having wished their country should be subject to equal laws, and that the magistrates should govern not a few private individuals, that Piero de' Medici, with his adherents, who were accustomed to act tyrannically, had secretly taken up arms, deceitfully induced them to lay their own aside, and thus by fraud expelled them from their country that not content with this, they made the Almighty himself a means of oppression to several, who, trusting to their promises, had remained in the city and were there betrayed. For during public worship and solemn supplications, that the deity might seem to participate in their treachery, many citizens had been seized, imprisoned, tortured, and put to death, thus affording to the world a horrible and impious precedent. To avenge themselves for these injuries, they knew not where to turn with so much hope of success as to the Senate, which, having always enjoyed their liberty, ought to compassionate those who had lost it. They therefore called upon them as free men to assist them against tyrants, as pious against the wicked, and would remind the Venetians that it was the family of the Medici who had robbed them of their dominions in Lombardy, contrary to the wish of the other citizens, and who, in opposition to the interests of the Senate, had favoured and supported Francesco, so that if the exiles' distresses could not induce them to undertake the war, the just indignation of the people of Venice, and their desire of vengeance ought to prevail. Book Seven, Chapter Four of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Seven, Chapter Four. War between the Venetians and the Florentines. Peace re-established. Death of Niccolo Soderini. His character. Excesses in Florence. Various external events from 1468 to 1471. Accession of Sixtus the Fourth. His character. Grief of Piero de' Medici for the violence committed in Florence. His speech to the principal citizens. Plans of Piero de' Medici for the restoration of order his death in character. Tommaso Soderini, a citizen of great reputation, declares himself in favor of the Medici. Disturbances at Prato occasioned by Bernardo Nardi. The concluding words of the Florentine exiles produced the utmost excitement among the Venetian senators, and they resolved to send Bernardo Coglione to attack the Florentine territory. The troops were assembled and joined by Ercole da Esti, who had been sent by Borgo, Marquis of Ferrara. At the commencement of hostilities, the Florentines not being prepared, their enemies burned the Borgo of Davadola and plundered the surrounding country. But having expelled the enemies of Piero, renewed their league with Galeazzo, Duke of Milan, and Ferrando, King of Naples. They appointed to the command of their forces Federigo, Count of Urbino, and being thus on good terms with their friends, their enemies occasioned them less anxiety. Ferrando sent Alfonso, his eldest son, to their aid, and Galeazzo came in person, each at the head of a suitable force, and all assembled at Castrocaro, a fortress belonging to the Florentines, and situated among the roots of the Apennines, which descend from Tuscany to Romagna. In the meantime the enemy withdrew toward Imola. 
A few slight skirmishes took place between the armies, yet in accordance with the custom of the times, neither of them acted on the offensive, besieged any town, or gave the other an opportunity of coming to a general engagement. But each kept within their tents, and conducted themselves with most remarkable cowardice. This occasioned general dissatisfaction among the Florentines, for they found themselves involved in an expensive war, from which no advantage could be derived. The magistrates complained of these spiritless proceedings to those who had been appointed commissaries to the expedition, but they replied that the entire evil was chargeable upon the Duke Galeazzo, who, possessing great authority and little experience, was unable to suggest useful measures, and unwilling to take the advice of those who were more capable, and therefore any demonstration of courage or energy would be impracticable so long as he remained with the army. Hereupon the Florentines intimated to the Duke that his presence with the force was in many ways advantageous and beneficial, and of itself sufficient to alarm the enemy. But they considered his own safety and that of his dominions much more important than their own immediate convenience, because so long as the former were safe, the Florentines had nothing to fear, and all would go well, but if his dominions were to suffer, they might then apprehend all kinds of misfortune. They assured him that they did not think it prudent for him to be absent so long from Milan, having recently succeeded to the government, and being surrounded by many powerful enemies and suspected neighbors, while any who were desirous of plotting against him had opportunity of doing so with impunity. They would, therefore, advise him to return to his territories, leaving part of his troops with them for the use of the expedition. This advice pleased Galeazzo, who in consequence immediately withdrew to Milan. The Florentine generals, now being left without any hindrance, to show the cause assigned for their inaction was the true one, pressed the enemy more closely, so that they came to a regular engagement, which continued half a day, without either party yielding. Some horses were wounded and prisoners taken, but no death occurred. Winter having arrived, and with it the usual time for armies to retire into quarters, Bartolomeo Coglione withdrew to Ravenna, the Florentine forces into Tuscany, and those of the king and duke, each to the territories of their sovereign. As this attempt had not occasioned any tumult in Florence, contrary to the rebels' expectation, and the troops they had hired were in want of pay, terms of peace were proposed, and easily arranged. The revolted Florentines, thus deprived of hope, dispersed themselves in various places. Diati Salvi Nerona withdrew to Ferrara, where he was received and entertained by the Marquis Borso. Niccolo Soderini went to Ravenna, where upon a small pension allowed by the Venetians he grew old and died. He was considered a just and brave man, but over-cautious and slow to determine, a circumstance which occasioned him, when Gonfalonie of Justice, to lose the opportunity of victory which he would have gladly recovered when too late. Upon the restoration of peace, those who remained victorious in Florence, as if unable to convince themselves that they had conquered, they had conquered, unless they oppressed not merely their own enemies, but all whom they suspected, prevailed upon Bardo Altaviti, then Gonfalonier of Justice, to deprive many of the honors of government, and to banish several more. They exercised their power so inconsiderately, and conducted themselves in such an arbitrary manner, that it seemed as if fortune and the Almighty had given up the city to them for a prey. Piero knew little of these things, and was unable to remedy even the little he knew, on account of his infirmities, his body being so contracted that he could use no faculty but that of speech. All he could do was to admonish the leading men, and beg they would conduct themselves with greater moderation, and not by their violence affect the country's ruin. In order to divert the city, he resolved to celebrate the marriage of his son Lorenzo with Clarice degli Orsini with great splendor, and it was accordingly solemnized with all the displays suitable to the exalted rank of the parties. Feasts, dancing, and antique representations occupied many days, at the conclusion of which, to exhibit the grandeur of the House of Medici and of the government, two military spectacles were presented, one performed by men on horseback, who went through the evolutions of a field engagement, and the other representing the storming of a town, everything being conducted with admirable order and the greatest imaginable brilliancy. During these transactions in Florence, the rest of Italy, though at peace, was filled with apprehensions of the power of the Turks, who continued to attack the Christians and had taken Negropont, to the great disgrace and injury of the Christian name. About this time died Borso, Marquis of Ferrara, who was succeeded by his brother Ercol. Gismondo da Remini, the inveterate enemy of the Church, also expired, and his natural brother Roberto, 
who was afterwards one of the best generals of Italy, succeeded him. Pope Paul died, and was succeeded by Sixtus IV, previously called Francesco de Savona, a man of the very lowest origin, who by his talents had become general of the order of St. Francis, and afterward cardinal. He was the first who began to show how far a pope might go, and how much that which was previously regarded as sinful lost its iniquity when committed by a pontiff. Among others of his family were Piero and Girolamo, who, according to universal belief, were his sons, though he designated them by terms reflecting less scandal on his character. Piero, being a priest, was advanced to the dignity of a cardinal, with the title of St. Sixtus. To Girolamo he gave the city of Furli, taken from Antonio Ordolafi, whose ancestors held that territory for many generations. This ambitious method of procedure made him more regarded by the princes of Italy, and all sought to obtain his friendship. The Duke of Milan gave his natural daughter Caterina to Girolamo, with the city of Imola, which he had taken from Taddeo degli Alidasi as her portion. New matrimonial alliances were formed between the Duke and the King, Ferrando, Elisabetta, daughter of Alfonso, the King's eldest son, being united to Giovan Galeazzo, the eldest son of the Duke. Italy being at peace, the principal employment of her princes was to watch each other, and strengthen their own influence by new alliances, leagues, or friendships. But in the midst of this repose, Florence endured great opposition from her principal citizens, and the infirmities of Piero incapacitated him from restraining their ambition. However, to relieve his conscience, and if possible to make them ashamed of their conduct, he sent for them to his house, and addressed them in the following words. I never thought a time would come when the behavior of my friends would compel me to esteem and desire the society of my enemies and I wished that I had been defeated rather than victorious, for I believed myself to be associated with those who would set some bounds to their avarice, and who, after having avenged themselves on their enemies, and lived in their country with security and honor, would be satisfied. But now I find myself greatly deceived, unacquainted with the ambition of mankind, and least of all with yours, for not satisfied with being masters of so great a city, and possessing among yourselves those honors, dignities, and emoluments, which used to be divided among many citizens, not contented with having shared among a few the property of your enemies, or with being able to oppress all others with public burdens, while you yourselves are exempt from them, and enjoy all the public offices of profit, you must still further load every one with ill usage. You plunder your neighbors of their wealth, you sell justice, you evade the law, you oppress the timid and exalt the insolent. Nor is there, throughout all Italy, so many and such shocking examples of violence and avarice as in this city. Has our country fostered us only to be her destroyer? Have we been victorious only to effect her ruin? Has she honored us that we may overwhelm her with disgrace? Now, by that faith which is binding upon all good men, I promise you, that if you still conduct yourselves so as to make me regret my victory, I will adopt such measures as shall cause you bitterly to repent of having misused it. The reply of the citizens accorded with the time and the circumstances, but they did not forgo their evil practices, so that in consequence Piero sent for Agnolo Acciajoli to come secretly to Cafagiolo, and discussed with him at great length the condition of the city, and doubtless, had he not been prevented by death, he would have called home the exiles as a check upon the rapine of the opposite party. But these honorable designs were frustrated, for sinking under bodily infirmities and mental anguish, he expired in the fifty-third year of his age. His goodness and virtue were not duly appreciated by his country, principally from his having, until almost the close of his life, being associated with Cosimo, and the few years he survived being spent in civil discord and constant debility. Piero was buried in the church of St. Lorenzo near his father, and his obsequies were performed with all pomp and solemnity due to his exalted station. He left two sons, Lorenzo and Giuliano, whose extreme youth excited alarm in the minds of thinking men, though each gave hopes of future usefulness to the Republic. Among the principal citizens in the government of Florence, and very superior to the rest, was Tommaso Soderini, whose prudence and authority were well known not only at home, but throughout Italy. After Piero's death, the whole city looked up to him. Many citizens waited upon him at his own house, as the head of the government, and several princes addressed him by letter, but he, impartially estimating his own fortune and that of the house of Medici, made no reply to the prince's communications, and told the citizens it was not his house, but that of the Medici they ought to visit. 
To demonstrate by his actions the sincerity and integrity of his advice, he assembled all the heads of noble families in the convent of St. Antonio, whither he also brought Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici, and in a long and serious speech upon the state of the city, the condition of Italy, and the views of her princes, he assured them that if they wished to live in peace and unity in Florence, free both from internal dissensions and foreign wars, it would be necessary to respect the sons of Piero and support the reputation of their house for men never regret their continuance in a course sanctioned by custom, while new methods are soon adopted and as speedily set aside, and it has always been found easier to maintain a power, which by its continuance has outlived envy, than to raise a new one, which innumerable unforeseen causes may overthrow. When Tommaso had concluded, Lorenzo spoke, and though young, with such modesty and discretion, that all present felt a presentiment of his becoming what he afterward proved to be, and before the citizens departed they swore to regard the youths as their sons, and the brothers promised to look upon them as their parents. After this Lorenzo and Giuliano were honoured as princes, and resolved to be guided by the advice of Tommaso Soderini. While profound tranquillity prevailed both at home and abroad, no wars disturbing the general repose, there arose an unexpected disturbance, which came like a presage of future evils. Among the ruined families of the party of Luca Pitti, was that of the Nardi, for Salvestro and his brothers, the heads of the house, were banished and afterwards declared rebels for having taken part in the war under Bartolomeo Coglione. Bernardo, the brother of Salvestro, was young, prompt, and bold, and on account of his poverty, being unable to alleviate the sorrows of exile, while the peace extinguished all hopes of his return to the city, he determined to attempt some means of rekindling the war, for a trifling commencement often produces great results and men more readily prosecute what is already begun than originate new enterprises. Bernardo had many acquaintances at Prado, and still more in the district of Pistoia, particularly among the Palandra, a family which, though rustic, was very numerous, and, like the rest of the Pistolesi, brought up to slaughter and war. These he knew to be discontented, on account of the Florentine magistrates having endeavoured, perhaps too severely, to check their partiality for inveterate feuds and consequent bloodshed. He was also aware that the people of Prado considered themselves injured by the pride and avarice of their governors, and that some were ill-disposed toward Florence. Therefore, all things considered, he hoped to be able to kindle a fire in Tuscany, should Prado rebel, which would be fostered by so many, that those who might wish to extinguish it would fail in the attempt. He communicated his ideas to Diotti Salvi Neroni, and asked him, in case they should succeed in taking possession of Prato, what assistance might be expected from the princes of Italy by his means. Diotti Salvi considered the enterprise as eminently dangerous, and almost impracticable, but since it presented a fresh chance of attaining his object at the risk of others, he advised him to proceed, and promised certain assistance from Bologna and Ferrara, if he could retain Prato not less than fifteen days. Bernardo, whom this promise inspired with a lively hope of success, proceeded secretly to Prato, and communicated with those most disposed to favour him, among whom were the Palandra, and having arranged the time and plan, informed Diotti Salvi of what had been done. Book Seven, Chapter Five of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Seven, Chapter Five. Bernardo takes possession of Prato, but is not assisted by the inhabitants. He is taken and the tumult appeased. Corruption of Florence, the Duke of Milan in Florence, the Church of Santo Spirito destroyed by fire, the rebellion of Volterra and the cause of it. Volterra reduced to obedience by force, in accordance with the advice of Lorenzo de' Medici. Volterra pillaged. Cesare Petrucci held the office of provost of Prato for the Florentine people, at this period. It is customary with governors of towns, similarly situated, to keep the keys of the gates near their persons, and when in peaceful times they are required by any of the inhabitants, for entrance or exit, they are usually allowed to be taken. Bernardo was aware of this custom, and, about daybreak, presented himself at the gate which looks toward Pistoia, accompanied by the Palandra and about one hundred persons, all armed. 
Their confederates within the town also armed themselves, and one of them asked the governor for the keys, alleging as a pretext that some one from the country wished to enter. The governor, not entertaining the slightest suspicion, sent a servant with them. When at a convenient distance they were taken by the conspirators, who, opening the gates, introduced Bernardo and his followers. They divided themselves into two parties, one of which, led by Salvestro, an inhabitant of Prado, took possession of the citadel, and the other, following Bernardo, seized the palace, and placed Cesare with all his family in the custody of some of their number. They then raised the cry of liberty, and proceeded through the town. It was now day, and many of the inhabitants, hearing the disturbance, ran to the piazza, where, learning that the fortress and the palace were taken, and the governor with all his people made prisoners, they were utterly astonished, and could not imagine how it had occurred. The eight citizens, possessing the supreme authority, assembled in their palace to consider what was best to be done. In the meantime, Bernardo and his followers, on going round the town, found no encouragement, and being told that the eight had assembled, went and declared the nature of their enterprise, which he said was to deliver the country from slavery, reminding them how glorious it would be for those who took arms to effect such an honorable object, for they would thus obtain permanent repose and everlasting fame. He called to recollection their ancient liberty and present condition, and assured them of certain assistance, if they would only for a few days aid in resisting the forces the Florentines might send against them. He said he had friends in Florence who would join them as soon as they found the inhabitants resolved to support him. His speech did not produce the desired effect upon the eight, who replied that they knew not whether Florence was free or enslaved, for that was a matter which they were not called upon to decide, but this they knew very well, that for their own part they desired no other liberty than to obey the magistrates who governed Florence, from whom they had never received any injury sufficient to make them desire a change. They therefore advised him to set the governor at liberty, clear the palace of his people, and as quickly as possible withdraw from the danger he had so rashly incurred. Bernardo was not daunted by these words, but determined to try whether fear could influence the people of Prado, since entreaties produced so little effect. In order to terrify them, he determined to put Cesare to death, and having brought him out of prison, ordered him to be hanged at the windows of his palace. He was already led to the spot with a halter around his neck, when seeing Bernardo giving directions to hasten his end, he turned to him, and said, Bernardo, you put me to death, thinking that the people of Prado will follow you but the direct contrary will result, for the respect they have for the rectors which the Florentine people sent here is so great, that as soon as they witness the injury inflicted upon me, they will conceive such a disgust against you as will inevitably affect your ruin. Therefore it is not by my death, but by the preservation of my life, that you can attain the object you have in view, for if I deliver your commands, they will be much more readily obeyed, and following your directions we shall soon attain the completion of your design." Bernardo, whose mind was not fertile in expedients, thought the advice good, and commanded Cesare, on being conducted to a veranda which looked upon the piazza, to order the people of Prado to obey him, and having done which, Cesare was led back to prison. The weakness of the conspirators was obvious, and many Florentines residing in the town assembled together, among whom Giorgio Ginori, a knight of Rhodes, took arms first against them, and attacked Bernardo, who traversed the piazza, alternately entreating and threatening those who refused to obey him, and being surrounded by Giorgio's followers, he was wounded and made prisoner. This being done, it was easy to set the governor at liberty and subdue the rest, who, being few, and divided into several parties, were nearly all either secured or slain. An exaggerated report of these transactions reached Florence, it being told there that Prado was taken, the governor and his friends put to death, and the place filled with the enemy— and that Pistoia was also in arms, and most of the citizens in the conspiracy. In consequence of this alarming account, the palace quickly filled with citizens, who consulted with the seniory what course ought to be adopted. At this time, Roberto do San Severino, one of the most distinguished generals of this period, was at Florence, and it was determined, therefore, to send him, with what forces could be collected, to Prado, with orders that he should approach the palace, particularly observe what was going on, and provide such remedies as the necessity of the case and his own prudence should suggest. Roberto had scarcely passed the fortress of Campi, when he was met by a messenger from the governor, who informed him that Bernardo was taken, his followers either dispersed or slain, and everything restored to order. He consequently returned to Florence, whither Bernardo was shortly after conveyed, 
and when questioned by the magistracy concerning the real motives of such a weak conspiracy, he said he had undertaken it, because having resolved to die in Florence rather than live in exile, he wished his death to be accompanied by some memorable action. The disturbance having been raised and quelled almost at the same time, the citizens returned to their accustomed mode of life, hoping to enjoy without anxiety the state they had now established and confirmed. Hence arose many of those evils which usually result from peace, for the youth, having become more dissolute than before, more extravagant in dress, feasting, and other licentiousness, and being without employment, wasted their time and means on gaming and women, their principal study being how to appear splendid in apparel, and attain a crafty shrewdness in discourse, he who could make the most poignant remark being considered the wisest, and being most respected. These manners derived additional encouragement from the followers of the Duke of Milan, who with his duchess and the whole ducal court, as it was said, to fulfil a vow, came to Florence, where he was received with all the pomp and respect due to so great a prince, and one so intimately connected with the Florentine people. Upon this occasion the city witnessed an unprecedented exhibition, for during Lent, when the church commands us to abstain from animal food, the Milanese, without respect for either God or his church, ate daily of it. Many spectacles were exhibited in honor of the duke, and among others, in the temple of Santo Spirito, was represented the descent of the Holy Ghost among the apostles, and in consequence of the numerous fires used upon the occasion, some of the woodwork became ignited, and the church was completely destroyed by the flames. Many thought that, the Almighty being offended at our misconduct, took this method of signifying his displeasure. If, therefore, the Duke found the city full of courtly delicacies, and customs unsuitable to well-regulated conduct, he left it in a much worse state. Hence the good citizens thought it necessary to restrain these improprieties, and made a law to put a stop to extravagance in dress, feasts, and funerals. In the midst of this universal peace, a new and unexpected disturbance arose in Tuscany. Certain citizens of Volterra had discovered an alum mine in their district, and being aware of the profit derivable from it, in order to obtain the means of working and securing it, they applied to some Florentines, and allowed them to share in the profits. This, as is frequently the case with new undertakings, at first excited little attention from the people of Volterra, but in time, finding the profits derived from it had become considerable, they fruitlessly endeavoured to effect what at first might have been easily accomplished. They began by agitating the question in their councils, declaring it grossly improper that a source of wealth discovered in the public land should be converted to the emolument of private individuals. They next sent advocates to Florence, and the question was referred to the consideration of certain citizens, who either through being bribed by the party in question, or from a sincere conviction, declared the aim of the people of Volterra to be unjust in desiring to deprive their citizens of the fruit of their labor, and decided that the alum pit was the rightful property of those who had hitherto wrought it, but at the same time recommended them to pay an annual sum by way of acknowledgment to the city. This answer, instead of abating, served only to increase the animosities and tumult in Volterra, and absorbed the entire attention both in the councils and throughout the city, the people demanding restitution of what they considered their due, and the proprietors insisting upon their right to retain what they had originally acquired, and what had been subsequently confirmed to them by the decision of the Florentines. In the midst of these disturbances, a respectable citizen, named Il Picorino, was killed, together with several others, who had embraced the same side, whose houses were also plundered and burned, and the fury of the mob rose to such a height that they were with difficulty restrained from putting the Florentine rectors to death. After the first outrage, the Volterrani immediately determined to send ambassadors to Florence, who intimated that if the seigneury would allow them their ancient privileges, the city would remain subject to them as formerly. Many and various were the opinions concerning the reply to be made, Tommaso Soderini advised that they should accept the submission of the people of Volterra, upon any conditions with which they were disposed to make it, for he considered it unreasonable and unwise to kindle a flame so near home that it might burn their own dwelling. He suspected the Pope's ambition, and was apprehensive of the power of the king. Nor could he confide in the friendship either of the Duke or the Venetians, having no assurance of the sincerity of the latter, or the valour of the former. He concluded by quoting that trite proverb, Meglio an macro accordo che una grassa vittoria. A lean peace is better than a fat victory. On the other hand, Lorenzo de' Medici, thinking this an opportunity for exhibiting his prudence and wisdom, 
and being strenuously supported by those who envy the influence of Tommaso Sodorini, resolved to march against them, and punish the arrogance of the people of Volterra with arms, declaring that if they were not made a striking example, others would, without the least fear or respect, upon every slight occasion, adopt a similar course. The enterprise being resolved on, the Volterrani were told that they could not demand the observance of conditions which they themselves had broken, and therefore must either submit to the direction of the seigneury or expect war. With this answer they returned to their city, and prepared for its defence, fortifying the place, and sending to all the princes of Italy to request assistance, none of whom listened to them, except the Sienese and the lord of Piombino, who gave them some hope of aid. The Florentines, on the other hand, thinking success dependent principally on celerity, assembled ten thousand foot and two thousand horse, who, under the command of Federigo, lord of Urbino, marched into the country of Volterra, and quickly took entire possession of it. They then encamped before the city, which, being in a lofty situation, and precipitous on all sides, could only be approached by a narrow pass near the church of St. Alessandro. The Volterrani had engaged for their defence about one thousand mercenaries, who, perceiving the great superiority of the Florentines, found the place untenable, and were tardy in their defensive operations, but indefatigable in the constant injuries they committed upon the people of the place. Thus the poor citizens were harassed by the enemy without, and by their own soldiery within. So, despairing of their safety, they began to think of a capitulation, and being unable to obtain better terms, submitted to the discretion of the Florentine commissaries, who ordered the gates to be opened, and introduced the greater part of their forces. They then proceeded to the palace, and commanded the priors to retire to their homes, and on the way thither one of them was in derision stripped by the soldiers. From this beginning, so much more easily are men predisposed to evil than to good, originated the pillage and destruction of the city, which for a whole day suffered the greatest horrors, neither women nor sacred places being spared, and the soldiery, those engaged for its defence as well as its assailants, plundered all that came within their reach. The news of this victory was received with great joy at Florence, and as the expedition had been undertaken wholly by the advice of Lorenzo, he acquired great reputation. Upon which one of the intimate friends of Tommaso Soderini, reminding him of the advice he had given, asked him what he thought of the taking of Volterra, to which he replied, To me the place seems rather lost than won, for had it been received on equitable terms, advantage and security would have been the result, but having to retain it by force, it will, in critical junctures, occasion weakness and anxiety, and in times of peace, injury and expense. End of Book 5 Ch Book 7, Chapter 6 of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2, translated by an unknown translator. Book 7, Chapter 6 Origin of the Animosity Between Sixtus IV and Lorenzo de' Medici Carlo de Braccio de Perugia attacks the Sienese. Carlo retires by desire of the Florentines. Conspiracy against Galeazzo, Duke of Milan, his vices, he is slain by the conspirators, their deaths. The Pope, anxious to retain the territories of the Church in obedience, had caused Spoleto to be sacked for having, through internal factions, fallen into rebellion. Sitia de Castello, being in the same state of contumacy, he besieged that place, and Niccolo Vitelli, its prince, being on intimate terms with Lorenzo de' Medici, obtained assistance from him which, though inadequate, was quite enough to originate that enmity between Sixtus IV and the Medici, afterward productive of such unhappy results. Nor would this have been so long in development had not the death of Frate Piero, Cardinal of St. Sixtus, taken place, who, after having traveled over Italy and visited Venice and Milan, under the pretense of doing honor to the marriage of Ercole, Marquis of Ferrara, went about sounding the minds of the princes, to learn how they were disposed towards the Florentines. But upon his return he died, not without suspicion of having been poisoned by the Venetians, who found that they would have 
reason to fear Sixtus if he were allowed to avail himself of the talents and exertions of Frate Piero. Although of very low extraction and meanly brought up within the walls of a convent, he had no sooner attained the distinction of the scarlet hat than he exhibited such inordinate pride and ambition that the pontificate seemed too little for him, and he gave a feast in Rome which would have seemed extraordinary even for a king, the expense exceeding twenty thousand florins. Deprived of this minister, the designs of Sixtus proceeded with less promptitude. The Florentines, the Duke, and the Venetians, having renewed their league, and allowed the Pope and the King to join them if they thought proper. The two latter also entered into a league, reserving an opening for the others if they were desirous to become parties to it. Italy was thus divided into two factions, for circumstances daily arose which occasioned ill-feeling between the two leagues, as occurred with respect to the island of Cyprus, to which Ferrando laid claim and the Venetians occupied. Thus the Pope and the King became more closely united. Federigo, Prince of Urbino, was at this time one of the first generals of Italy, and had long served the Florentines. In order, if possible, to deprive the hostile league of their captain, the Pope advised, and the King re requested him to pay a visit to them. To the surprise and displeasure of the Florentines, Federigo complied, for they thought the same fate awaited him as had befallen Niccolo Piccinino. However, the result was quite different, for he returned from Naples and Rome greatly honored, and with the appointment of general to their forces. They also endeavored to gain over to their interests the lords of Romagna and the Sienese, that they might more easily injure the Florentines, who, becoming aware of these things, used their utmost endeavors to defend themselves against the ambition of their enemies and having lost Federigo de Urbino, they engaged Roberto da Rimino in his place, renewed the league with the Perugini, and formed one with the prince of Finza. The pope and the king assigned, as the reason of their animosity against the Florentines, that they wished to withdraw them from the Venetian alliance, and associate them with their own league, for the pope did not think the church could maintain her reputation, nor the count Girolamo retained the states of Romagna, while the Florentines and the Venetians remained united. The Florentines conjectured their design was to set them at enmity with the Venetians, not so much for the sake of gaining their friendship, as to be able the more easily to injure them. Two years passed away in these jealousies and discontents, before any disturbance broke out. But the first which occurred, and that but trivial, took place in Tuscany. Braccio of Perugia, whom we have frequently mentioned as one of the most distinguished warriors of Italy, left two sons, Odo and Carlo. The latter was of tender years. The former, as above related, was slain by the people of Val di Lamona. But Carlo, when he came to mature age, was, by the Venetians, out of respect for the memory of his father and the hopes they entertained from himself, received among the condottieri of their republic. The term of his engagement having expired, he did not design to renew it immediately, but resolved to try if, by his own influence and his father's reputation, he could recover possession of Perugia. To this the Venetians willingly consented, for they usually extended their dominion by any changes that occurred in the neighboring states. Carlo consequently came into Tuscany, but found more difficulties in his attempt upon Perugia than he had anticipated on account of its being allied with the Florentines, and desirous of doing something worthy of memory, he made war upon the Sienese, alleging them to be indebted to him for services performed by his father in the affairs of that republic, and attacked them with such impetuosity as to threaten the total overthrow of their dominion. The Sienese, ever ready to suspect the Florentines, persuaded themselves that this outrage had been committed with their cognizance, and made heavy complaints to the Pope and the King against them. They also sent ambassadors to Florence to complain of the injuries they had suffered, and adroitly intimated that if Carlo had not been secretly supported, he could not have made war upon them with such perfect security. The Florentines denied all participation in the proceedings of Carlo, and expressed their most earnest wish to do everything in their power to put a stop to them, 
and allowed the ambassadors to use whatever terms they pleased in the name of the Signori, to command him to, to desist. Carlo complained that the Florentines, by their unwillingness to support him, had deprived themselves of a most valuable acquisition, and him of great glory, for he could have ensured them the possession of the whole territory in a short time, from the want of courage in the people, and the ineffectual provision they had made for their defense. He then withdrew to his engagement under the Venetians, but the Sienese, although delivered from such imminent peril by the Florentines, were still very indignant against them, considering themselves under no obligation to those who had delivered them from an evil to which they had first exposed them. While the transactions between the king and the pope were in progress, and those in Tuscany, in the manner we have related, an event of greater importance occurred in Lombardy. Cola Montano, a learned and ambitious man, taught the Latin language to the youth of the principal families in Milan either out of hatred to the character and manners of the duke, or from some other cause, he constantly deprecated the condition of those who live under a bad prince, calling them glorious and happy, who had the good fortune to be born and live in a republic. He endeavored to show that the most celebrated men had been produced in republics, and not reared under princes, that the former cherish virtue, while the latter destroy it, the one deriving advantage from virtuous men, while the latter naturally fear them. The youths with whom he was most intimate were Giovanni Andrea Lampognano, Carlo Visconti, and Girolamo Ogliato. He frequently discussed with them the faults of their prince, and the wretched condition of those who were subject to him, and, by constantly inculcating his principles, acquired such an ascendancy over their minds as to induce them to bind themselves by oath to effect the duke's destruction, as soon as they had become old enough to attempt it. Their minds being fully occupied with this design, which grew with their years, the duke's conduct and their own private injuries served to hasten its execution. Galeazzo was licentious and cruel, of both which vices he had given such repeated proofs that he became odious to all. Not content with corrupting the wives of the nobility, he also took pleasure in making it notorious, nor was he satisfied with murdering individuals unless he effected their deaths by some unusual cruelty. He was suspected of having destroyed his own mother, for, not considering himself prince while she was present, he conducted himself in such a manner as induced her to withdraw from his court, and, travelling towards Cremona, which she obtained as part of her marriage portion, she was seized with a sudden illness and died upon the road which made many think her son had caused her death. The duke had dishonored both Carlo and Girolamo in respect to their wives or other female relatives, and had refused to concede to Giovanni Andrea possession of the monastery of Miramondo, of which he had obtained a grant from the Pope for a near relative. These private injuries increased the young men's desire for vengeance, and the deliverance of their country from so many evils, trusting that, Whenever they should succeed in destroying the duke, many of the nobility and all of the people would rise in their defense. Being resolved upon their undertaking, they were often together, which, on account of their long intimacy, did not excite any suspicion. They frequently discussed the subject, and in order to familiarize their minds with the deed itself, they practiced striking each other in the breast and in the side with the sheathed daggers intended to be used for the purpose. On considering the most suitable time and place, the castle seemed insecure. During the chase, uncertain and dangerous, while going about the city for his own amusement, difficult if not impracticable, and at a banquet of doubtful result. They therefore determined to kill him upon the occasion of some procession or public festivity, when there would be no doubt of his presence, and where they might, under various pretexts, assemble their friends. It was also resolved that if one of their number was prevented from attending, on any account whatever, the rest should put him to death in the midst of their armed enemies. It was now the close of the year, 1476, near Christmas, and as it was customary for the Duke to go about on St. Stephen's Day, in great solemnity, to the church of that martyr, 
they considered this the most suitable opportunity for the execution of their design. Upon the morning of that day they ordered some of their most trusty friends and servants to arm, telling them they wished to go to the assistance of Giovanni Andrea, who, contrary to the wish of some of his neighbors, intended to turn a watercourse into his estate, but that before they went they wished to take leave of the prince. They also assembled, under various pretenses, other friends and relatives, trusting that when the deed was accomplished, every one would join them in the completion of their enterprise. It was their intention, after the duke's death, to collect their followers together, and proceed to those parts of the city where they imagined the plebeians would be the most disposed to take arms against the duchess and the principal ministers of state. And they thought that the people, on account of the famine which then prevailed, would easily be induced to follow them, for it was their design to give up the houses of Checho Somenetta, Giovanni Balti, and Francesco Lucani, all leading men in the government, to be plundered, and by this means gain over the populace and restore liberty to the community. With these ideas, and with minds resolved upon their execution, Giovanni Andrea, together with the rest, were early at the church, and heard mass together, after which Giovanni Andrea, turning to a statue of St. Ambrose, said, O patron of our city, thou knowest our intention, and the end we would obtain, by so many dangers. Favor our enterprise, and prove, by protecting the oppressed, that tyranny is offensive to thee. To the duke, on the other hand, when intending to go to the church, many omens occurred of his approaching death. For in the morning, having put on a cuirass, as was his frequent custom, he immediately took it off again, either because it inconvenienced him, or he did not like its appearance. He then wished to hear mass in the castle, and found that the priest who had officiated in the chapel had gone to St. Stephen's, and had taken with him the sacred utensils. On this he desired the service to be performed by the bishop of Como, who acquainted him with preventing circumstances. Thus, almost compelled, he determined to go to the church, but before his departure caused his sons, Giovanni Galeazzo and Hermes, to be brought to him, whom he embraced and kissed several times, seeming reluctant to part with them. He then left the castle, and with the ambassadors of Ferrara and Mantua on either hand, proceeded to St. Stephen's. The conspirators, to avoid exciting suspicion and to escape the cold, which was very severe, had withdrawn to an apartment of the archpriest, who was a friend of theirs. But hearing the duke's approach, they came into the church. Giovanni Andrea and Girolamo placing themselves upon the right hand of the entrance, and Carlo on the left. Those who had led the procession had already entered, and were followed by the duke, surrounded by such a multitude as is usual on similar occasions. The first attack was made by Lampo Pognano and Girolamo, who, pretending to clear the way for the prince, came close to him, and grasping their daggers, which, being short and sharp, were concealed in the sleeves of their vests, struck at him. Lamponano gave him two wounds, one in the belly, the other in the throat. Girolamo struck him in the throat and the breast. Carlo Visconti, being nearer the door, and the duke having passed, could not wound him in front, but with two strokes transpierced his shoulder and spine. These six wounds were inflicted so instantaneously that the duke had fallen before anyone was aware of what had happened, and he expired, having only once ejaculated the name of the Virgin, as if imploring her assistance. A great tumult immediately ensued. Several swords were drawn, and as often happens in sudden emergencies, some fled from the church, and others ran towards the scene of the tumult, both without any definite motive or knowledge of what had occurred. Those, however, who were nearest the duke and had seen him slain, recognizing the murderers, pursued them. Giovanni Andrea, endeavoring to make his way out of the church, proceeded among the women, who, being numerous, and, according to their custom, seated upon the ground, was prevented in his progress by their apparel, and being overtaken, he was killed by a Moor, one of the duke's footmen. Carlo was slain by those immediately around him. Girolamo Ogliato passed through the crowd, and got out of the church, but seeing his companions dead, and not knowing where else to go, he proceeded home, where his father and brothers refused to receive him, his mother only, having compassion on her son, 
recommended him to a priest, an old friend of the family, who, disguising him in his own apparel, led him to his house. Here he remained two days, not without hope that some disturbance might arise in Milan which could contribute to his safety. This was not occurring, and apprehensive that his hiding place would be discovered, he endeavored to escape in disguise, but being observed, he was given over to justice, and disclosed all the particulars of the conspiracy. Girolamo was twenty-three years of age, and exhibited no less composure at his death than resolution in his previous conduct, for being stripped of his apparel, and in the hands of the executioner, who stood by with the sword unsheathed, ready to deprive him in life, he repeated the following words, in the Latin tongue, in which he was well versed. Mors acerba, fama perpetua, stabit vetus, memoria facti. The enterprise of these unfortunate young men was conducted with secrecy, and executed with resolution, and they failed for want of the support of those whom they expected would rise in their defense. Let princes therefore learn to live, so as to render themselves beloved and respected by their subjects, that none may have hope of safety after having destroyed them, and let others see how vain is the expectation which induces them to trust so much to the multitude, as to believe that even when discontented, they will either embrace or ward off their dangers. This event spread consternation all over Italy, but those which shortly afterwards occurred in Florence caused much more alarm, and terminated a piece of twelve years' continuance, as will be shown in the following book, which, having commenced with blood and horror, will have a melancholy and tearful conclusion. End of Book 7「Book Eight, Chapter One of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Eight, Chapter One. State of the Family of the Medici at Florence. Emnity of Sixtus the Fourth towards Florence, differences between the family of the Pazzi and that of the Medici, beginning of the conspiracy of the Pazzi, arrangements to effect the design of the conspiracy, Giovanni Battista de Monteseco is sent to Florence, the Pope joins the conspiracy, the kings of Naples becomes a party to it, names of the conspirators. The conspirators make many ineffectual attempts to kill Lorenzo and Giolano de' Medici. The final arrangement. Order of the conspiracy. This book, commencing between two conspiracies, the one at Milan, already narrated, and the other yet to be recorded, it would seem appropriate, and in accordance with our usual custom, were we to treat of the nature and importance of these terrible demonstrations. This we should willingly do had we not discussed the matter elsewhere, or could it be comprised in a few words. But requiring much consideration, and being already noticed in another place, it will be omitted, and we shall proceed with our narrative. The government of the Medici, having subdued all its avowed enemies, in order to obtain for that family undivided authority, and distinguish them from the other citizens in their relation to the rest, found it necessary to, to subdue those who secretly plotted against them. While Medici contended with other families, their equals in authority and reputation, those who envied their power, were able to oppose them openly without danger of being suppressed at the first demonstration of hostility. For the magistrates, being free, neither party had occasion to fear, till one or other of them was overcome. But after the victory of 1466, the government became so entirely centered in the Medici, and they acquired so much authority, that discontented spirits were obliged either to suffer in silence, or, if desirous to destroy them, to attempt it in secrecy, and by clandestine means, which plots rarely succeed, and most commonly involve the ruin of those concerned in them, while they frequently contribute to the aggrandizement of those against whom they are directed. 
Thus, the prince of a city attacked by a conspiracy, if not slain like the Duke of Milan, which seldom happens, almost always obtained to a greater degree of power, and very often has his good disposition perverted into evil. The proceedings of his enemies give him cause for fear. Fear suggests the necessity of providing for his own safety, which involves the injury of others, and hence arise animosities, and not infrequently his ruin. Thus these conspiracies quickly occasion the destruction of their own contrivers, and in time inevitably injure their primary object. Italy, as we have seen above, was divided into two factions, the Pope and the King on one side, and on the other the Venetians, the Duke, and the Florentines. Although the flames of war had not yet broken out, every day gave rise to some new occasion for rekindling them, and the Pope, in particular, with all his plans, endeavored to annoy the Florentine government. Thus Filippo de' Medici, Archbishop of Pisa, being dead, Francesco Salviati, a declared enemy of the Medici, was appointed his successor, contrary to the wish of the Signori of Florence, who, being unwilling to give him permission, there arose between them and the Pope many fresh grounds of offense, before the matter was settled. Besides this, he conferred at Rome many favors upon the family of the Pazzi, and opposed that of the Medici, whenever an opportunity offered. The Pazzi were at this time, both on account of nobility of birth and their great wealth, the most brilliant in France. The head of this family was Jacopo, whom the people, on account of his distinguished preeminence, had made a knight. He had no children, except one natural daughter, but many nephews, sons of his brothers, Piero and Antonio, the first of whom were Guglielmo, Francesco, Renato, Giovanni, and then Andrea, Niccolo, and Galeotto. Cosmo de' Medici, noticing the riches and rank of this family, had given his granddaughter, Bianca, to Guglielmo hoping by this marriage to unite the houses and obviate those enmities and dissensions so frequently occasioned by jealousy. However, so uncertain and fallacious are our expectations, very different feelings were thus originated, for Lorenzo's advisers pointed out to him how dangerous it was, how injurious to his authority, to unite in the same individuals so much wealth and power. In consequence, neither Jacopo nor his nephews obtained those degrees of honor, which, in the opinion of other citizens, were their due. This gave rise to anger in the Pazzi, and fear on the part of the Medici. As the former of these increased, so did the latter. And upon all occasions, when the Pazzi came in competition with other citizens, their claims to distinction, however strong, were set aside by the magistracy. Francesco de Pazzi, being at Rome, the Council of Eight, upon some trivial occasion, compelled him to return, without treating him with respect usually observed toward great citizens, so that the Pazzi everywhere bitterly complained of the ill usage they experienced, and thus excited suspicion in others, and brought down greater evils upon themselves. Giovanni de Pazzi had married the daughter of Giovanni Bonri... Bonri... Giovanni de Pazzi had married the daughter of Giovanni Bronromi, a very wealthy man, whose riches on his decease, without other children, came to his daughter. His nephew Carlo, however, took possession of part, and the question being litigated, a law was passed, by virtue of which the wife of Giovanni de Pazzi was robbed of her inheritance, and it was given to Carlo. In this piece of injustice the Pazzi at once recognized the influence of the Medici, Giovanni de' Medici often complained to his brother Lorenzo of the affair, saying that he was afraid that by grasping it too much, they could lose all. Lorenzo, flushed with youth and power, would assume the direction of everything, and resolve that all transactions should bear an impress of his influence. The Pazzi, with their nobility and wealth unable to endure so many affronts, began to devise many means of vengeance. The first who spoke of any attempt against the Medici was Francesco, who, being more sensitive and resolute than the others, determined, 
determined either to obtain what was withheld from him, or lose what he still possessed. As the government of Florence gave him great offense, he resided almost constantly at Rome, where, like other Florentine merchants, he conducted extensive commercial operations, and being a most intimate friend of Count Girolamo, they frequently complained to each other of the conduct of the Medici. After a while they began to think that, for the Count to retain his estates, or the Pazzi their rights in the city, it would be necessary to change the government of Florence, and this they considered could not be done without the death of Giolano and Lorenzo. They imagined the Pope and the King would be easily induced to consent, because each could be convinced of the facility of the enterprise. Having acquired these ideas, they communicated them to Francesco Salviati, Archbishop of Pisa, who, being ambitious and recently offended by the Medici, willingly adopted their views. Considering their next step, they resolved, in order to facilitate the design, to obtain the content of Jacopo de Pazzi, without whose concurrence they feared it would be impracticable. With this view, it was resolved that Francesco de Pazzi should go to Florence, while the archbishop and the count should remain at Rome, to be ready to communicate with the Pope when a suitable opportunity occurred. Francesco found Jacopo de Pazzi more cautious and difficult to persuade than he would have wished, and, on imparting this to his friends at Rome, it was thought he desired the sanction of some greater authority to induce him to adopt their views. Upon this, the archbishop and the count communicated the whole affair to Giovanni Battisto de Montesecco, a leader of the papal forces, possessing military reputation, and under obligations to the pope and the count. To him the affair seemed difficult and dangerous, while the archbishop endeavored to obviate his objections by showing how much assistance the pope and the king would lend to the enterprise. The hatred of the Florentines towards the Medici, the numerous friends the Salviati and the Pazzi would bring with them, and the readiness with which the young men might be slain, on account of their going about the city unaccompanied and without suspicion, and the facility with which the government might then be changed. These things Giovanni Battista did not in reality believe, for he had heard from many Florentines quite contrary statements. While occupied with these deliberations, Carlo, lord of Finza, was taken ill, and tears were entertained for his life. This circumstance seemed to the archbishop and the count to offer an opportunity for sending Giovanni Battista to Florence, and thence to Romagna, under the pretense of recovering certain territories belonging to the latter, of which the lord of Finza had taken possession. The count, therefore, commissioned Giovanni Battista to have an interview with Lorenzo de' Medici, and on his part request his advice how to proceed with respect to the affair of Romagna, that he should then see Francesco de Pazzi, and in conjunction with him, endeavor to induce his uncle Jacopo to adopt their ideas. To render the Pope's authority available in their behalf, Giovanni Battista was ordered, before his departure, to communicate with the pontiff, who offered every means at his disposal in favor of their enterprise. Giovanni Battista, having arrived at Florence, obtained an interview with Lorenzo, by whom he was most graciously received, and with regard to the advice he was commissioned to ask, obtained a wise and friendly answer so that he was astonished at finding him quite a different character from what he had been represented, and considered him to possess great sagacity, an affectionate heart, and most amicably disposed towards the Count. He found Francesco de Pazzi had gone to Luca, and spoke to Jacopo, who was at first quite opposed to their design, but before they parted the Pope's authority seemed to have influenced him, for he told Giovanni Battista that he might go to Romagna, and that, before his return, Francesco would be with him, and that they would consult more particularly upon the subject. Giovanni Battista proceeded to Romagna, and soon returned to Florence. After a pretended consultation with Lorenzo upon the Count's affairs, he obtained an interview with Francesco and Jacopo de Pazzi, when the latter gave his consent to their enterprise. They then discussed the means of carrying it into effect, Jacopo de Pazzi was of opinion 
that it could not be effected while both the brothers remained at Florence, and therefore it would be better to wait till Lorenzo went to Rome, whither it was reported he had an, an intention of going, for then their object would be more easily attained. Francesco de Pazzi had no objection to Lorenzo being at Rome, but if he were to forego the journey, he thought that both the brothers might be slain, either at a marriage, or at a play, or in a church. With regard to foreign assistance, he supposed the Pope might assemble forces for the conquest of the fortress of Montone, being justified in taking it from Count Carlo, who had caused the tumults already spoken of in Siena and Perugia. Still, no definite arrangement was made, but it was resolved that Giovanni Battista and Francesco de Pazzi should go to Rome and settle everything with the pontiff. The matter was again debated at Rome, and at length it was concluded that besides an expedition against Montone, Giovanni Francesco de Tolentino, a leader of the papal troops, should go into Romagna, and Lorenzo de Castello to the Val de Tavere, that each, with the forces of the country, should hold himself in readiness to perform the commands of the Archbishop de Salviati and Francesco de Pazzi, both of whom were to come to Florence and provide for the execution of their design, with the assistance of Giovanni Battista de Montesecco. King Ferrando promised by his ambassador to contribute all in his power to the success of their undertaking. Francesco de Pazzi and the Archbishop, having arrived at Florence, prevailed upon Jacopo de Poggio, a well-educated youth, but ambitious and very desirous of change, to join them, and two others, each of the name Jacopo Salviati, one a brother, the other a kinsman of the archbishop. They also gained over Bernardo Banditi and Napoleone Franzini, two bold young men, under great obligations to the family of the Pazzi. Besides these already mentioned, they were joined by Antonio de Volterra and a priest named Stefano, who taught Latin to the daughter of Jacopo de Pazzi. Renato de Pazzi, a grave and prudent man, being quite aware of the evils resulting from such undertakings, refused all participation in the conspiracy. He held it in abhorrence, and, as much as possible, without betraying his kinsmen, endeavored to counteract it. The Pope had sent Raffaello de Riario, a nephew of Count Girolamo, to the College of Pisa, to study canon law, and while there, had advanced him to the dignity of a cardinal. The conspirators determined to bring this cardinal to Florence, as they would thus be better able to conceal their design, since any persons requisite to be introduced into the city might easily be made to appear as part of his retinue, and his arrival might facilitate the completion of their enterprise. The cardinal came, and was received by Jacopo de Pazzi at his villa in Montugui, near Florence. By his means it was also intended to bring together Giolano and Lorenzo, and, whenever this happened, to put both of them to death. They therefore invited them to meet the cardinal at their villa at Faisole, but Giuliano, either intentionally or through some preventing cause, did not attend, and, this design having failed, they thought that if asked to an entertainment at Florence, both brothers would certainly be present. With this intention, they appointed Sunday, the 26th of April, 1478, to give a great feast, and resolving to assassinate them at table, the conspirators met on the Saturday evening to arrange all the proceedings for the following day. In the morning, it was intimated to Francesco that Giolano would be absent, on which the conspirators again assembled, and finding they could no longer defer the execution of their design, since it would be impossible among so many to preserve secrecy, they determined to complete it at the cathedral church of Santa Reparata, where the cardinal attending, the two brothers would be present as usual. They wished Giovanni Battista de Montesecco to undertake the murder of Lorenzo, while that of Giuliano was assigned to Francesco de Pazzi and Bernardo Banditi. Giovanni Battista refused, either because of his familiarity with Lorenzo had created feelings in his favor, or from some other reason, saying that he should not have resolution sufficient to commit such a deed in a church, and thus add sacrilege to treachery. This caused the failure of their undertaking, for time pressing, 
they were compelled to substitute Antonio de Volterra and Stefano the priest, two men who for if firmness and resolution joined with experience and bloodshed be necessary upon any occasion, it is on such as these, and it often happens that those who are expert in arms and have faced death in all forms on the battlefield still fail in an affair like this. Having now decided upon the time, they resolved that the signal for the attack should be the moment when the priest who celebrated high mass should partake of the sacrament, and that, in the meantime, the Archbishop de Salviati, with his followers, and Jacopo de Poggio, should take possession of the palace, in order that the Signore, after the young man's death, should voluntarily, or by force, contribute to their assistance. End of Book 8, Chapter 1「History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2, translated by an unknown translator. Book 8, Chapter 2. Giuliano de' Medici slain. Lorenzo escapes. The Archbishop Salviati endeavors to seize the palace of the Signori. He is taken and hanged. The enterprise of the conspirators entirely fails manifestations of the Florentines in favor of Lorenzo de' Medici, the conspirators punished, the funeral of Giuliano, the Pope and the King of Naples make war upon the Florentines, Florence excommunicated, speech of Lorenzo de' Medici to the citizens of Florence. The conspirators proceeded to Santa Reparata, where the Cardinal and Lorenzo had already arrived. The church was crowded, and the divine service commenced before Giuliano's arrival. Francesco di Pazzi and Bernardo Bandini, who were appointed to be his murderers, went to his house, and finding him, they, by earnest entreaties, prevailed upon him to accompany them. It is surprising that such intense hatred and designs, so full of horror as those of Francesco and Bernardo, could be so perfectly concealed, for while conducting him to the church, and after they had reached it, they amused him with jests and playful discourse. Nor did Francesco forget, under pretense of endearment, to press him in his arms, so as to ascertain whether under his apparel he wore a cuirass or some other means of defense. Giuliano and Lorenzo were both aware of the animosity of the Pazzi, and their desire to deprive them of the government, but they felt assured that any design would be attempted openly, and in conjunction with the civil authority. Thus being free from apprehension for their personal safety, both affected to be on friendly terms with them. The murderers being ready, each in his own appointed station, which they could retain without suspicion on account of the vast numbers assembled in the church, the preconcerted moment arrived, and Bernardo Bandini, with a short dagger, provided for the purpose, struck Giuliano in the breast, who, after a few steps, fell to the earth. Francesco de Pazzi threw himself upon the body and covered him with wounds, while, as if blinded by rage, he inflicted a deep incision upon his own leg. Antonio and Stefano, the priest, attacked Lorenzo, and after dealing many blows, effected only slight incision in the throat. For either their want of resolution, the activity of Lorenzo, who, finding himself attacked, used his arms in his own defense, or the assistance of those by whom he was surrounded, rendered all attempts futile. They fled and concealed themselves, but being subsequently discovered, were put to death in the most ignominious manner, and their bodies dragged about the city. Lorenzo, with the friends he had about him, took refuge in the sacristy of the church. Bernardo Bandini, after Giuliano's death, slew Francesco Nori, a most intimate friend of the Medici, either from some previous hatred, or for having endeavored to render assistance to Giuliano, 
and not content with these murders, he ran in pursuit of Lorenzo, intending, by his own promptitude, to make up for the weakness and inefficiency of the others. But finding he had taken refuge in the vestry, he was prevented. In the midst of these violent and fearful deeds, during which the uproar was so terrible that it seemed almost sufficient to bring the church down upon its inmates, the Cardinal Riario remained close to the altar, where he was with difficulty kept in safety by the priests, until the Signori, upon the abatement of the disturbance, could conduct him to their palace, where he remained in the utmost terror till he was set at liberty. There was at this time in Florence some people of Perugia, whom party feuds had compelled to leave their homes, and the Pazzi, by promising to restore them to their country, obtained their assistance. The Archbishop de Salviati, going to seize the palace, together with Jacopo de Poggio and the Salviati, his friends, took these Perugini with him. Having arrived, he left part of his people below, with orders that when they heard a noise they should make themselves masters of the entrance, while himself, with the greater part of the Perugini, proceeded above, and, finding the Signori at dinner, for it was now late, was admitted after a short delay by Caesar Petrucci, the gan finalier of justice. He entered with only a few of his own followers, the greater part of them being shut up in the cancellaria into which they had gone, whose doors were so contrived that upon closing they could not be opened, from either side, without the key. The archbishop, being with the gonfalar, under pretense of having something to communicate on the part of the pope, addressed him in such an incoherent and hesitating manner that the gonfalar at once suspected him, and rushing out of the chamber to call assistance, found Jacopo di Poggio, whom he seized by the hair of the head, and gave into the custody of his attendants. The signori, hearing the tumult, snatched such arms as they could at the moment obtain, and all who had gone up with the archbishop, part of them being shut up, and part overcome with terror, were immediately slain, or thrown alive, out of the windows of the palace, at which the archbishop, the two Jacopo Salviati, and Jacopo di Poggio were hanged. Those whom the archbishop left below, having mastered the guard and taking possession of the entrance, occupied all the lower floors, so that the citizens, who in the uproar hastened to the palace, were unable to give either advice or assistance to the Signori. Francesco de Pazzi and Bernardo Bandini, perceiving Lorenzo's escape, and the principal agent in the enterprise seriously wounded, became immediately conscious of the imminent peril of their position. Bernardo, using the same energy in his own behalf that had served him against the Medici, finding all lost, saved himself by flight. Francesco, wounded as he was, got to his house, and endeavored to get on horseback, for it had been arranged that they should ride through the city, and call the people to arms and liberty. But he found himself unable, from the nature of his wound, and throwing himself naked upon his bed, begged Jacopo de Pazzi to perform the part for which he was himself incapacitated. Jacopo, though old and unaccustomed to such business, by way of making a last effort, mounted his horse, and with about a hundred armed followers, collected without previous preparation, hastened to the piazza of the palace, endeavoring to assemble adherents by cries of people and liberty. But the former, having been rendered deaf by the fortune and liberty of the Medici, the latter was unknown in Florence, and he found no followers. The signors, who held the upper part of the palace, saluted him with stones and threats. Jacopo, while hesitating, was met by Giovanni Serristori, his brother-in-law, who upbraided him with the troubles he had occasioned, and then advised him to go home, for the people and liberty were as dear to other citizens as to himself. Thus deprived of every hope, Lorenzo being alive, Francesco seriously wounded, and none disposed to follow him, not knowing what to do, he resolved, if possible, to escape by flight, and accompanied by those whom he had led into the piazza, left Florence with the intention of going into Romagna. In the meantime the whole city was roused to arms, and Lorenzo de' Medici, accompanied by a numerous escort, returned to his house. The palace was recovered from its assailants, all of whom were either slain or made prisoners. The name of the Medici echoed everywhere, and portions of dead bodies were seen borne on spears and scattered through the streets, 
while every one was transported with rage against the Pazzi and pursued them with relentless cruelty. The people took possession of their houses, and Francesco, naked as they found him, was led to the palace and hanged beside the archbishop and the rest. He could not be induced by any injurious words or deeds to utter a syllable, but regarding those around with a steady look, he silently sighed. Guglielmo de Pazzi, brother-in-law to Lorenzo, fled to the latter's house, and by his innocence and the intercession of his wife, Bianca, he escaped death. There was not a citizen of any rank, whatever, who did not, upon this occasion, wait upon Lorenzo with an offer of his services. So great were the popularity and good fortune which this family had acquired by the liberality and prudence. Renato de Pazzi was at his villa when the event took place, and being informed of it, he endeavored to escape in disguise, but was arrested upon the road and brought to Florence. Jacopo de Pazzi was taken while crossing the mountains of Romagna, for the inhabitants of these parts, having heard what had occurred, and seeing him in flight, attacked and brought him back to the city. Nor could he, though he frequently endeavored, prevail with them to put him to death upon the road. Jacopo and Renato were condemned within four days after the murder of Giuliano, and though so many deaths had been afflicted that the roads were covered with fragments of human bodies, not one excited a feeling of regret, except that of Renato, for he was considered a wise and good man, and possessed none of the pride for which the rest of his family were notorious. As if to mark the event by some extraordinary circumstance, Jacopo de Pazzi, after having been buried in the tomb of his ancestors, was disinterred like an excommunicated person, and thrown into a hole at the outside of the city walls. From this grave he was taken, and with the halter in which he had been hanged, his body was dragged naked through the city, and, as if unfit for sepulchre on earth, thrown by the populace into the Arno, whose waters were then very high. It was an awful instance of the instability of fortune, to see so wealthy a man, possessing the utmost earthly felicity, brought down to such a depth of misery, such utter ruin and extreme degradation. It is said he had vices, among which were gaming and profane swearing, to which he was very much addicted. But these seem more than balanced by his numerous charities, for he relieved many in distress, and bestowed much money for pious uses. It may also be recorded in his favor, that upon the Saturday preceding the death of Giuliano, in order that none might suffer from his misfortunes, he discharged all his debts, and whatever property he possessed belonging to others, either in his own house or his place of business, he was particularly careful to return to its owners. Giovanni Battista de Montesecco, after a long examination, was beheaded. Napoleone Franzesi escaped punishment by flight. Giulielmo de Pazzi was banished, and such of his cousins as remained alive were imprisoned in the fortress of Volterra. The disturbances being over, and the conspirators punished, the funeral obsequies of Giuliano were performed amid universal lamentation, for he possessed all the liberality and humanity that could be wished for in one of his high station. He left a natural son, born some months after his death, named Giulio, who was endowed with that virtue and felicity with which the whole world is now acquainted, and of which we shall speak at length when we come to our own times, if God spares us. The people who had assembled in favor of the Pazzi under Lorenzo di Castello in the Val de Tavare, and under Giovan Francesco de Tolentino in Romagna, approached Florence, but having heard of the failure of the conspiracy, they returned home. The changes desired by the Pope and the, the King in the government of Florence not having taken place, they determined to effect by war what they had failed to accomplish by treachery, and both assembled forces with all speed to attack the Florentine states, publicly declaring that they only wished the citizens to remove Lorenzo de' Medici, who alone of all the Florentines was their enemy. The King's forces had already passed the Tronto, and the Popes were in Perugia, and that the citizens might feel the effect of spiritual as well as of temporal weapons, the pontiff excommunicated and anathematized them. Finding themselves attacked by so many armies, the Florentines prepared for their defense with the utmost care. 
Lorenzo de' Medici, as the enemy's operations were said to be directed against himself alone, resolved first of all to assemble the Signori, and the most influential citizens in the place, to whom, being above three hundred in number, he spoke as follows. Most excellent signors, and you, magnificent citizens, I know not whether I have more occasion to weep with you for the events which have recently occurred, or to rejoice in the circumstances with which they have been attended. Certainly, when I think of what virulence of united deceit and hatred I have been attacked, and my brother murdered, I cannot but mourn and grieve from my heart, from my very soul. Yet, when I consider with what promptitude, anxiety, love, and unanimity of the whole city my brother has been avenged and myself defended, I am not only compelled to rejoice, but feel myself honored and exalted, for if experience has shown me that I had more enemies than I apprehended, it has also proved that I possess more warm and resolute friends than I could ever have hoped for. I must therefore grieve with you for the injuries others have suffered, and rejoice in the attachment you have exhibited towards myself, but I feel more aggrieved by the injuries committed, since they are so unusual, so unexampled, and, as I trust you believe, so undeserved on our part. Think, magnificent citizens, to what a dreadful point ill fortune has reduced our family, when among friends, amidst our own relatives, nay, in God's holy temple, we have found our greatest foes. Those who are in danger turn to their friends for assistance. They call upon their relatives for aid. But we found ours armed and resolved on our destruction. Those who are persecuted, either from public or private motives, flee for refuge to the altars. But where others are safe, we are assassinated. Where parricides and assassins are secure, the Medici find their murderers. But God, who has not hitherto abandoned our house, again saved us, and has undertaken the defense of our just cause. What injury have we done to justify so intense desire of our destruction? Certainly those who have shown themselves so much our enemies never received any private wrong from us. For, had we wished to injure them, they would not have had an opportunity of injuring us. If they attribute public grievances to ourselves, supposing any had been done to them, they do the greater injustices to you, to this palace, to the majesty of this government, by assuming that on our account you would act unfairly to any of your citizens, and such a supposition, as we all know, is contradicted by every view of the circumstances. For we, had we been able, and you, had we wished it, would never have contributed to so abominable a design. Whoever inquires into the truth of these matters will find that our family has always been exalted by you, and from this sole cause, that we have endeavored by kindness, liberality, and beneficence to do good to all. And if we have honored strangers, when did we ever injure our relatives? If our enemy's conduct has been adopted to gratify their desire for power, as would seem to be the case from their having taken possession of the palace and brought an armed force into the piazza, the infamous, ambitious, and detestable motive is at once disclosed. If they were actuated by envy and hatred of our authority, they offend you rather than us, for from you we have derived all the influence we possess. Certainly usurped power deserves to be detested, but not distinctions conceded for acts of kindness, generosity, and magnificence. And you all know that our family never obtained any rank to which this palace and your united consent did not raise it. Cosmo, my grandfather, did not return from exile with arms and violence, but by your unanimous desire and approbation. It was not my father, old and in form, who defended the government against so many enemies, but yourself, by your authority and benevolence, defended him. Neither could I, after his death, being then a boy, have maintained the position of my house, except by your favor and advice nor should we ever be able to conduct the affairs of this republic if you do not contribute to our support. Therefore, I know not the reason of their hatred towards us, or what just cause they have of envy. Let them direct their enmity against their own ancestors, who, by their pride and avarice, lost the reputation which ours, by very opposite conduct, were enabled to acquire. 
but let it be granted we have greatly injured them, and that they are justified in seeking our ruin. Why do they come and take possession of the palace? Why enter into league with the Pope and the King, against the liberties of this Republic? Why break the long-continued peace of Italy? They have no excuse for this. They ought to confine their vengeance to those who do them wrong, and not confound private animosities with public grievances. Hence it is that since their defeat our misfortune is the greater, for on their account the Pope and the King make war upon us, and this war, they say, is directed against my family and myself. And would to God that this were true, then the remedy would be sure and unfailing, for I would not be so base a citizen as to prefer my safety to yours. I would at once resolve to ensure your safety, even though my own destruction were the immediate and inevitable consequence. But as the wrongs committed by princes are usually concealed under some less offensive covering, they have adopted this plea to hide their more abominable purpose. If, however, you think otherwise, I am in your hands. It is with you to do with me what you please. You are my fathers, my protectors, and whatever you command me to do I will perform most willingly. Nor will I ever refuse, when you find occasion to require it, to close the war with my own blood, which was commenced with that of my brother. While Lorenzo spoke, the citizens were unable to refrain from tears, and the sympathy with which he was heard was extended to their reply, delivered by one of them in the name of the rest, who said that the city acknowledged many advantages derived from the good qualities of himself and his family, and encouraged them to hope that, with as much promptitude as they had used in his defense, and in avenging his brother's death, they would secure to him his influence in the government, which he should never lose while they retained possession of the country, and that their deeds might correspond with their words, they immediately appointed a number of armed men, as a guard for the security of his person against domestic enemies. End of Book 8, Chapter 2《Eight Chapter Three of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two. Translated by an unknown translator. Book Eight, Chapter Three. The Florentines prepare for war against the Pope. They appeal to a future council. Papal and Neapolitan movements against the Florentines. The Venetians refuse to assist the Florentines. Disturbances in Milan. Genoa revolts from the Duke. Futile endeavours to effect peace with the Pope. The Florentines repulse their enemies from the territory of Pisa. They attack the Papal States. The papal forces routed upon the borders of the lake of Perugia. The Florentines now prepared for war by raising money and collecting as large a force as possible. Being in league with the Duke of Milan and the Venetians, they applied to both for assistance, as the Pope had proved himself a wolf rather than a shepherd, to avoid being devoured under false accusations. They justified their cause with all available arguments and filled Italy with accounts of treachery practised against their government, exposing the impiety and injustice of the pontiff, and assured the world that the pontificate which he had wickedly attained, he would as impiously fill. For he had sent those whom he advanced to the highest order of prelacy, in the company of traitors and parricides, to commit the most horrid treachery in the church, in the midst of divine service and during the celebration of the holy sacrament, and then, having failed to murder the citizens, change the government and plunder the city according to his intention, he had suspended the performance of all religious offices, and injuriously menaced and injured the public with pontifical maledictions. But if God was just, and violence was offensive to him, he would be displeased with that of his vice-regent, and allow his injured people, who were not admitted to communion with the latter, to offer up their prayers to himself. The Florentines, therefore, instead of receiving or obeying the interdict, compelled the priests to perform divine service, 
assembled a council in Florence of all the Tuscan prelates under their jurisdiction, and appealed against the injuries suffered from the pontiff to a future general council. The Pope did not neglect to assign reasons in his own justification, and maintained it was the duty of a pontiff to suppress tyranny, depress the wicked, and exalt the good, and that this ought to be done by every available means, but that secular princes had no right to detain cardinals, hang bishops, murder, mangle, and drag about the bodies of priests, destroying without distinction the innocent with the guilty. Notwithstanding these complaints and accusations, the Florentines restored to the Pope the cardinal whom they had detained, in return for which he immediately assailed them with his own forces and those of the king. The two armies, under the command of Alfonso, eldest son of Ferrando, and Duke of Calabria, who had as his general Federigo, Count of Urbino, entered the Chianti by permission of the Sienese, who sided with the enemy, occupied Rada with many other fortresses, and having plundered the country, besieged the Castellina. The Florentines were greatly alarmed at these attacks, being almost destitute of forces, and finding their friends slow to assist, for though the Duke sent them aid, the Venetians denied all obligation to support the Florentines in their private quarrels, since the animosities of individuals were not to be defended at the public expense. The Florentines, in order to induce the Venetians to take a more correct view of the case, sent Tommaso Soderini as their ambassador to the Senate, and in the meantime engaged forces, and appointed Ercoli, Marquis of Ferrara, to the command of their army. While these preparations were being made, the Castellina was so hard pressed by the enemy, that the inhabitants, despairing of relief, surrendered after having sustained a siege of forty-two days. The enemy then directed their course toward Arezzo, and encamped before San Savino. The Florentine army, being now in order, went to meet them, and having approached within three miles, caused such annoyance that Federigo de Urbino demanded a truce for a few days, which was granted, but proved so disadvantageous to the Florentines that those who had made the request were astonished at having obtained it, for, had it been refused, they would have been compelled to retire in disgrace. Having gained these few days to recruit themselves, as soon as they were expired, they took the castle in the presence of their enemies. Winter being now come, the forces of the Pope and King retired for convenient quarters to the Sienese territory. The Florentines also withdrew to a more commodious situation, and the Marquis of Ferrara, having done little for himself and less for others, returned to his own territories. At this time, Genoa withdrew from the dominion of Milan under the following circumstances. Galeazzo, at his death, left a son, Giovan Galeazzo, who, being too young to undertake the government, dissensions arose between Sforza, Lodovico, Ottaviano, and Aschiano, his uncles, and the Lady Bona, his mother, each of whom desired the guardianship of the young duke. By the advice and mediation of Tommaso Soderini, who was then Florentine ambassador at the court of Milan, and of Checcio Simonetta, who had been secretary to Galeazzo, the Lady Bona prevailed. The uncles fled. Ottaviano was drowned in crossing the Adda. The rest were banished to various places, together with Roberto da San Severino, who, in these disputes, had deserted the Duchess and joined the uncles of the Duke. The troubles in Tuscany, which immediately followed, gave these princes hope that the new state of things would present opportunities for their advantage. They therefore quitted the places to which their exile limited them, and each endeavoured to return home. King Ferrando, finding the Florentines had obtained assistance from none but the Milanese, took occasion to give the Duchess so much occupation in her own government as to render her unable to contribute to their assistance. By means of Prospero Adorno, the Signor Roberto and the rebellious uncles of the Duke, he caused Genoa to throw off the Milanese yoke. The Castelletto was the only place left, confiding in which the Duchess sent a strong force to recover the city, but it was routed by the enemy, and perceiving the danger which might arise to her son and herself if the war were continued, Tuscany being in confusion, and the Florentines, in whom she alone had hope, themselves in trouble, she determined, as she could not retain Genoa in subjection to secure it as an ally, and agreed with Battistino Fregoso, the enemy of Prospero Adorno, to give him the Castelletto, and make him Prince of Genoa, on condition that he should expel Prospero, and do nothing in favour of her son's uncles. Upon this agreement, 
Battistino, by the assistance of the Castelletto and of his friends, became lord of Genoa, and according to the custom of the city, took the title of Doge. The Sposeschi and the Signor Roberto, being thus expelled by the Genoese, came with their forces into Lunigiana, and the Pope and the King, perceiving the troubles of Lombardy to be composed, took occasion with them to annoy Tuscany in the Pisan territory, that the Florentines might be weakened by dividing their forces. At the close of winter they ordered Roberto da San Severino to leave Lunigiana and march thither, which he did, and with great tumult plundered many fortresses, and overran the country around Pisa. At this time ambassadors came to Florence from the Emperor, the King of France, and the King of Hungary, who were sent by their princes to the pontiff. They solicited the Florentines also to send ambassadors to the Pope, and promised to use their utmost exertion to obtain for them an advantageous peace. The Florentines did not refuse to make trial, both for the sake of publicly justifying their proceedings, and because they were really desirous of peace. Accordingly the ambassadors were sent, but returned without coming to any conclusion of their differences. The Florentines, to avail themselves of the influence of the King of France, since they were attacked by one part of the Italians and abandoned by the other, sent to him as their ambassador Donato Acciaiuoli, a distinguished Latin and Greek scholar, whose ancestors had always ranked high in the city. But while on his journey he died at Milan. To relieve his surviving family and pay a deserved tribute to his memory, he was honourably buried at the public expense. Provision was made for his sons, and suitable marriage proportions given to his daughters. And Guid Antonio Vespucci, a man well acquainted with pontifical and imperial affairs, was sent as ambassador to the king in his stead. The attack of Signor Roberto upon the Pisan territory, being unexpected, greatly perplexed the Florentines, for having to resist the foe in the direction of Siena, they knew not how to provide for the places about Pisa. To keep the Lucchese faithful, and prevent them from furnishing the enemy either with money or provisions, they sent as ambassador Piero di Gino Caponi, who was received with so much jealousy on account of the hatred which that city always cherishes against the Florentines, from former injuries and constant fear, that he was on many occasions in danger of being put to death by the mob, and thus his mission gave fresh cause of animosity rather than of union. The Florentines recalled the Marquis of Ferrara, and engaged the Marquis of Mantua. They also as earnestly requested the Venetians to send them Count Carlo, son of Braccio, and De Fobo, son of Count Jacobo. And after many delays they complied, for having made a truce with the Turks they had no excuse to justify a refusal, and could not break through the obligation of the League without the utmost disgrace. The Counts Carlo and De Fobo came with a good force, and being joined by all that could be spared from the army, which, under the Marquis of Ferrara, held in check the Duke of Calabria, proceeded toward Pisa to meet Signor Roberto, who was with his troops near the river Sertio, and who, though he had expressed his intention of awaiting their arrival, withdrew to the camp at Lunigiana, which he had quitted upon coming into the Pisan territory, while Count Carlo recovered all the places that had been taken by the enemy in that district. The Florentines, being thus relieved from the attack in the direction of Pisa, assembled the whole force between Colla and Santo Geminiano. But the army, on the arrival of Count Carlo, being composed of Sposeschi and Racheschi, their hereditary feuds soon broke forth and it was thought that if they remained long in company they would turn their arms against each other. It was therefore determined as the smaller evil to divide them, to send one party under Count Carlo into the district of Perugia, and establish the other at Pogiponsi, where they formed a strong encampment in order to prevent the enemy from penetrating the Florentine territory. By this they also hoped to compel the enemy to divide their forces, for Count Carlo was understood to have many partisans in Perugia, and it was therefore expected either that he would occupy the place, or that the Pope would be compelled to send a large body of men for its defence. To reduce the pontiff to greater necessity, they ordered Niccolo Vitelli, who had been expelled from Gitta di Castello, where his enemy Lorenzo Vitelli commanded, to lead a force against that place, with the view of driving out his adversary, and withdrawing it from obedience to the Pope. At the beginning of the campaign, Fortune seemed to favour the Florentines, for Count Carlo made rapid advances in the Perugino, and Niccolo Vitelli, though unable to enter Castello, 
was superior in the field, and plundered the surrounding country without opposition. The forces also at Pogibonsi constantly overran the country up to the walls of Siena. These hopes, however, were not realized, for in the first place Count Carlo died, while in the fullest tide of success, though the consequences of this would have been less detrimental to the Florentines, had not the victory to which it gave occasion been nullified by the misconduct of others. The death of the Count being known, the forces of the Church which had already assembled in Perugia, conceived hopes of overcoming the Florentines, and encamped upon the lake, within three miles of the enemy. On the other side, Jacopo Guicciardini, commissary to the army, by the advice of Roberto da Rimino, who, after the death of Count Carlo, was the principal commander, knowing the ground of their sanguine expectations, determined to meet them, and coming to an engagement near the lake, upon the site of the memorable rout of the Romans by Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, the papal forces were vanquished. The news of the victory, which did great honour to the commanders, diffused universal joy at Florence, and would have ensured a favourable termination of the campaign. Had not the disorders which arose in the army at Pogibonzi thrown all into confusion, for the advantage obtained by the valour of the one was more than counterbalanced by the disgraceful proceedings of the other. Having made considerable booty in the Sienese territory, quarrels arose about the division of it between the Marquis of Mantua and the Marquis of Ferrara, who, coming to arms, assailed each other with the utmost fury, and the Florentines, seeing they could no longer avail themselves of the services of both, allowed the Marquis of Ferrara and his men to return home. End of Book 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume 2 Translated by an Unknown Translator Book 8, Chapter 4 the Duke of Calabria routs the Florentine army at Pogibonzi. Dismay in Florence on account of the defeat. Progress of the Duke of Calabria. The Florentines wish for peace. Lorenzo de' Medici determines to go to Naples to treat with the king. Lodovico Sforza, surnamed the Moor, and his brothers, recall to Milan. Changes in the government of that city in consequences. The Genoese takes Serizana. Lorenzo de' Medici arrives at Naples. Peace concluded with the king. The Pope and the Venetians consent to the peace. The Florentines, in fear of the Duke of Calabria, enterprises of the Turks. They take Otranto. The Florentines reconciled with the Pope. Their ambassadors at the papal court. The Pope's reply to the ambassadors. The king of Naples restores to the Florentines all the fortresses he had taken. The army being thus reduced without a leader, and disorder prevailing in every department, the Duke of Calabria, who was with his forces near Siena, resolved to attack them immediately. The Florentines, finding the enemy at hand, were seized with a sudden panic. Neither their arms, nor their numbers, in which they were superior to their adversaries, nor their position, which was one of great strength, could give them confidence. But observing the dust occasioned by the enemy's approach, without waiting for a sight of them, they fled in all directions leaving their ammunition, carriages, and artillery to be taken by the foe. Such cowardice and disorder prevailed in the armies of those times that the turning of a horse's head or tail was sufficient to decide the fate of an expedition. This defeat loaded the king's troops with booty and filled the Florentines with dismay, for the city besides the war was afflicted with pestilence, which prevailed so extensively that all who possessed villas fled to them to escape death. This occasioned the defeat to be attended with greater horror, for those citizens whose possessions lay in the Val di Pesa and the Val d'Elsa, having retired to them, hastened to Florence with all speed as soon as they heard of the disaster, taking with them not only their children and their property, but even their labourers, so it seemed as if the enemy were expected every moment in the city. Those who were appointed to the management of the war, perceiving the universal consternation, commanded the victorious forces in the Perugino to give up their enterprise in that direction, and march to oppose the enemy in the Val d'Elsa, who, after their victory, plundered the country without opposition, 
and although the Florentine army had so closely pressed the city of Perugia that it was expected to fall into their hands every instant, the people preferred defending their own possessions to endeavouring to seize those of others. The troops, thus withdrawn from the pursuit of their good fortune, were marched to San Castiano, a castle within eight miles of Florence. The leaders thinking they could take up no other position till the relics of the routed army were assembled. On the other hand, the enemy being under no further restraint at Perugia, and emboldened by the departure of the Florentines, plundered to a large amount, in the districts of Arezzo and Cortona, while those who under Alfonso, Duke of Calabria, had been victorious near Poggibonzi, took the town itself, sacked Vico and Cataldo, and after these conquests and pillagings encamped before the fortress of Colla, which was considered very strong. And as the garrison was brave and faithful to the Florentines, it was hoped that they would hold the enemy at bay till the Republic was able to collect its forces. The Florentines being at Santo Casciano, and the enemy continuing to use their utmost exertions against Colla, they determined to draw nearer, that the inhabitants might be more resolute in their defence, and the enemy assail them less boldly. With this design they removed their camp from Santo Casciano to Santo Germiniano, about five miles from Colla, and with light cavalry and other suitable forces were able to every day annoy the duke's camp. All this, however, was insufficient to relieve the people of Colla, for, having consumed their provisions, they were compelled to surrender on the 13th of November, to the great grief of the Florentines and joy of the enemy, more especially of the Sienese, who, besides their habitual hatred of the Florentines, had a particular animosity against the people of Colla. It was now the depth of winter, and the weather so unsuitable for war, that the Pope and the King, either designing to hold out a hope of peace, or more quietly to enjoy the fruit of their victories, proposed a truce for three months to the Florentines, and allowed them ten days to consider the reply. The offer was eagerly accepted, but as wounds are well known to be more painful after the blood cools than when they were first received, this brief response awakened the Florentines to a consciousness of the miseries they had endured, and the citizens openly laid the blame upon each other, pointing out the errors committed in the management of the war, the expenses uselessly incurred, and the taxes unjustly imposed. These matters were boldly discussed, not only in private circles, but in the public councils, and one individual even ventured to turn to Lorenzo de' Medici and say, The city is exhausted and can endure no more war. It is therefore necessary to think of peace. Lorenzo was himself aware of the necessity, and assembled the friends in whose wisdom and fidelity he had the greatest confidence. When it was at once concluded, that as the Venetians were lukewarm and unfaithful, and the duke in the power of his guardians, and involved in domestic difficulties, it would be desirable by some new alliance to give a better turn to their affairs. They were in doubt whether to apply to the king or to the pope, but having examined the question in all sides, they preferred the friendship of the king as more suitable and secure, for the short reigns of the pontiffs, the changes ensuing upon each succession, the disregard shown by their church toward temporal princes, and the still greater want of respect for them exhibited in her determinations, render it impossible for a secular prince to trust a pontiff, or safely to share his fortune. For an adherent of the Pope will have a companion in victory, but in defeat must stand alone, while the pontiff is sustained by his spiritual power and influence. Having therefore decided that the king's friendship would be of the greatest utility to them, they thought it would be most easily and certainly obtained by Lorenzo's presence, for in proportion to the confidence they evinced toward him, the greater they imagined would be the probability of removing his impressions of past enmities. Lorenzo, having resolved to go to Naples, recommended the city and government to the care of Tommaso Soderini, who was at the time Gonfalonia of Justice. He left Florence at the beginning of December, and having arrived at Pisa, wrote to the government to acquaint them with the cause of his departure. The seigneury, to do him honour and enable him the more effectually to treat with the king, appointed him ambassador from the Florentine people, and endowed him with full authority to make such arrangements as he thought most useful for the Republic. At this time, Roberto da San Severino, with Lodovico and Ascanio, Sforza, their elder brother being dead, again attacked Milan in order to recover the government. Having taken Tortona, and the city and the whole state being in arms, the Duchess Bona was advised to restore the Sforzeschi, 
and to put a stop to civil contentions by admitting them to the government. The person who gave this advice was Antonio Tassino, of Ferrara, a man of low origin, who, coming to Milan, fell into the hands of the Duke Galeazzo, and was given by him to his duchess for her valet. He, either from his personal attractions, or some secret influence, after the Duke's death attained such influence over the Duchess that he governed the state almost at his will. This greatly displeased the minister Ketcho, whom prudence and long experience had rendered invaluable, and, and who, to the utmost of his power, endeavoured to diminish the authority of Tassino with the Duchess and other members of the government. The latter, aware of this, to avenge himself for the injury and secure defenders against Ketcho, advised the Duchess to recall the Sforzeski, which she did, without communicating her design to the minister, who, when it was done, said to her, You have taken a step which will deprive me of my life, and you of the government. This shortly afterward took place, for Ketcho was put to death by Lodovico, and Tassino, being expelled from the dukedom, the Duchess was so enraged that she left Milan, and gave up the care of her son to Lodovico, who, becoming sole governor of the dukedom, caused, as will be hereafter seen, the ruin of Italy. Lorenzo de' Medici had set out for Naples, and the truce between the parties was in force, when, quite unexpectedly, Lord Vico Fregoso, being in correspondence with some persons of Solazana, entered the place by stealth, took possession of it with an armed force, and imprisoned the Florentine governor. This greatly offended the signory, they thought the whole had been concerted with the connivance of King Ferrando. They complained to the Duke of Calabria, who was with the army at Siena, of a breach of the truce, and he endeavoured to prove, by letters and embassies, that it had occurred without either his own or his father's knowledge. The Florentines, however, found themselves in a very awkward predicament, being destitute of money, the head of the Republic in the power of the King, themselves engaged in a long-standing war with the latter and the Pope, in a new one with the Genoese, and entirely without friends, for they had no confidence in the Venetians, and on account of its changeable and unsettled state they were rather apprehensive of Milan. They had thus only one hope, and that depended upon Lorenzo's success with the king. Lorenzo arrived at Naples by sea, and was most honourably received, not only by Ferrando, but by the whole city, his coming having excited the greatest expectation for it being generally understood that the war was undertaken for the sole purpose of effecting his destruction, the power of his enemies invested his name with additional luster. Being admitted to the king's presence, he spoke with so much propriety upon the affairs of Italy, the disposition of her princes and people, his hopes for peace, his fears for the result of war, that Ferrando was more astonished at the greatness of his mind, the promptitude of his genius, his gravity and wisdom, than he had previously been at his power. He consequently treated him with redoubled honour, and began to feel compelled rather to part with him as a friend, than detain him as an enemy. However, under various pretexts, he kept Lorenzo from December till March, not only to gain the most perfect knowledge of his own views, but of those of his city, for he was not without enemies, who would have wished the king to detain and treat him in the same manner as Jacopo Piccinino and, with the ostensible view of sympathising for him, pointed out all that would, or rather that they wished should, result from such a course, at the same time opposing in the council every proposition at all likely to favour him. By such means as these the opinion gained ground, that if he were detained at Naples much longer, the government of Florence would be changed. This caused the king to postpone their separation more than he would have otherwise done, to see if any disturbance were likely to arise but finding everything go quietly on, Ferrando allowed him to depart on the 6th of March, 1479, having, with every kind of attention and token of regard, endeavoured to gain his affection, and formed with him a perpetual alliance for their mutual defence. Lorenzo returned to Florence, and upon presenting himself before the citizens, the impressions he had created in the popular mind surrounded him with a halo of majesty, brighter than before. He was received with all the joy merited by his extraordinary qualities and recent services, in having exposed his own life to the most imminent peril, in order to restore peace to his country. Two days after his return, 
the treaty between the republic of florence and the king by which each party bound itself to defend the other's territories was published the places taken from the florentines during the war were to be taken up at the discretion of the king the pazzi confined to the tower of volterra were to be set at liberty and a certain sum of money for a limited period was to be paid to the duke of calabria as soon as this peace was publicly known the pope and the venetians were transported with rage the pope thought himself neglected by the king the venetians entertained similar ideas with regard to the florentines and complained that having been companions in the war they were not allowed to participate in the peace reports of this description being spread abroad and received with entire credence at florence caused a great fear that the peace thus made would give rise to greater wars and therefore the leading members of the government determined to confine the consideration of the most important affairs to a smaller number and formed a council of twenty-seven citizens in whom the principal authority was invested this new regulation calmed the minds of those desirous of change by convincing them of the futility of their efforts to establish their authority they in the first place ratified the treaty of peace with the king and sent as ambassadors to the pope antonio ridolfi and piero nasi but notwithstanding the peace alfonso duke of calabria still remained at siena with his forces pretending to be detained by discords among the citizens which he said had risen so high that while he resided outside the city they had compelled him to enter and assume the office of arbitrator between them he took occasion to draw large sums of money from the wealthiest citizens by way of fines imprisoned many banished others and put some to death he thus became suspected not only by the sienese but by the florentines of a design to usurp the sovereignty of siena nor was any remedy then available for the republic had formed a new alliance with the king and were at enmity with the pope and the venetians this suspicion was entertained not only by the great body of the florentine people who were subtle interpreters of appearances but by the principal members of the government and it was agreed on all hands that the city was never in so much danger of losing her liberty but god who in similar extremities had always been her preserver caused an unhoped-for event to take place which gave the pope the king and the venetians other matters to think of than those in tuscany the turkish emperor mahomet the second had gone with a large army to the siege of rhodes and continued it for several months but though his forces were numerous and his courage indomitable he found them more than equalled by those of the besieged who resisted his attack with such obstinate valour that he was at last compelled to retire in disgrace having left rhodes part of his army under the pasha achmed approached Bologna, and either from observing the facility of the enterprise or in obedience to his sovereign's commands coasting along the italian shores he suddenly landed four thousand soldiers and attacked the city of otranto which he easily took plundered and put all the inhabitants to the sword he then fortified the city and port and having assembled a large body of cavalry pillaged the surrounding country the king learning this and aware of the redoubtable character of his assailant immediately sent messengers to all the surrounding powers to request assistance against the common enemy and ordered the immediate return of the duke of calabria with the forces at siena this attack however it might annoy the duke and the rest of italy occasioned the utmost joy at florence and siena the latter thinking it had recovered its liberty and the former that she had escaped a storm which threatened her with destruction these impressions which were not unknown to the duke increased the regret he felt at his departure from siena and he accused fortune of having by an unexpected and unaccountable accident deprived him of the sovereignty of tuscany the same circumstance changed the disposition of the pope for although he had previously refused to receive any ambassador from florence he was now so mollified as to be anxious to listen to any overtures of peace and it was intimated to the florentines that if they would condescend to ask the pope's pardon they would be sure of obtaining it thinking it advisable to seize the opportunity they sent twelve ambassadors to the pontiff who on their arrival detained them under different pretexts before he would admit them to an audience however terms were at length settled and what should be contributed by each in peace or war 
The messengers were then admitted to the feet of the pontiff, who, with the utmost pomp, received them in the midst of his cardinals. They apologized for past occurrences, first showing they had been compelled by necessity, then blaming the malignity of others or the rage of the populace, and their just indignation, and enlarging on the unfortunate condition of those who are compelled either to fight or die, saying, that since every extremity is endured in order to avoid death, they had suffered war, interdicts, and other inconveniences, brought upon them by recent events, that their republic might escape slavery, which is the death of free cities. However, if in their necessities they had committed any offence, they were desirous to make atonement, and trusted in his clemency, who, after the example of the blessed Redeemer, would receive them into his compassionate arms. The Pope's reply was indignant and haughty. After reiterating all the offences against the Church during the late transactions, he said that, to comply with the precepts of God, he would grant the pardon they asked, but would have them understand that it was their duty to obey, and that upon the next instance of their disobedience, they would inevitably forfeit, and that most deservedly, the liberty which they had just been upon the point of losing. For those merit freedom who exercise themselves in good works and avoid evil. That liberty, improperly used, injures itself and others. That to think little of God and less of his church is not the part of a free man, but a fool, and one disposed to evil rather than good, and to effect whose correction is the duty not only of princes but of every Christian so that in respect of the recent events they had only themselves to blame, who by their evil deeds had given rise to the war, and inflamed it by still worse actions, it having been terminated by the kindness of others rather than by merit of their own. The formula of agreement and benediction was then read, and in addition to what had already been considered and agreed upon between the parties, the Pope said that if the Florentines wished to enjoy the fruit of his forgiveness, they must maintain fifteen galleys, armed and equipped, at their own expense, as long as the Turks should make war upon the kingdom of Naples. The ambassadors complained much of this burden in addition to the arrangement already made, but were unable to obtain any alleviation. However, after their return to Florence, the Signory sent, as ambassador to the Pope, Guidantonio Vespucci, who had recently returned from France, and who by his prudence brought everything to an amicable conclusion obtained many favours from the pontiff, which were considered as presages of a closer reconciliation. Having settled their affairs with the Pope, Siena being free, themselves released from the fear of the king, by the departure of the Duke of Calabria from Tuscany, and the war with the Turks still continuing, the Florentines pressed the king to restore their fortresses, which the Duke of Calabria, upon quitting the country, had left in the hands of the Sienese. Ferrando, apprehensive that if he refused they would withdraw from the alliance with him, and by new wars with the Sienese deprive him of the assistance he hoped to obtain from the Pope and other Italian powers, consented that they should be given up, and by new favours endeavoured to attach the Florentines to his interests. It is thus evident that force and necessity, not deeds and obligations, induce princes to keep faith. The castles being restored, and his new alliance established, Lorenzo de' Medici recovered the reputation which first the war and then the peace, when the king's designs were doubtful, had deprived him of, for at this period there was no lack of those who openly slandered him with having sold his country to save himself, and said that in war they had lost their territories and in peace their liberty. But the fortresses being recovered, an honourable treaty ratified with the king, and the city restored to her former influence, the spirit of public discourse entirely changed in Florence, a place greatly addicted to gossip, and in which actions are judged by the success attending them rather than by the intelligence employed in their direction. Therefore the citizens praised Lorenzo extravagantly, declaring that by his prudence they had recovered in peace what unfavourable circumstances had taken from them in war, and that by his discretion and judgment he had done more than the enemy with all the force of their arms. Book eight, chapter five of History of Florence by Machiavelli, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, volume two, 
translated by an unknown translator. Book 8, Chapter 5 New Occasions of War in Italy Differences between the Marquis of Ferrara and the Venetians The King of Naples and the Florentines attack the Papal States The Pope's defensive arrangements The Neapolitan army routed by the Papal forces Progress of the Venetians against the Marquis of Ferrara The Pope makes peace and enters into a league against the Venetians Operations of the League against the Venetians the Venetians routed at Bondino, their losses, disunion among the League. Lodovico Sforza makes peace with the Venetians, ratified by the other parties. The invasion of the Turks had deferred the war which was about to break forth from the anger of the Pope and the Venetians at the peace between the Florentines and the King. But as the beginning of that invasion was unexpected and beneficial, its conclusion was equally unlooked for and injurious. For Mohammed dying suddenly, dissensions arose among his sons, and the forces which were in Fuglia, being abandoned by the commander, surrendered Otranto to the king. The fears which restrained the Pope and the Venetians being thus removed, every one became apprehensive of new troubles. On the one hand was the League of the Pope and the Venetians, and with them the Genoese, Sienese, and other minor powers. On the other, the Florentines, the king, and the duke with whom were the Bolognese and many princes. The Venetians wished to become lords of Ferrara, and thought they were justified by circumstances in making the attempt, and hoping for a favourable result. Their differences arose thus. The Marquis of Ferrara affirmed he was under no obligation to take salt from the Venetians, or to admit their governor, the terms of convention between them declaring that after seventy years the city was to be free from both impositions. The Venetians replied that so long as he held the polysine, he was bound to receive their salt and their governor. The Marquis refusing his consent, the Venetians considered themselves justified in taking arms, and that the present moment offered a suitable opportunity, for the Pope was indignant against the Florentines and the King, and to attach the Pope still further, the Count Girolamo, who was then at Venice, was received with all possible respect. First admitted to the privileges of a citizen, and then raised to the rank of a senator, the highest distinctions the Venetian Senate can confer. To prepare for the war, they levied new taxes, and appointed to the command of the forces Roberto da San Severino, who, being offended with Lodovico, governor of Milan, fled to Tortona, whence, after occasioning some disturbances, he went to Genoa, and while there was sent for by the Venetians, and placed at the head of their troops. These circumstances becoming known to the opposite league, induced it also to provide for war. The Duke of Milan appointed as his general Federigo d'Urbino, the Florentines engaged Costanzo, Lord of Pesaro, and to sound the disposition of the Pope, and to know whether the Venetians made war against Ferrara with his consent or not, King Ferrando sent Alfonso, Duke of Calabria, with his army across the Tronto, and asked the pontiff's permission to pass into Lombardy to assist the Marquis, which was refused in the most peremptory manner. The Florentines and the king, no longer doubtful about the Pope's intentions, determined to harass him, and thus either compel him to take part with them, or throw such obstacles in his way as would prevent him from helping the Venetians, who had already taken the field, attacked the Marquis, overran his territory, and encamped before Figarolo, a fortress of the greatest importance. In pursuance of the design of the Florentines and the king, the Duke of Calabria, by the assistance of the Colonna family, the Orsini had joined the Pope, plundered the country about Rome and committed great devastation, while the Florentines, with Niccolo Vitelli, besieged and took Città di Castello, expelling Lorenzo Vitelli, who held it for the Pope, and placing Niccolo in it as prince. The Pope now found himself in very great straits, for the city of Rome was disturbed by factions and the country covered with enemies. But acting with courage and resolution, he appointed Roberto da Rimino to take the command of his forces, and having sent for him to Rome, where his troops were assembled, told him how great would be the honour if he could deliver the church from the king's forces, and the troubles in which it was involved, how greatly indebted, not only himself, but all his successors would be, and that not mankind merely, but God himself would be under obligations to him. The magnificent Roberto, Having considered the forces and preparations already made, 
advised the Pope to raise as numerous a body of infantry as possible, which was done without delay. The Duke of Calabria was at hand, and constantly harassed the country up to the very gates of Rome, which so roused the indignation of the citizens, that many offered their assistance to Roberto, and all were thankfully received. The Duke, hearing of these preparations, withdrew a short distance from the city, that in the belief of finding him gone, the magnificent Roberto would not pursue him, and also in expectation of his brother Federigo, whom their father had sent to him with additional forces. But Roberto, finding himself nearly equal to the Duke in cavalry, and superior in infantry, marched boldly out of Rome and took a position within two miles of the enemy. The Duke, seeing his adversaries close upon him, found he must either fight or disgracefully retire. To avoid a retreat unbecoming a king's son, he resolved to face the enemy, and a battle ensued which continued from morning till midday. In this engagement, greater valour was exhibited on both sides than had been shown in any other during the last fifty years, upward of a thousand dead being left upon the field. The troops of the church were at length victorious, for her numerous infantry so annoyed the ducal cavalry that they were compelled to retreat, and Alfonso himself would have fallen into the hands of the enemy had he not been rescued by a body of Turks, who remained at Otranto, and were at that time in his service. The Lord of Rimino, after this victory, returned triumphantly to Rome, but he did not long enjoy the fruit of his valour, for having, during the heat of the engagement, taken a copious draught of water, he was seized with a flux, of which he very shortly afterward died. The Pope caused his funeral to be conducted with great pomp, and in a few days sent the Count Girolamo towards Citta di Castello to restore it to Lorenzo, and also endeavour to gain Rimino, which being by Roberto's death left to the care of his widow and a son who was quite a boy, his holiness thought might be easily won. And this certainly would have been the case, if the lady had not been defended by the Florentines, who opposed him so effectually as to prevent his success against both Castello and Rimino. While these things were in progress at Rome and in Romagna, the Venetians took possession of Figarolo and crossed the Po with their forces. The camp of the Duke of Milan and the Marquis was in disorder, for the Count of Urbino, having fallen ill, was carried to Bologna for his recovery, but died. Thus the Marquis's affairs were unfortunately situated, while those of the Venetians gave them increasing hopes of occupying Ferrara. The Florentines and the King of Naples used their utmost endeavours to gain the Pope to their views, and not having succeeded by force, they threatened him with the council, which had already been summoned by the Emperor to assemble at Baal. And by means of the imperial ambassadors, and the cooperation of the leading cardinals, who were desirous of peace, the Pope was compelled to turn his attention toward effecting the pacification of Italy. With this view, at the instigation of his fears, and with the conviction that the aggrandizement of the Venetians would be the ruin of the Church and of Italy, he endeavoured to make peace with the League, and sent his nuncios to Naples, where a treaty was concluded for five years between the Pope, the King, the Duke of Milan, and the Florentines, with an opening for the Venetians to join them if they thought proper. When this was accomplished, the Pope intimated to the Venetians that they must desist from war against Ferrara. They refused to comply, and made preparations to prosecute their design, with greater vigour than they had hitherto done, and having routed the forces of the Duke and the Marquis at Argenta, they approached Ferrara so closely as to pitch their tents in the Marquis's park. The League found they must no longer delay rendering him efficient assistance, and ordered the Duke of Calabria to march to Ferrara with his forces and those of the Pope, the Florentine troops also moving in the same direction. In order to direct the operations of the war with greater efficiency, the League assembled a diet at Cremona, which was attended by the Pope's legate, the Count Girolamo, the Duke of Calabria, the Signor Lodovico Sforza, and Lorenzo de' Medici, with many other Italian princes. And when the measures to be adapted were fully discussed, having decided that the best way of relieving Ferrara would be to effect a division of the enemy's forces, the League desired Lodovico to attack the Venetians on the side of Milan but this he declined, for fear of bringing a war upon the Duke's territories, which it would be difficult to quell. It was therefore resolved to proceed with the united forces of the League to Ferrara, and having assembled four thousand cavalry and eight thousand infantry, they went in pursuit of the Venetians, 
whose force amounted to two thousand two hundred men at arms and six thousand foot. They first attacked the Venetian flotilla, then lying upon the river Po, which they routed with the loss of above two hundred vessels, and took prisoner Antonio Justiniano, the purveyor of the fleet. The Venetians, finding all Italy united against them, endeavoured to support their reputation by engaging in their service the Duke of Lorraine, who joined them with two hundred men at arms, and having suffered so great a destruction of their fleet, they sent him, with part of their army, to keep their enemies at bay, and Roberto de San Severino to cross the Adda with the remainder, and proceed to Milan, where they were hoping to raise the cry of the Duke and the Lady Bona, his mother, hoping by this means to give a new aspect to affairs there, believing that Lodovico and his government were generally unpopular. The attack at first created great consternation, and roused the citizens in arms, but eventually produced consequences unfavourable to the designs of the Venetians, for Lodovico was now desirous to undertake what he had refused to do at the entreaty of his allies. Leaving the Marquis of Ferrara to the defence of his own territories, he, with four thousand horse and two thousand foot, and joined by the Duke of Calabria with twelve thousand horse and five thousand foot, entered the territory of Bergamo, then Brescia, next that of Verona, and, in defiance of the Venetians, plundered the whole country, for it was with the greatest difficulty that Roberto and his forces could save the cities themselves. In the meantime, the Marquis of Ferrara had recovered a great part of his territories, for the Duke of Lorraine, by whom he was attacked, having only at his command two thousand horse and one thousand foot, could not withstand him. Hence, during the whole of 1483, the affairs of the League were prosperous. The winter, having passed quietly over, the armies again took the field. To produce the greater impression upon the enemy, the League united the whole force, and would easily have deprived the Venetians of all they possessed in Lombardy, if the war had been conducted in the same manner as during the preceding year. For by the departure of the Duke of Lorraine, whose term of service had expired, they were reduced to six thousand horse and five thousand foot, while the Allies had thirteen thousand horse and five thousand foot at their disposal. But, as is often the case where several of equal authority are joined in command, their want of unity decided the victory to their enemies. Federigo, Marquis of Mantua, whose influence kept the Duke of Calabria and Lodovico Sforza within bounds, being dead, differences arose between them, which soon became jealousies. Giovan Galeazzo, Duke of Milan, was now of an age to take the government on himself, and had married the daughter of the Duke of Calabria, who wished his son-in-law to exercise the government, not Lodovico. The latter, being aware of the Duke's design, studied to prevent him from effecting it. The position of Lodovico being known to the Venetians, they thought they could make it available for their own interests, and hoped, as they had often before done, to recover in peace all they had lost by war and having secretly entered into treaty with Lodovico, the terms were concluded in August 1484. When this became known to the rest of the Allies, they were greatly dissatisfied, principally because they found that the places won from the Venetians were to be restored, that they were allowed to keep Rovigo and the Polisine, which they had taken from the Marquis of Ferrara, and besides this retain all the preeminence and authority over Ferrara itself which they had formerly possessed. Thus it was evident to everyone they had been engaged in a war which had cost vast sums of money, during the progress of which they had acquired honour, and which was included with disgrace. For the places wrested from the enemy were restored without themselves recovering those they had lost. They were, however, compelled to ratify the treaty, on account of the unsatisfactory state of their finances, and because the fault and ambition of others had rendered them unwilling to put their fortunes to further proof. Book Eight, Chapter Six of History of Florence by Machiavelli, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolo Machiavelli, Volume Two, translated by an unknown translator. Book Eight, Chapter Six. Affairs of the Pope. He is reconciled to Niccolo Vitelli. Discords between the Colonnesi and the Orsini. Various events. The War of Serizana. Genoa occupied by her Archbishop. Death of Sixtus the Fourth. Innocent the Eighth elected. Agostino Fregoso gives Serizana to the bank of St. Giorgio. 
account of the bank of st giorgio war with the genoese for serizana stratagem of the florentines to attack pietra santa difficulties and final surrender of pietra santa the lucchese lay claim to pietra santa the city of l'aquila revolts against the king of naples war between him and the pope the florentines take the king's party peace between the pope and the king during these events in lombardy the pope sent lorenzo to invest citta di castello for the purposes of expelling niccolo vitelli the place having been abandoned to him by the league for the purpose of inducing the pontiff to join them during the siege niccolo's troops were led out against the papal forces and routed them Upon this, the Pope recalled the Count Girolamo from Lombardy with orders first to recruit his army at Rome, and then proceed against Citta di Castello. But thinking afterward that it would be better to obtain Niccolò Vitello as his friend than to renew hostilities with him, an arrangement was entered into by which the latter retained Citta di Castello, and the Pope pacified Lorenzo as well as he could. He was induced to both of these measures rather by his apprehension of fresh troubles than by his love of peace for he perceived dissensions arising between the Colonesi and the Orsini. In the war between the king of Naples and the pope, the former had taken the district of Tagliacozzo from the Orsini, and given it to the Colonesi, who had espoused his cause. Upon the establishment of peace, the Orsini demanded its restoration by virtue of the treaty. The pope had frequently intimated to the Colonesi that it ought to be restored, but they, instead of complying with the entreaties of the Orsini, or being influenced by the Pope's threats, renewed hostilities against the former. Upon this the pontiff, unable to endure their insolence, united his own forces with those of the Orsini, plundered the houses they possessed in Rome, slew or made prisoners all who defended them, and seized most of their fortresses, so that when these troubles were composed it was rather by the complete subjugation of one party than from any desire for peace in the other. Nor were the affairs of Genoa or of Tuscany in repose, for the Florentines kept the Count Antonio da Marciano on the borders of Sarazana, and while the war continued in Lombardy, annoyed the people of Sarazana by inroads and light skirmishes. Battistino Fregoso, doge of Genoa, trusting to Pagolo Fregoso the archbishop, was taken prisoner with his wife and children by the latter, who assumed the sovereignty of the city. The Venetian fleet had attacked the kingdom of Naples, taken Gallipoli, and harassed the neighboring places. But upon the peace of Lombardy all tumults were hushed except those of Tuscany and Rome, for the Pope died in five days after its declaration, either in the natural course of things, or because of his grief for peace, to which he was always opposed, occasioned his end. Upon the decease of the pontiff Rome was immediately in arms, the Count Girolamo withdrew his forces into the castle, and the Orsini feared the Colonesi would avenge the injuries they had recently sustained. The Colonesi demanded the restitution of their houses and castles, so that in a few days robberies, fires, and murders prevailed in several parts of the city. The cardinals entreated the Count to give the castle into the hands of the college, withdraw his troops, and deliver Rome from the fear of his forces and he, by way of ingratiating himself with the future pontiff, obeyed, and returned to Imola. The cardinals, being thus divested of their fears, and the barons hopeless of assistance in their quarrels, proceeded to create a new pontiff, and after some discussion, Giovanni Battista Cibo, a Genoese, cardinal of Malfetta, was elected, and took the name of Innocent the Eighth. By the mildness of his disposition, for he was peaceable and humane, he caused a cessation of hostilities, and for the present restored peace to Rome. The Florentines, after the pacification of Lombardy, could not remain quiet, for it appeared disgraceful that a private gentleman should deprive them of the fortress of Sarazana, and as it was allowed by the conditions of peace not only to demand lost places, but to make war upon any who should impede their restoration, they immediately provided men and money to undertake its recovery. Upon this, Agostino Fregoso, who had seized Serizana, being unable to defend it, gave the fortress to the bank of St. Giorgio. As we shall have frequent occasion to speak of St. Giorgio and the Genoese, it will not be improper, since Genoa is one of the principal cities of Italy, to give some account of the regulations and usages prevailing there. When the Genoese had made peace with the Venetians after the Great War many years ago, the Republic, 
being unable to satisfy the claims of those who had advanced large sums of money for its use, conceded to them the revenue of the Dogano or Custom House, so that each creditor should participate in the receipts in proportion to his claim, until the whole amount should be liquidated, and as a suitable place for their assembling, the palace over the Dogano was assigned for their use. These creditors established a form of government among themselves, appointing a council of one hundred persons for the direction of their affairs, and a committee of eight who, as the executive body, should carry into effect the determinations of the council. Their credits were divided into shares, called luogi, and they took the title of the bank, or company, of St. Giorgio. Having thus arranged their government, the city fell into fresh difficulties, and applied to San Giorgio for assistance, which, being wealthy and well managed, was able to afford the required aid. On the other hand, as the city had at first conceded the customs, she next began to assign towns, castles, or territories as security for monies received, and this practice has proceeded to such a great length from the necessities of the state, and the accommodation by the San Giorgio, that the latter now has under its administration most of the towns and cities in the Genoese dominion. These the bank governs and protects, and every year sends its deputies, appointed by vote, without any interference on the part of the Republic. Hence the affections of the citizens are transferred from the government to the San Giorgio, on account of the tyranny of the former, and the excellent regulations adopted by the latter. Hence also originate the frequent changes of the Republic, which is sometimes under a citizen, and at other times governed by a stranger, for the magistracy, and not the San Giorgio, changes the government. So when the Fregosi and the Adorni were in opposition, as the government of the Republic was the prize for which they strove, the greater part of the citizens withdrew and left it to the victor. The only interference of the Bank of St. Giorgio is when one party has obtained a superiority over the other, to bind the victor to the observance of its laws, which up to this time have not been changed. For as it possesses arms, money, and influence, they could not be altered without incurring the imminent risk of a dangerous rebellion. This establishment presents an instance of what in all the republics, either described or imagined by philosophers, has never been thought of, exhibiting within the same community and among the same citizens liberty and tyranny, integrity and corruption, justice and injustice. For this establishment preserves in the city many ancient and venerable customs, and should it happen, as in time it easily may, that the San Giorgio should have possession of the whole city, the republic will become more distinguished than that of Venice. Agostino Fregoso conceded Serizana to the San Giorgio, which readily accepted it, undertook its defense, put a fleet to sea, and sent forces to Pietrasanta to prevent all attempts of the Florentines, whose camp was in the immediate vicinity. The Florentines found it would be essentially necessary to gain possession of Pietrasanta, for without it the acquisition of Serizana lost much of its value, being situated between the latter place and Pisa. But they could not, consistently with the treaty, besiege it, unless the people of Pietrasanta or its garrison were to impede their acquisition of Serizana. To induce the enemy to do this, the Florentines sent from Pisa to the camp a quantity of provisions and military stores, accompanied by a very weak escort, that the people of Pietrasanta might have little cause for fear, and by the richness of the booty be tempted to the attack. The plan succeeded according to their expectation, for the inhabitants of Pietrasanta, attracted by the rich prize, took possession of it. This gave legitimate occasion to the Florentines to undertake operations against them. So, leaving Serizana, they encamped before Pietrasanta, which was very populous, and made a gallant defense. The Florentines planted their artillery in the plain, and formed a rampart upon the hill, that they might also attack the place on that side. Jacopo Guicciardini was commissary of the army, and while the siege of Pietrasanta was going on, the Genoese took and burned the fortress of Vada, and landing their forces, plundered the surrounding country. Biongiani Gianfiliazzi was sent against them, with a body of horse and foot, and checked their audacity, so that they pursued their depredations less boldly. The fleet, continuing its efforts, went to Livorno, and by pontoons and other means approached the new tower, playing their artillery upon it for several days, but being unable to make any impression, they withdrew. In the meantime, the Florentines proceeded slowly against Pietrasanta, and the enemy, taking courage, attacked and took their works upon the hill. 
This was effected with so much glory, and struck such a panic into the Florentines, that they were almost ready to raise the siege, and actually retreated a distance of four miles, for their generals thought that they would retire to winter quarters, it being now October, and make no further attempt till the return of spring. When the discomfiture was known at Florence, the government was filled with indignation, and to impart fresh vigor to the enterprise, and restore the reputation of their forces, they immediately appointed Antonio Pucci and Bernardo del Neri commissaries, who, with vast sums of money, proceeded to the army and intimated the heavy displeasure of the seigneury and of the whole city if they did not return to the walls. And what a disgrace if so large an army and so many generals, having only a small garrison to contend with, could not conquer so poor and weak a place! They explained the immediate and future advantages that would result from the acquisition, and spoke so forcibly upon the subject that all became anxious to renew the attack. They resolved in the first place to recover the rampart upon the hill, and here it was evident how greatly humanity, affability, and condescension influenced the minds of soldiers, for Antonio Pucci, by encouraging one and promising another, shaking hands with this man and embracing that, induced them to proceed to the charge with such impetuosity that they gained possession of the rampart in an instant. However, the victory was not unattended by misfortune, for Count Antonio da Marciano was killed by a cannon-shot. This success filled the townspeople with so much terror that they began to make proposals for capitulation, and to invest the surrender with imposing solemnity, Lorenzo de' Medici came to the camp when, after a few days, the fortress was given up. It being now winter, the leaders of the expedition thought it unadvisable to make any further effort until the return of spring, more particularly because the autumnal air had been so unhealthy that numbers were affected by it. Antonio Pucci and Biongiani Gianfiliazzi were taken ill and died, to the great regret of all. So greatly had Antonio's conduct at Pietrasanta endeared him to the army. Upon the taking of Pietrasanta, the Lucchese sent ambassadors to Florence to demand its surrender to their republic, on account of its having previously belonged to them, and because, as they alleged, it was in the conditions that places taken by either party were to be restored to their original possessors. The Florentines did not deny the articles, but replied that they did not know whether, by the treaty between themselves and the Genoese, which was then under discussion, it would have to be given up or not, and therefore could not reply to that point at present but in case of its restitution it would first be necessary for the Lucchese to reimburse them for the expenses they had incurred, and the injury they had suffered in the death of so many citizens, and that when this was satisfactorily arranged they might entertain hopes of obtaining the place. The whole winter was consumed in negotiations between the Florentines and the Genoese, which, by the Pope's intervention, were carried on at Rome, but not being concluded upon the return of spring, the Florentines would have attacked Serrazana had they not been prevented by the illness of Lorenzo de' Medici, and the war between the Pope and King Ferrando, for Lorenzo was afflicted not only by the gout, which seemed hereditary in his family, but also by violent pains in the stomach, and was compelled to go to the baths for relief. The more important reason was furnished by the war, of which this was the origin. The city of L'Aquila, though subject to the kingdom of Naples, was, in a manner, free, and the Count de Montorio possessed great influence over it. The Duke of Calabria was upon the banks of the Tronto with his men-at-arms, under pretense of appeasing some disturbances among the peasantry, but really with a design of reducing L'Aquila entirely under the king's authority, and sent for the Count de Montorio, as if to consult him upon the business he pretended then to have in hand. The Count obeyed without the least suspicion, and on his arrival was made prisoner by the Duke and sent to Naples. When his circumstance became known at L'Aquila, the anger of the inhabitants arose to the highest pitch. Taking arms, they killed Antonio Cencinello, commissary for the King, and with him some inhabitants known partisans of His Majesty. The L'Aquilani, in order to have a defender in their rebellion, raised the banner of the church and sent envoys to the Pope to submit their city and themselves to him, beseeching that he would defend them as his own subjects against the tyranny of the king. The pontiff gladly undertook their defense, for he had both public and private reasons for hating that monarch, and Signor Roberto of San Severino, an enemy of the Duke of Milan, being disengaged, was appointed to take the command of his forces, and sent for with all speed to Rome. He entreated the friends and relatives of the Count de Montorio to withdraw their allegiance from the king, 
and induced the princes of Altimora, Salerno, and Bisignano to take arms against him. The king, finding himself so suddenly involved in war, had recourse to the Florentines and the Duke of Milan for assistance. The Florentines hesitated with regard to their own conduct, for they felt all the inconvenience of neglecting their own affairs to attend to those of others, and hostilities against the church seemed likely to involve much risk. However, being under the obligation of a league, they preferred their honor to convenience or security, engaged the Orsini, and sent all their own forces under the Count di Pizzliano toward Rome, to the assistance of the king. The latter divided his forces into two parts, one under the Duke of Calabria he sent toward Rome, which, being joined by the Florentines, opposed the army of the church. With the other under his own command he attacked the barons, and the war was prosecuted with various success on both sides. At length, the king being universally victorious, peace was concluded by the intervention of the ambassadors of the king of Spain, in August 1486, to which the pope consented for having found fortune opposed to him, he was not disposed to tempt it further. In his treaty all the powers of Italy were united, except the Genoese, who were omitted as rebels against the Republic of Milan, and unjust occupiers of territories belonging to the Florentines. Upon the peace being ratified, Roberto da San Severino, having been during the war a treacherous ally of the Church, and by no means formidable to her enemies, left Rome. Being followed by the forces of the Duke and the Florentines, after passing Cesena, found them near him, and, urging his flight, reached Ravenna with less than a hundred of horse. Of his forces, part were received into the duke's service, and part were plundered by the peasantry. The king, being reconciled with his barons, put to death Jacopo Coppolo and Antonello de Versa and their sons, for having during the war betrayed his secrets to the pope. End of Book 8, Chapter 6《ブケイト Chapter 7 of History of Florence by Machiavelli Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy by Niccolò Machiavelli Volume 2 Translated by an unknown translator《ブケイト Chapter 7 The Pope becomes attached to the Florentines The Genoese sees Serrazanello they are routed by the Florentines. Serrazana surrenders. Genoa submits to the Duke of Milan. War between the Venetians and the Dutch. Osimo revolts from the church. Count Girolamo Riario, lord of Furli, slain by a conspiracy. Galeato, lord of Faenza, is murdered by the treachery of his wife. The government of the city offered to the Florentines. Disturbances in Siena. Death of Lorenzo de Medici. His eulogy. Establishment of his family. Estates bought by Lorenzo, his anxiety for the defense of Florence, his taste for arts and literature, the University of Pisa, the estimation of Lorenzo by other princes. The Pope, having observed in the course of the war how promptly and earnestly the Florentines adhered to their alliances, although he had previously been opposed to them from his attachment to the Genoese, and the assistance they had rendered to the king, now evinced a more amicable disposition and received their ambassadors with greater favor than previously. Lorenzo de' Medici, being made acquainted with this change of feeling, encouraged it with the utmost solicitude, for he thought it would be of great advantage, if to the friendship of the king he could add that of the pontiff. The Pope had a son named Francesco, upon whom, designing to bestow estates and attach friends who might be useful to him after his own death, saw no safer connection in Italy than Lorenzo's, and therefore induced the latter to give him one of his daughters in marriage. Having formed this alliance, the Pope desired the Genoese to concede Serrazana to the Florentines, insisting that they had no right to detain what Agostino had sold, nor was Agostino justified in making over to the bank of San Giorgio what was not his own. However, His Holiness did not succeed with them, for the Genoese, during these transactions at Rome, armed several vessels, and unknown to the Florentines, landed three thousand foot, attacked Serrazanello, situated above Serrazana, plundered and burnt the town near it, and then, directing their artillery against the fortress, fired upon it with their utmost energy. This assault was new and unexpected by the Florentines, who immediately assembled their forces under Virginio Orsino at Pisa, and complained to the Pope that while he was endeavoring to establish peace, the Genoese had renewed their attack upon them. They then sent Piero Corsini to Lucca, 
that by his presence he might keep the city faithful, and Pagol Antonio Soderini to Venice, to learn how that republic was disposed. They demanded assistance of the king and of Signor Lodovico, but obtained it from neither, for the king expressed apprehensions of the Turkish fleet, and Lodovico made excuses, but sent no aid. Thus the Florentines in their own wars are almost always obliged to stand alone, and find no friends to assist them with the same readiness they practice toward others. Nor did they, on this desertion of their allies, it being nothing new to them, give way to despondency, for having assembled a large army under Jacopo Guicciardini and Pietro Vittori, they set it against the enemy, who had encamped upon the river Magra, at the same time pressing Sarazanello with mines and every species of attack. The commissaries being resolved to relieve the place, an engagement ensued, when the Genoese were routed, and Ludovico del Fiesco, with several other principal men, made prisoners. The Sarazanese were not so depressed at their defeat as to be willing to surrender, but obstinately prepared for their defence, while the Florentine commissaries proceeded with their operations, and instances of valour occurred on both sides. The siege being protracted by a variety of fortune, Lorenzo de' Medici resolved to go to the camp, and on his arrival the troops acquired fresh courage, while that of the enemy seemed to fail, for perceiving the obstinacy of the Florentines' attack, and the delay of the Genoese in coming to their relief, they surrendered to Lorenzo, without asking conditions, and none were treated with severity except two or three who were leaders of the rebellion. During the siege, Lodovoco had sent troops to Petromoli, as if with an intention of assisting the Florentines, but having secret correspondence in Genoa, a party was raised there, who by the aid of these forces gave the city to the Duke of Milan. At this time the Dutch made war upon the Venetians, and Boccolino of Osima, in the Marca, caused that place to revolt from the Pope, and assumed the sovereignty. After a variety of fortune he was induced to restore the city to the pontiff and come to Florence, where, under the protection of Lorenzo de' Medici, by whose advice he had been prevailed upon to submit, he lived long and respected. He afterward went to Milan, but did not experience such generous treatment, for Lodovoco caused him to be put to death. The Venetians were routed by the Dutch, near the city of Trento, and Roberto da S. Severino, their captain, was slain. After this defeat the Venetians, with their usual good fortune, made peace with the Dutch, not as vanquished but as conquerors, so honorable were the terms they obtained. About this time there arose serious troubles in Romagna. Francesco d'Orso, a Furli, was a man of great authority in that city, and became suspected by the Count Girolamo, who often threatened him. He consequently, living under great apprehensions, was advised by his friends to provide for his own safety, by the immediate adoption of such a course as would relieve him from all further fear of the Count. Having considered the matter and resolved to attempt it, they fixed upon the market-day, at Furli, as most suitable for their purpose, for many of their friends being sure to come from the country, they might make use of their services without having to bring them expressly for the occasion. It was the month of May, when most Italians take supper by daylight. The conspirators thought the most convenient hour would be after the Count had finished his repast, for his household, being then at their meal, he would remain in the chamber almost alone. Having fixed upon the hour, Francesco went to the Count's residence, left his companions in the hall, proceeded to his apartment, and desired an attendant to say he wished for an interview. He was admitted, and after a few words of pretended communication, slew him, and calling to his associates, killed the attendant. The governor of the place, coming by accident to speak with the count, and entering the apartment with a few of his people, was also slain. After this slaughter, and in the midst of a great tumult, the count's body was thrown from the window, and with the cry of Church and Liberty, they roused the people, who hated the avarice and cruelty of the count, to arms, and having plundered his house, made the Countess Caterina and her children prisoners. The fortress alone had to be taken to bring the enterprise to a successful issue, but the Castellan would not consent to its surrender. They begged the Countess would desire him to comply with their wish, which she promised to do, if they would allow her to go into the fortress, leaving her children as security for the performance of her promise. The conspirators trusted her, and permitted her to enter, but as soon as she was within, she threatened them with death and every kind of torture in revenge for the murder of her husband, and upon their menacing her with the death of her children, she said she had the means of getting more. Finding they were not supported by the Pope, and that Lodovico Sforza, uncle to the Countess, had sent forces to her assistance, the conspirators became terrified, 
and taking with them whatever property they could carry off, they fled to Citta di Castello. The countess recovered the state, and avenged the death of her husband with the utmost cruelty. The Florentines, hearing of the count's death, took occasion to recover the fortress of Pian Caldolo, of which he had formerly deprived them, and on sending some forces captured it, but Secco, the famous engineer, lost his life during the siege. To this disturbance in Romagna, another in that province, no less important, has to be added. Galeato, lord of Faenza, had married the daughter of Giovanni Bentivogli, prince of Bologna. She, either through jealousy or ill-treatment by her husband, or from the depravity of her own nature, hated him to such a degree, that she determined to deprive him of his possessions and his life, and pretending sickness, she took to her bed, where having induced Galeato to visit her, he was slain by assassins, whom she had concealed for that purpose in the apartment. She had acquainted her father with her design, and he hoped, on his son-in-law's death, to become lord of Faenza. A great tumult arose as soon as the murder was known. The widow, with an infant son, fled into the fortress. The people took up arms. Giovanni Bentivogli, with a condottiere of the Duke of Milan, named Bergamino, engaged for the occasion, entered Faenza with a considerable force, and Antonio Boscoli, the Florentine commissary, was also there. These leaders being together, and discoursing of the government of the place, the men of Val di Lamona, who had risen unanimously upon learning what had occurred, attacked Giovanni and Bergamino, the latter of whom they slew, made the former prisoner, and raising the cry of Astore and the Florentines, offered the city to the commissary. These events being known at Florence gave general offence. However, they set Giovanni and his daughter at liberty, and by the universal desire of the people, took the city and Astore under their protection. Besides these, after the principal differences of the greater powers were composed, during several years tumults prevailed in Romagna, the Marca, and Siena, which, as they are unimportant, it will be needless to recount. When the Duke of Calabria, after the war of 1478, had left the country, the distractions of Siena became more frequent, and after many changes, in which at first the plebeians and then the nobility were victorious, the latter at length maintained the superiority, and among them Pandolfo and Jacopo Petrucci obtained the greatest influence, so that the former being distinguished for prudence and the latter for resolution, they became almost princes in the city. The Florentines, after the war of Serrazana, lived in great prosperity until 1492, when Lorenzo de' Medici died, for he, having put a stop to the internal wars of Italy, and by his wisdom and authority established peace, turned his thoughts to the advancement of his own and the city's interests, and married Piero, his eldest son, to Alfonsina, daughter of the Cavalier Orsino. He caused Giovanni, his second son, to be raised to the dignity of cardinal. This was the more remarkable from its being unprecedented, for he was only fourteen years of age when admitted to the college, and became the medium by which his family attained to the highest earthly glory. He was unable to make any particular provision for Giuliano, his third son, on account of his tender years, and the shortness of his own life. Of his daughters, one married Jacopo Salviati, another Francesco Sibo, the third Piero Ridolfi, and the fourth, whom in order to keep his house united, he had married to Giovanni de' Medici, died. In his commercial affairs he was very unfortunate, from the improper conduct of his agents, who in all their proceedings assumed the deportment of princes rather than of private persons, so that in many places much of his property was wasted, and he had to be relieved by his country with large sums of money. To avoid similar inconvenience, he withdrew from mercantile pursuits, and invested his property in land and houses, as being less liable to vicissitude. In the districts of Prado, Pisa, and the Val de Pesa, he purchased extensively, and erected buildings, which for magnificence and utility were quite of regal character. He next undertook the improvement of the city, and as many parts were unoccupied by buildings, he caused new streets to be erected in them, of great beauty, and thus enlarged the accommodation of the inhabitants. To enjoy his power in security and repose, and conquer or resist his enemies at a distance, in the direction of Bologna he fortified the castle of Ferenzuola, situated in the midst of the Apennines. Towards Siena he commenced the restoration and fortification of the Poggio Imperiale, and he shut out the enemy in the direction of Genoa, by the acquisition of Pietra Santa and Serrazana. For the greater safety of the city, he kept in pay the Baglioni, at Perugia, 
and the Vitelli at Citta di Castillo, and held the government of Faenza wholly in his own power, all which greatly contributed to the repose and prosperity of Florence. In peaceful times he frequently entertained the people with feasts, and exhibitions of various events and triumphs of antiquity, his object being to keep the city abundantly supplied, the people united, and the nobility honoured. He was a great admirer of excellence in the arts, and a patron of literary men, of which Agnolo de Montepulciano, Cristofero Landini, and Demetrius Calcondilus, a Greek, may afford sufficient proofs. On this account, Count Giovanni della Marandola, a man of almost supernatural genius, after visiting every court of Europe, induced by the magnificence of Lorenzo, established his abode at Florence. He took great delight in architecture, music, and poetry, many of his comments and poetical compositions still remaining. To facilitate the study of literature to the youth of Florence, he opened a university at Pisa, which was conducted by the most distinguished men in Italy. For Mariano de Cinezano, a friar of the order of St. Augustine, and an excellent preacher, he built a monastery in the neighborhood of Florence. He enjoyed much favor both from fortune and from the Almighty. All his enterprises were brought to a prosperous termination, while his enemies were unfortunate. For besides the conspiracy of the Pazzi, an attempt was made to murder him in the Carmine by Battista Frescobaldi, and a similar one by Baldonetto di Pistoia, at his villa. But these persons, with their confederates, came to the end their crimes deserved. His skill, prudence, and fortune were acknowledged with admiration, not only by the princes of Italy, but by those of distant countries, for Matthias, king of Hungary, gave him many proofs of his regard. The sultan sent ambassadors to him with valuable presents, and the Turkish emperor placed in his hands Bernardo Bandini, the murderer of his brother. These circumstances raised his fame throughout Italy, and his reputation for prudence constantly increased, for in council he was eloquent and acute, wise in determination, and prompt and resolute in execution. Nor can vices be alleged against him to sully so many virtues. Though he was fond of women, pleased with the company of facetious and satirical men, and amused with the games of the nursery, more than seemed consistent with so great a character, for he was frequently seen playing with his children, and partaking of their infantine sports, so that whoever considers this gravity and cheerfulness will find united in him dispositions which seem almost incompatible with each other. In his later years he was greatly afflicted. Besides the gout, he was troubled with excruciating pains in the stomach, of which he died in April 1492, in the forty-fourth year of his age. Nor was there ever in Florence, or even in Italy, one so celebrated for wisdom, or for whose loss such universal regret was felt. As from his death the greatest devastation would shortly ensue, the heavens gave many evident tokens of its approach. Among other signs, the highest pinnacle of the church of Santa Reparata was struck with lightning, and a great part of it thrown down, to the terror and amazement of every one. The citizens and all the princes of Italy mourned for him, and sent their ambassadors to Florence, to condole with the city on the occasion, and the justness of their grief was shortly after apparent, for being deprived of his counsel, his survivors were unable either to satisfy or restrain the ambition of Lodovico Sforza, tutor to the Duke of Milan, and hence, soon after the death of Lorenzo, those evil plants began to germinate, which in a little time ruined Italy, and continued to keep her in desolation. End of Book Eight